Francis Brighton crashes through the doors and into the war room where a group of generals sit. He is a NATO intelligence officer and has come across something truly horrifying. The military leaders turn in their seats to look at him. Sir, you need to see this, Francis says, holding out a manila folder containing images taken by a spy satellite. The general slowly reaches for the folder, opens it, and begins flipping through the pages. His brow furrows in concern. The general shakes his head and passes the folder to the person sitting next to him. God save us, he whispers, as the photographs circulate around the table. Francis waits patiently in a corner of the room while each member of the NATO alliance looks at the photos he brought with him. The last general examines the images, closes the folder, and hands it back to Francis. He turns to the rest of the men in the room. What should we do, he asks. There's discussion about launching a counterattack. Some NATO members want to keep the status quo the way it is. Putin is clearly insane, and like any wild animal that's backed into a corner and feels threatened, he is more than willing to lash out in the most deadly way possible. Others in the room believe now is the time to act. They advocate for the deployment of more troops along the Russian border. I'm going to say what everyone else is thinking, one of the general states as he stands up from the table. We need to arm the nukes currently stationed in France and Britain. An eerie silence envelops the room. Francis shifts back and forth on his heels. He's remained quiet until now. If I may, sir, he says, the images clearly show that Russia is moving tactical nukes from this Object S site to their naval base on the Black Sea. However, we do not know if this is just a posturing gesture or if Putin means to use them. The generals around the room grumble. They all know this could be the first step toward nuclear war. Until this point, Vladimir Putin's only threatened to use tactical nukes in his war against Ukraine. Now he actually has taken steps to put those words into action. The deployment of several tactical nukes, each with an estimated payload of one kiloton or 1,000 sticks of dynamite, could change the world forever. The generals continue to deliberate. Commander Brighton, one of them says, we need you back at your post. Keep your eyes on the Russian nukes and update us of any further movements. Francis salutes the general and runs out of the room. He sprints down the hallways of the intelligence building back to the command center. Screens flash different images. TVs play live feeds from news outlets around the world. No one knows about the very real threat that he has uncovered except for the NATO generals. Francis types vigorously on the keys of his keyboard. He glances at the picture next to his screen. It's a photo of his wife holding their newborn daughter. She smiles as if nothing could ever get in the way of their happiness. Unfortunately, Putin seems hell-bent on doing just that, by throwing Europe into a nuclear war. Francis taps back into the satellite feed that he initially spotted the tactical nukes from. He zooms in on the road leading from the Russian nuclear base to the Black Sea coast. The trucks carrying the tactical nukes have made significant progress. They're only miles away from the naval base. Hours pass, Francis periodically sends updates to the NATO generals regarding the movement of the Russian tactical nukes. Putin had promised to use them for several weeks, but many thought this was an empty threat. Now it looks like he's about to make good on what he's been saying all along. There's been little movement on the Russian naval base where the nukes were dropped off. Francis has a hunch the warheads have been mounted onto SSN-38 caliber missiles and loaded onto Russian subs, but without proof there is very little he can do. It seems like the only way that Russia could secretly deploy the nukes and get them within range of targets in Ukraine is by submarine. Francis's eyes are exhausted from looking at computer monitors non-stop for days. Every time he blinks, it stings. The intelligence officer stands up and stretches. He walks to the break room where a fresh pot of coffee has just finished brewing. As he pours himself a cup, he watches live coverage of the battle raging on the outskirts of Kyiv. Suddenly, the camera tilts upward. For a moment, a missile can be seen screaming across the sky. It arcs down and slams into the ground near a group of Ukrainian forces. For a moment, nothing happens. Then, there's a bright flash and the feed cuts off. Francis stares wide-eyed at the static on the television. The coffee mug falls from his hands and shatters on the floor. For a moment, Francis is paralyzed with fear. It is very clear what he just witnessed. Russia launched a tactical nuke and wiped out everything in a quarter-mile radius. Francis sprints back to the control room and begins gathering as much intel as possible. He needs to figure out how much damage was done and in which direction the fallout is heading. By looking at satellite feeds, Francis can just make out the distinctive mushroom cloud rising up over the landscape. The wind seems to be blowing smoke further into Ukraine. Once again, Russia has caused a nuclear catastrophe on Ukrainian soil. Later that day, Francis gives a report to the NATO generals. It appears Russia used a one kiloton tactical nuke to destroy an entire Ukrainian tank battalion. Reports have been coming in across the world that countries are condemning Russia's actions. Everyone knows that if nuclear war breaks out, there will be no winners. Russia and the US alone have enough nukes to wipe humanity off the face of the planet, and that's not accounting for the nuclear warheads located in Britain and France. After the blast was confirmed to be from a tactical nuke, NATO armed several missiles at sites across Europe. They have not fired yet, but it seems that'll only be a matter of time. 
before someone has to stand up to Vladimir Putin. Trying to reason with the homicidal maniac doesn't seem to be working. Even China, Russia's most powerful ally, has turned on them. China has a strict no-first-use nuclear doctrine, which Russia has just broken. In the eyes of China, nukes should only be used to defend one's own country, not as a weapon for offensive purposes. This is how much of the world feels, and it's the reason why almost every country on the planet has turned against Vladimir Putin. But as far as Francis can tell, this doesn't seem to be deterring the leader of the Russian Federation. Russia used the tactical nuke to show just how serious they were taking NATO's constant resupplying of Ukraine with weapons and supplies. Putin also wanted to make it clear he had no problem taking things to the next level and engaging in nuclear warfare. Europe is now in an even more tenuous position. In briefings that Francis has been a part of, all options were put on the table. Many leaders believed that NATO needs to launch a nuke at Russia to show they will not just back down. The flip side of this is that Putin could escalate things further and start firing larger strategic nukes at targets across Europe. If this happens, the entire continent could be decimated by fireballs and nuclear fallout. The tactical nuke that Putin fired obliterated everything within a quarter mile, and although the radiation from the blast will travel further, it's nothing compared to the much larger nukes that both Russia and NATO have at their disposal. These bombs can be a thousand times more powerful than the tactical nuke that Russia used, and each one could wipe out entire cities and cause millions of casualties. This is obviously what Europe is trying to avoid, but they also can't let Putin get away with unleashing a nuke on the people of Ukraine. Francis listens to the other options being suggested by the military leaders in the room. Some of the generals think that NATO should send forces into Russia and use conventional weapons to bring Putin to his knees. The counter-argument is obvious. If forces from Europe invade Russia, Putin will almost certainly launch more nukes to defend his homeland, resulting in the annihilation of much of Europe. Another option is to tighten the economic sanctions already placed on Russia. Unfortunately, these didn't seem to stop Putin the first time around, and it's unlikely they'll cause him to back down now. Economic sanctions also won't help deter Putin from using more nuclear bombs. It's determined that this could actually cause him to escalate things further as more countries turn against him. Even though China and most other countries are upset with Putin's actions, Russia still supplies a massive amount of oil and gas to the rest of the world. This includes Europe. And if Russia completely cuts off fossil fuel supplies to the EU, everyone within its borders will suffer. Utility prices across Europe have already skyrocketed to unprecedented levels as Russia continues to cut off its supply of oil, and many European families can no longer afford to heat their homes during the cold winter months. Then, one of the generals comes up with an idea so crazy, it might just work. Francis sits at his computer station staring blankly at his screen. He can't believe the decision the generals came to. He closes his eyes and rubs the bridge of his nose. Forgive us, he whispers, and then focuses on the task at hand. Francis moves several satellites into optimal viewing positions, which will allow them to collect analytics for what is about to happen. The satellites align and begin transmitting data. They're pointed at a military base in Belarus. A digital clock has begun countdown. The generals are now in the control room with Francis so they can witness the aftermath of their choices. Belarus is not at war with Europe. The country is controlled by Alexander Lukashenko, a power-hungry dictator who allied himself closely with Putin. There's no doubt that Belarus supports Russia in its endeavors, but the Belarusian military is not actively slaughtering people in Ukraine like Russia is, nor do they have any nuclear weapons. Francis and the generals watch as the countdown reaches zero. On one of the side monitors, a video feed of a missile launching from a British battleship in the Baltic Sea is being played. The satellites track the missile as it arcs through the sky and descends upon a Belarusian military base. Unknowing soldiers carry out their daily routines. The seconds tick by. Everyone in the room holds their breath. Then, confirmation comes through that the tactical nuke launched by NATO has detonated and destroyed its target. Francis feels sick to his stomach. The men on the base had no idea what was coming or that they were even in any danger. Now they've been vaporized by a nuclear blast. One of the generals claps his hands together. Someone get me the Kremlin on the phone. Maybe now Putin will talk, but he doesn't. The plan was to show that NATO was not afraid to use its own nuclear weapons. Military leaders knew they could not launch a nuke at Russia to demonstrate their resolve, but it was determined that by blowing up a target in Belarus, they could still send a clear message to Vladimir Putin that NATO would retaliate with nukes if necessary. There's no doubt that Alexander Lukashenko is a terrible man who's done terrible things to the people in his country, but many feel like NATO took things a step too far. Belarus was sided already with Russia and has given them support in their fight against Ukraine, but now the Eastern European country has declared war on the rest of Europe. They do not have the military forces to back up the threats they're making, but Russia's made it clear that it will stand with Belarus and aid them in their war against the other countries in Europe. NATO leaders knew this would be inevitable, but hoped their show of force would cause Putin to back down slightly. 
However, this plan hinged on the belief that Putin, like everyone else around the world, wouldn't want to risk all-out nuclear war. But Vladimir Putin is not a sane human being and therefore his actions following the show of force by NATO are not rational. Both Russia's decision to use a tactical nuke in Ukraine and NATO's choice to fire their own nuclear missile at Belarus have put the continent in a very tumultuous position. Countries around the world are condemning both sides and begging for everyone to come to the table and discuss what's happening before things escalate to levels from which the world might never return. Francis never agreed with the decision to show that Europe would also use nukes if Putin didn't back down. However, his intel has proved invaluable to the generals of NATO. When Vladimir Putin sent a communication that he wanted to sit down for peace talks, everyone was ecstatic. A delegation was sent to the Ukrainian border where NATO ambassadors would meet with top officials from Russia. Francis was asked to come along to provide the latest intel about where Russian troops were located. Hopefully this information could be used as leverage to show Russia that they were always being closely watched. It would also serve as proof that NATO knew about key military installations and was not afraid to target them if Russia failed to cooperate. Francis is reluctant to go, but he knows it's his duty, and hopefully the intel he provides can help the two sides come to an agreement. Before he leaves his station, Francis pulls the picture of his wife and baby off the side of his screen and puts it in his pocket. Francis and the delegation of NATO diplomats head to the Ukrainian border. They land on a military airfield in Poland and are escorted to the border by NATO forces. As they cross over to Ukraine and enter the small town where the talks are supposed to take place, something seems off. The convoy comes to a stop. The delegates step out to look around. It's quiet. There's no sign of the Russian representatives. Maybe they're just running late, someone suggests. The group heads to the town hall where Russia initially agreed to begin peace talks. They enter the building. It's cold and empty. Cobwebs hang from the ceiling. It's clear no one has been here for a very long time. Something is very wrong. I suggest we get back to the airbase, one of the soldiers says. Francis looks around. He closes his eyes and tightly grips the picture of his wife and daughter in his pocket. He should have seen this coming. He should have kept a closer eye on the movements of the Russian troops in the area. Initially, when Francis noticed that the Russian forces were pulling back, he thought it was a sign of good faith. He just presumed the Russians didn't want to seem threatening, especially during peace talks. Now he realizes how stupid that train of thought was. Just like everyone else, Francis wanted this conflict to end without nuclear war. The Russian forces were not pulling back as a sign of their willingness to engage in peace talks. They were retreating because of what was about to happen next. Suddenly, an intelligence officer stationed back at the airbase begins shouting over the comms. Missile incoming! Get out of there! The voice yells. A tear rolls down Francis's cheek. A moment later, there's a bright flash. A massive explosion erupts out of the nuclear warhead as it detonates, vaporizing the NATO delegation and ending the peace talks. At the same moment as the nuke on the Ukrainian border detonates, Russia launches several more tactical nukes into Kyiv. Although this will destroy most of the city and irradiate the surrounding area, the Russians need to eliminate the Ukrainian resistance once and for all to prove their dominance. They do not send troops or tanks across the border into Europe as they had a hard enough time fighting against Ukraine and would never succeed in capturing the rest of Europe using conventional warfare. EU's leaders watch in horror as Russia launches nuke after nuke. They have not targeted any of Europe's major cities yet. Instead, their targets all seem to be Ukrainian military installations. Russia is showing the world they have escalated their wartime tactics to use tactical nukes. Regular missiles are now all but obsolete. The benefit of using these smaller nuclear weapons is that there's less destruction and fallout, but they still decimate any enemy force in the vicinity. Putin makes it known that if Europe or any NATO nations try to invade his country or launch a counterattack, he's not afraid to unleash his whole nuclear arsenal on Europe. NATO leaders scramble to decide what to do next. Do they launch their own nukes and engage in an all-out nuclear war with no winner? Or do they increase sanctions and mobilize forces to keep Russia from expanding any further into Europe? France and Germany launch ground forces and set up heavy defensive positions along the Ukrainian border. Poland asks for reinforcements as Belarusian military forces cross their border and attack any soldiers or civilians in sight as retaliation for NATO launching a nuke at their country. A major fear is that Russia will sell or gift tactical nukes to Belarus, who will then launch them against NATO forces in Europe. At this point, they could make a strong case to justify such an action. Nuclear war seems all but inevitable. For several weeks, Russia does not seem interested in an invasion of Europe. European countries and their allies struggle to figure out the best way to de-escalate the situation with Putin and his loose trigger finger. Thus far, all of the nuclear warheads fired by Russia have been around a kiloton, meaning that no strategic or megaton nukes have been launched yet. It seems like Europe continues to let Putin get away with murder, but NATO is trying its best to avoid a catastrophic war that will lead to nuclear winter. 
European leaders have been thrown into an unwinnable situation. They either roll over and let Vladimir Putin get away with his egregious atrocities, or they launch their own offensive and deal with the inevitable nuclear consequences. Europe has completely stopped purchasing oil, gas, and goods from Russia. This has hurt the people and the economies of the nations in the EU, but it was a necessary step. Russia's economy has all but collapsed, yet they still have a large influence over oil exports. Not only do they control where their own fossil fuels go, but they also have influence over the other OPEC countries in the Middle East. And even though China condemned the actions of Russia, they rely too heavily on their natural resources to cut ties completely. The suffering in Europe is exacerbated by the fact that every country must ramp up military production and recruitment. Without its main supply of oil and gas, there are not enough resources to go around. Europe has been moving away from fossil fuels and toward using renewable energy, but at this point, it's too little too late. Things become desperate as Germany's economy goes into a depression and the British pound becomes worthless. European nations decide it's time to fight back against the evil dictator of Russia. France and Germany launch air raids across the border. The British Navy fires cannons at Russian naval bases and blockade major ports. Infantry and armor units amass along main strategic points, and when the signal is given, cross into Russian territory. There's carnage and chaos across the continent. As Russian forces are defeated and pushed back, Putin makes the decision that everyone was afraid of but knew was coming. He fires tactical nukes at NATO forces. Nuclear bombs detonate on land and in sea. The British Navy in the Baltic is decimated. In a day, millions of lives are lost, but eventually Putin knows he will either run out of tactical nukes or soldiers, so he does the unthinkable. Warning lights flash across every surveillance center in Europe. Russia has launched hundreds of nukes from its arsenals. These are not the low-yield tactical nukes. Each one is over a megaton. When the warheads explode, they will demolish entire cities and wipe out military forces across Europe. There's no other choice but to fight back. Britain and France launch their own nukes at Moscow and other Russian targets. The rest of the world watches in horror as Europe is consumed by fireballs and covered in radiation. Most of Russia's forces are destroyed when the nukes from Europe explode on Russian soil. For the next several decades, most of Europe will be uninhabitable as the fallout spreads across the continent on shifting winds. The end of Vladimir Putin's reign comes at a cost of an irradiated European continent. It all started with a single tactical nuke launched from a Russian sub at Ukrainian forces. It's a grim outlook for the future of Europe if Putin ever does decide to use nuclear weapons. If this happens, decisions about what to do will be difficult to make. There will likely be mistakes, and many people will die as a result of Vladimir Putin's cavalier use of tactical nukes. There are no good options when it comes to nuclear warfare. This is why no one has used a nuke in combat since 1945 when the United States dropped the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The situation in Ukraine might be the closest we've been to nuclear destruction since the Cuban Missile Crisis, except in the current situation it's not the Soviet Union and the United States who have to come to some sort of agreement, but the leaders of Europe and Vladimir Putin. Hopefully just as the crisis in 1962 was averted, we can avoid a nuclear holocaust in the coming months. Since Russia invaded Ukraine, the war has not been going in Russia's favor. With over 100,000 casualties, thousands of destroyed vehicles, and punishing sanctions against the Russian economy, it's clear that Putin will not meet his war aim of denazifying Ukraine anytime soon. Either through an outright military defeat or humiliating peace, Russia will probably lose the war in Ukraine. But the question remains, what happens to Putin when he loses? The short answer is probably nothing. And here's why. The main reason why Putin will probably not be removed from power is that he is a ruthless statesman. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia faced a troubling and dramatic time during the 1990s. Marked by record unemployment, superinflation, and a massive crime wave, the fragile government of the 90s was dominated by a select few known as the oligarchs. The oligarchs were not necessarily from one region or family in Russia. Instead, the oligarchs were simply people who used existing Soviet connections to purchase state enterprises at ridiculously low prices or steal them outright. Every type of business you can imagine became private overnight, from oil and natural gas to rail networks, industrial factories, food manufacturers, and so on. These early opportunistic entrepreneurs used brute force, cunning trade relationships, and bribery to build their own monopolies within their respective industries. Because the oligarchs wielded so much power purely due to their money, the government under the leadership of Boris Yeltsin was powerless to oppose them. Instead, the government agreed to the oligarchs' demands as long as they funded campaigns of all of Yeltsin's cronies and helped keep the government afloat financially. One of the campaigns that the oligarchs supported was Putin's first presidential bid. Though famous in St. Petersburg at the time, Putin was an unknown figure on the national stage. 
With Boris Yeltsin's backing and the money from the oligarchs, Putin swept the 2000 presidential election as a veritable dark horse candidate. Shortly after winning the presidency, despite gleefully taking the oligarchs' money to support his campaign, Putin started his own campaign against the oligarchs as soon as he was sworn into power. Putin detested the power the oligarchs yielded against the government, and he sought to change that. In the summer of 2000, Putin summoned the 21 wealthiest oligarchs to Moscow to give them a personal message from him to tell all the others. During that closed-door meeting, Putin made it abundantly clear that the oligarchs now only existed because he allowed them to do so. Putin allegedly told them that as long as none of them opposed his will, sought any political aspirations, or in no way challenged what he was going to do, he would let them continue living their life of luxury. If they stepped out of line, he would personally see to it that they were made penniless, thrown in jail, or killed. Not long after the meeting, Putin was put to the test when an oligarch that ran the first independent newspaper in Russia started mocking him on a television series he was running. Shortly after airing the first episode, the oligarch was arrested for defrauding the government of $10 million, thrown in prison and his company sold to a Putin ally for pennies on the dollar. Putin would continue pursuing oligarchs throughout the next 20 years. Putin has jailed or murdered numerous oligarchs since 2000, but his persecution of them has ramped up exponentially since the invasion. Since February 2022, at least 10 oligarchs have been murdered or found dead under mysterious circumstances. Though each case was different, one commonality linking them was their outspoken criticism of Putin and the war. So if the oligarchs, supposedly people with all the money and power in Russia, can't or won't do anything, then who could? The only other entity that could challenge Putin is a group called the Siloviki. Coined about 10 years ago, the term Siloviki means men of force and refers to the group of Putin allies that help him run the country. Once Putin made it clear that the oligarchs would not lord over him, he created a fiercely loyal group of oligarchs directly answerable to him. Since 2000, Putin has been steadily growing his list of trusted confidants that he personally selects. Each of these hand-picked men is given a lucrative business to run. Most of these businesses have deep ties to state-ordered contracts and his cronies and their families have become incredibly wealthy from those relationships. Though the Siloviki lord over their own domains in Russia, they have a few commonalities. Firstly, almost all these men have experience either in the military, police forces, or intelligence services of either the USSR or Russia. Those who do not have this experience have been stalwart allies of Putin, who served with him early on in his political career. Regardless of their backgrounds, they each share an undying loyalty to Putin. It is this loyalty that allows them to be close to him. Though the number of Russian oligarchs is around 400 to 1,000, the number of Siloviki is only around a dozen. Because it's such an exclusive club, the barriers to entry are high. People like Ramzan Kadyrov, the leader of the Chechen Republic, and Yevgeny Prigozhin, known as Putin's chef and the de facto leader of the paramilitary Wagner Group, desire to be in this club, but so far haven't made the cut. When news media talks about people like Ramzan Kadyrov and Yevgeny Prigozhin, they often talk about them as if they're vying to set themselves up to be the future president of Russia. But what they don't understand about the Siloviki is that they too only exist because Putin allows them to. Unlike the oligarchs, the Siloviki are granted audiences with Putin where they can advise him and address their concerns. But what they cannot do is ever challenge his authority. Because of this dynamic, the Siloviki would require an almost unanimous consensus among them to overthrow Putin. It could be possible, since with their cumulative connections in the military, police, and business sectors, they could get away with it. However, this would be unlikely given that some have been staunch Putin supporters literally since Putin's childhood. So, even if the Siloviki would not overthrow Putin, what about the Russian people? After all, with almost 150 million residents, the Russian people far outnumber the dozen or so cronies controlling the country. But going back to Putin being a ruthless statesman, even a popular uprising is unlikely. There has been some very vocal public opposition against Putin, from mass demonstrations in the streets to even shootings at recruitment offices, combined with the mass exodus of hundreds of thousands of Russian men avoiding the draft. However, as one activist has put it, Putin's regime is better at cracking down on protests than they are at organizing them. For example, Putin's security forces have arrested thousands of protesters. These protesters have faced indescribably inhumane treatment while in custody. But what is even worse than their treatment is what happens to them afterward. Many arrested protesters reported that instead of court summons, they were handed draft notices and inducted into the army. This forceful conscription has deterred many from protesting. 
and at the border checkpoints when Russian men were fleeing by the thousands, the Russian military simply set up enlistment offices and handed out draft notices before men could cross the border. These actions and more have stifled resistance among the minority of people actively opposed to Putin and denied a voice to the silent majority. According to most political analysts, Russia has three distinct groups of people. Some actively resist the war, some are staunchly pro-war, and then there is the silent majority. The silent majority is a holdover from the Soviet era, where their parents and grandparents would tell them that everything would be alright as long as there is no war. This group of people, though research has shown that if given a choice, generally do not approve of Putin, would never make these statements publicly, even to their friends and family. Instead, the vast majority of Russia's population chooses to remain apolitical as long as the war does not affect them. Putin is doing everything he can to do just that. For example, Putin called up 300,000 men in his partial mobilization back in September. While the pictures and videos of distraught men being forced to say goodbye to loved ones rippled throughout Russian media, something more tragic has not made any waves at all. The so-called Russian oblasts of the Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic have forcibly mobilized the same number of personnel from a total population of about 41 times smaller than Russia's. Evidence shows that 140,000 men from these two areas have already been drafted by June. By December, it's estimated to now be double that number, and these figures do not even include the thousands of Ukrainians forcibly enlisted in southern Ukraine. In the Donbass, roving patrols of soldiers kidnap all able-bodied men aged 18 to 60 to serve in the army. In fact, the numbers are so huge that the economies in the rear areas no longer function, mostly because no people are left to work. It's this type of all-encompassing general mobilization that Putin does not want Russians to experience because of the huge public backlash he would receive from the silent majority. Another way he's avoiding backlash is by forcibly enlisting immigrants and those from the economically depressed areas. In Russia, there are millions of mostly single Central Asian men who have come to Russia legally to work, and they often send their money home and frequently travel to see their families. Since the war started, Russian army officials have been forcing these men to sign enlistment contracts by telling them that they'd have problems with immigration authorities if they refused. Leaked evidence appears to support this theory. In the spring, documents obtained by an independent news outlet showed the names and home addresses of 120,000 personnel serving in Ukraine. Many of these men had last names and home addresses from Central Asian countries like Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kazakhstan. Since the war started, more studies have proved that mobilization efforts target poorer communities in Russia. Frequently, oblasts in eastern and southern Russia face per capita mobilization rates 10 to 50 times greater than places like Moscow, which is a hotbed of Putin's support. Because most Putin supporters are middle class and higher, Putin's forced generation efforts disproportionately target areas where he is not as popular, thereby keeping his supporters loyal. However, despite racial profiling and discrimination, some communities have embraced this opportunity to increase their standing with Putin. Dagestan, the Muslim-majority republic in the Caucasus, has had rocky relations with Moscow due to decades of Islamic extremism in the region. Local leaders see the war as an opportunity to provide huge numbers of personnel to get political favors with Putin. These communities have become Putin supporters as a way to secure more financial aid and lessen Moscow's grip on local politics. Another factor that keeps the silent majority silent is the lackluster results of the sanctions on the Russian economy. Over a thousand Western businesses have left Russia, and that number grows every day. But despite this, the Russian economy is only expected to retract about 4% this year, far less than Western analysts had hoped. Because of this, though consumers are slightly annoyed because they have fewer options to choose from, there are still plenty of options in large population centers. With increased salaries from state-owned corporations, Putin has done much to ensure his supporters are taken care of. However, these sanctions are hitting Russians harder in rural areas where most of his army hails from. With already depressed wages, the price increases on the available everyday products have hit the wallets of many less economically fortunate Russians. With few state jobs in those areas, these people have seen their buying power plummet. But despite this, they hunker down and endure the storm because of the prevalent Soviet mindset that is stuck around in the Russian countryside. Even though a regime change in Russia is very unlikely, it could still happen. The more likely scenario would be a silent coup from the Siloviki. Up for re-election in 2024, Putin could be forced by this group to not seek re-election. In exchange, Putin and his family would be guaranteed to live out their days in comfort with the estimated $200 billion worth of wealth he personally holds. On the other hand, the much more dramatic scenario would be his forced departure from Russia. 
One of his closest political aides, who was also his speechwriter, claims that Putin's bailout plan should everything go south is to flee to a country like Venezuela. In a dictatorship, Putin would be guaranteed safety and freedom of movement for the rest of his days while still enjoying his vast wealth. As far as a bloody revolution or an assassination, chances of this happening are virtually zero. While a silent coup could be possible, especially if Putin escalates the war beyond what it already is, killing him is out of the question. The opposition is too closely monitored to conduct such an act, and he has too many protections in place from his pro-war hawks, and the silent majority is too afraid to do anything to disturb their quality of life. A Russian tank clanks down a dirt road. Ukrainian soldiers received intel that the enemy would use this route to reach their next objective. The Ukrainian soldiers wait to spring their ambush while they laugh as they see an obsolete Soviet-era tank appear over the crest of a hill. Since the war began, Ukrainian forces have destroyed or captured hundreds of Russia's best tanks. These ancient machines have been brought out of mothball storage to fill out the ranks of Russia's armored forces after the devastating losses it saw in the first few months of fighting. How did Russia find itself in such a predicament, and where have all its tanks gone? In our scenario, the Ukrainian strike force sights the tank using their FGM-148 Javelin. At that very moment, the tank comes to a stop. The turret begins to swivel, facing directly at the Ukrainian strike force. They've been spotted. The commander shouts the order to fire. The Javelin's missile launches into the sky. There's a loud click as the T-62 tries to fire, but the shell jams in the barrel. Time and neglect have rendered the tank almost entirely useless. A few seconds later, the Javelin falls from the heavens and detonates on top of the Russian tank. Another piece of armor bites the dust as the Ukrainian soldiers pack up their gear and head to the next target. There are very practical reasons why Russia has run out of modern tanks and has been forced to use their Cold War stockpiles to pad their army. We'll talk about all of them as this show progresses. This type of scenario has played out across the Ukrainian battlefield since the invasion of the country began back in February 2022. Putin really believed that Russia could just roll across the border and claim Ukraine as its own, but this is not what happened. At the beginning of the conflict, Russia boasted it had over 2,800 tanks. Yet now we're seeing old armored vehicles being brought out of storage to replenish the Russian battalions. Hundreds of Soviet-era tanks have been loaded onto rail cars and carried to the front lines. When Russia invaded Ukraine, the main tanks being used were the T-72s, which were already decades old. Newer tanks have also been deployed, but in nowhere near the same numbers as the T-72. Before the war began, military advisors warned Putin that if the full might of the Russian military wasn't deployed in the initial invasion, they might run into trouble later on. And this is exactly what happened. The hit-and-run tactics the Ukrainian forces engaged in allowed them to not only destroy Russian tanks, but capture them and repurpose the vehicles for their own use. And as we quickly approach a year since the conflict began, it's becoming more and more clear just how much trouble Russia is in. The fact was made abundantly clear when a video surfaced of the precursor to the T-72 being taken out of storage and deployed to the front lines. The tank that is now making an appearance in the war is the T-62, which is all but obsolete. This choice of an ancient tank is surprising, as Russia has somewhere around 10,000 tanks in storage, many of which are newer than T-62s. So why is Russia bringing one of its oldest tanks out of retirement? The answer to this question is so embarrassing even Putin must know how dumb he looks. The Russians have hundreds and even thousands of T-64s, T-72s, T-80s, and T-90s, all of which are newer than the T-62s. But that's the problem. The tanks have been neglected for so long that the newer models, which have more sophisticated components, need massive amounts of repairs. However, T-62s were built using Soviet-era technology and have fewer electronics and moving parts. The simplicity of the T-62 has allowed some of them to last for decades without needing the maintenance that modern tanks require. Many of the more sophisticated tanks that came after the 62s are believed to be beyond repair. Another factor the T-62s have going for them is that Russia has a huge number of them in storage. The sheer number of these tanks constructed during the height of the Cold War likely means that at least a few were found without too much corrosion or rust damage. Even more unfortunate for Russia is the fact that their most advanced tank to date, the T-14 Armada, has not even begun rolling off the assembly line in any meaningful numbers yet. Several years ago, Russia planned on purchasing thousands of these tanks to serve as their main armored force in future conflicts. However, production never began. Putin ordered more tanks to be built, but it's too late. Harsh sanctions and a lack of resources have brought the T-14 production to a standstill. The fact that Russia is now deploying tanks that were starting to be retired in 1975 does not bode well for their war effort. 
There are several reasons that Vladimir Putin and his army are now scrambling to find ways to replenish their armored division. Much of it has to do with Ukrainian doctrine and their refusal to give up their country. But Russia itself has made some huge mistakes, which they're now paying for dearly. Things are even worse than they appear for Russia as they begin pulling old tanks out of deep storage. When tanks like the T-62 were retired, they were put in huge warehouses or parked outside where the elements quickly began to corrode them. Even the tanks that were sealed away in large structures were never taken care of. This means that pickings are slim, as the Russian military scours the thousands of decommissioned tanks for ones that'll work well enough to send to the front lines. Russia is currently facing a tank crisis as they put more retired tanks on the front lines. However, it's only a matter of time before this leads to a catastrophe, as they'll eventually run out of working tanks altogether. It's theorized that the Soviet-era tanks are being deployed just long enough for new tanks to roll off assembly lines. But as we know, these new tanks may never come. This has led to a real crisis for the Russian military. It's pulled back and dug in along the territory it already controls in the Donbass region, so the troop numbers, supplies, and armor can be replenished. It's estimated that Ukrainian forces have destroyed at least four Russian tanks a day since the conflict began. Obviously, on days when there is intense fighting, more tanks are lost than when there's a lull. However, recent estimates suggest the Russian military has lost over 8,400 vehicles and pieces of equipment since the conflict began. This includes around 1,500 tanks, which have either been completely destroyed or captured by the Ukrainian forces. At this point, Russian military officials must be incredibly embarrassed and afraid for their lives. Putin does not take too kindly to failure, and these numbers suggest the invasion has been a huge failure thus far. As Russia starts replenishing its battalions with obsolete tanks, the numbers of losses will only increase for Russia. Less advanced tanks make easier targets, which means the Ukrainian military can keep using the same tactics, while simultaneously taking out even more of Russia's armored divisions. What makes Ukrainian troops so effective against Russian tanks? Some of the reasons are pretty obvious, while others are almost unbelievable. A big part of the Ukrainian military's success has to do with the quality of their weapons. Ukraine is by no means fully stocked with the weapons and gear they need. They are constantly pleading with NATO to send them more military aid, including anti-tank weapons. As the next phase of the war begins, Ukraine will need to prepare for another Russian push forward. And as things stand now, it looks like Russia will launch another attack using tanks and artillery after they bombard major cities and Ukraine's infrastructure with missiles and kamikaze drones. Thus far, Ukraine has made do with what it has. One of the weapons that have been effective in reducing the number of Russian tanks on the battlefield is the US-made FGM-148 Javelin. Since the war began, the United States has supplied Ukrainian forces with over 4,000 Javelins, with more said to be shipped into the country in the coming months. What makes these weapons so effective against any type of tank is the way the missile is deployed. A single Ukrainian soldier can fire a Javelin and destroy a tank. That's pretty staggering as without this weapon it could take a whole unit and some heavy artillery to stop a Russian tank from rolling across the battlefield. The Javelin's missile launches an arc that allows it to strike at the top of the tank where the armor is the weakest. This means that every time a Javelin is fired in Ukraine, there's a good chance it'll either immobilize or severely damage the Russian tank. Even the most advanced tanks that have reactive armor to absorb a missile's impact don't stand a chance against the Javelin. This is because the missiles are fitted with two warheads. The first detonates to damage the disruptive armor, so when the second warhead goes off, all of its power goes into the chassis of the tank. This one-two punch is devastating for any armored vehicle struck by the missile, which is one of the main reasons Russian tanks are not faring so well against Ukrainian troops. Britain is also sending the next-generation light anti-tank weapons to Ukraine to supplement the javelins that the United States has shipped. The thousands of anti-tank weapons that have already been distributed to Ukrainian troops have allowed them to put a sizable dent in the number of tanks Putin is able to field. Unfortunately for Russia, the British in-laws and the US Javelins will be even more effective against their outdated Soviet-era tanks currently being sent to replenish their dwindling armored divisions on the front lines. The United States also plans to send a contingent of switchblade anti-tank drones to Ukraine in the near future. These kamikaze drones will target Russian tanks and reduce their numbers even further. The Russians have been using HESA Shahed-136 drones made by the Iranian company Shahed Aviation Industries to target Ukrainian infrastructure, so it'll be interesting to see how they like it when their tanks are continuously blown up by the same technology they've used to strike against Ukrainian infrastructure. Ukrainian troops, high-tech anti-tank weapons, and well-executed missions are the main reasons why Russia is running out of tanks. Ukrainian soldiers are destroying them faster than Russia can make them, which is not what Putin expected. 
However, there are a few other factors that are leading the rapid decline in Russian tank numbers, and the only one Russia can blame for this is themselves. Russia's tactics when using tanks are a mess. The most common makeup for a Russian unit is known as a battalion tactical group. This consists of a company of tanks, infantry, and artillery, which doesn't seem like a bad combination at first, but Russia has really messed up the numbers of each within the unit. More often than not, these battalions are made up of mostly armored vehicles and tanks, with a small contingent of troops tacked on for protection. Battalion tactical groups are really good at moving quickly, packing a punch and hitting a target hard. However, if they come under attack, they're highly vulnerable. Ukrainian forces have exploited this flaw in the Russian battle plan by waiting for a battalion tactical group to pass by and ambushing them. Using javelins or other anti-tank measures is relatively easy against these Russian units because there are no troops to support the armor. Ukrainian infantry can hide within densely structured areas where the tanks can't maneuver well, which gives them the upper hand. If Russian commanders included more infantry in the battalion tactical groups, these exposed tanks might have a chance against Ukraine's guerrilla tactics. This would be highly beneficial for tanks operating in urban areas or locations where the terrain limits maneuverability. However, Russia still hasn't modified its tactics to take these things into consideration. Therefore, Ukrainian troops continue to incapacitate or destroy Russian tanks that don't have the support they need to successfully fight the types of battles being waged in Ukraine. Along with having battalions without proper support, Russian tactics have another fatal flaw. Before sending tanks into battle, it's important to survey the area using drones or aircraft. However, Russia doesn't seem to be doing this, which has allowed Ukrainian troops to get into striking positions along the routes Russian tanks are using. Ukraine has kept Russia from claiming complete air superiority in the region, which has definitely helped its tank-destroying efforts. Their units take out several tanks at a time and then fall back to prepare for the next fight. These hit-and-run tactics are working like a charm and causing massive losses for the Russians. However, if Russia starts conducting flyovers before moving their tanks into position, it could save a lot of armor from being lost. Recent reports by defense intelligence agencies suggest Russia's moving away from its traditional battalion tactical groups as they finally realized how ineffective they are. But it's a little too late, as the Russian army has already lost hundreds of tanks as a direct result of using BTGs. It's unclear why it took so long for Russia to leverage its numbers and make changes to its unit structure, but it likely has to do with our next point. Besides good Ukrainian tactics and poor Russian tactics, there's another even more awkward reason why Russia's running out of tanks. Incompetence Data collection conducted by independent organizations has suggested that somewhere around half the tanks Russia has lost during the war have either been abandoned or captured. Most experts believe this is due to the incompetence of Russian soldiers. To be fair, it's not entirely their fault. Many of the Russians fighting in Ukraine were just conscripted before the invasion and don't have any battle experience. This factor, on top of very little training, is a recipe for disaster. This has led to entire tank crews abandoning their vehicles and running for their lives. The craziest part is that abandoned tanks are not always the result of Ukrainian ambushes or even fighting breaking out. Some of the Russian tanks that Ukraine recovered were deserted because they had run out of fuel. Think about that for a moment. A war machine worth millions of dollars left for the enemy to capture because it ran out of gas. That brings wartime incompetence to a whole new level. It's almost as if Russian soldiers don't care if they win the war or not, which might be closer to the truth than Putin or anyone in his government wants to admit. Last spring, tanks got stuck in the mud as the snow melted. Regardless of the risks, the Russian high command ordered the tank battalions to push forward in these conditions. The results were inevitable. Many tanks became bogged down to the point they couldn't be pulled out of the muck and were abandoned. So it appears the incompetency of the Russian military runs all the way through the ranks. It's these unbelievably dumb decisions that have led to hundreds of tanks being captured by Ukraine. And once the ground hardens and the gas tanks are filled up again, these war machines can be used by Ukrainian forces to fight the very country that built them. But it's not just low fuel and bad decisions that have led to dwindling tank numbers. Since many of the Russian soldiers did not receive the proper training they should have, tanks have been driven into ditches, resulting in their tracks coming off. However, rather than fixing the problem and making sure the tank doesn't fall into enemy hands, Russian soldiers have just left them behind. It's quickly becoming apparent the loss of tanks is as much the fault of the Russians as it is of the Ukrainian forces. Perhaps the most absurd thing of all is that Russian tanks have been even seen driving off bridges when their operators lost control of the vehicle. In this particular situation, the tanks can rarely be salvaged. But abandoned Russian equipment has become so common during the war that the Ukrainian government even issued a national instruction on what citizens should do if they come across abandoned Russian vehicles or gear. The government was also nice enough to inform their people that any Russian equipment they confiscate does not need to be declared on their taxes, which is absolutely wild. 
The way the Russian military handles their tanks seems more like something out of a wartime comedy than an actual war. However, the continued invasion of Ukraine is no laughing matter. As the winter months continue, Ukraine desperately needs more weapons to fight against this next wave of Russian attacks. Currently, Russian forces have pulled back to lick their wounds and replenish their numbers. After months of fighting, more than 100,000 Russian soldiers have been killed or injured. The Ukrainian people have been battling bravely, but if they do not receive the support they need, Russia will eventually be able to throw enough men and outdated weapons at them to cause greater destruction and loss. Right now, we know the Russian tank numbers are so low that they're bringing Soviet-era tanks out of retirement. These models might be obsolete, but at this point Russia doesn't have a choice. More tanks are being built and will hit the front lines when they're completed, which is why it's vital that Ukrainian forces have weapons to defend against them. Right now, most of the damage being done to Ukrainian infrastructure is by missiles and drones striking power stations and factories. This has left much of the population without any energy or heat. The brutal war that Russia has started will not end as long as Vladimir Putin is in power. And since the psychopathic dictator has a stranglehold on the country and the people in it, the war will likely continue into the coming months regardless if Russia's tank numbers continue to decline. The scary thing is, is if Russia finds itself running low on tanks and other conventional weapons, what will they decide to do next? If Putin can't replenish his battalions with new or even old tanks, will he consider launching tactical nukes? This is a terrifying thought, but Vladimir Putin is a terrifying man, as he could start a nuclear war at any moment in time. For right now, Ukrainian troops appear to be able to deal with Russia's tanks and are even in control of many of them. Ukrainian tactics and Russian incompetence are the main reason why Russia is currently running out of armored vehicles and scrambling to bring outdated tanks out of storage. When the winter ends and the ground begins to thaw from the spring sunshine, it'll be interesting to see how many Soviet-era tanks are left stuck in the mud for Ukrainians to find. A lot of important lessons have been learned from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Unfortunately for China, all these lessons may have put a real damper on their future plans. It's no secret that China wants Taiwan. They continuously claim the island isn't a sovereign nation but part of the People's Republic of China. The United States and much of the rest of the world, including Taiwan, disagree with China's claims. When Putin invaded Ukraine, the Western world and the United States in particular kept a close eye on China to ensure that Xi Jinping didn't have similar ambitions as Vladimir Putin. Now that we're a year into this war, it's highly unlikely that Xi Jinping would do something as stupid as waging a war against Taiwan. Currently, there's only one brutal authoritarian leader who's dumb enough to invade a neighbor, and it's not going great for him. That being said, China has been keeping a close eye on the events unfolding in Ukraine and globally, and with each day that passes, Chinese leadership sees any future plans of seizing Taiwan slowly slipping away. So let's dive right in. Why has Putin's invasion become a disaster for China's future plans? Let's look at each lesson learned from the war thus far and how they all spell bad news for China. The tactic China is currently using against Taiwan is called Gray Zone Operations. At a very basic level, Gray Zone Operations are non-military conflicts and confrontations by one nation, normally a more powerful one, against another nation. This tactic is used to weaken a country's resolve and hinder its ability to grow and create allies. But the key is none of the tactics cause military engagements or directly lead to war. China has been using this strategy in the Taiwan Strait for decades now, getting its name from the gray area between peace and a full-scale invasion. Along with gray zone operations, China is using another tactic against Taiwan called salami slicing. This is when a nation uses a series of many small actions to eventually achieve a much bigger outcome. The key here is that what the nation really wants to achieve is too difficult or illegal to do all at once, which is why it needs to be broken up into smaller steps. For example, China has slowly increased the number of times they've crossed into Taiwan's air defense identification zone until it's become the status quo. They next begin crossing the Taiwan Strait median line with aircraft and naval vessels. They've also been slowly deploying military forces on small islands and even creating artificial islands in the South China Sea. China continuously warns Western leaders against making close ties with Taiwan or visiting the island to restrict international diplomatic relations as well. And of course, China has used its economic might and influence in the region to put pressure on Taiwan's economy and politics. If these things all happen simultaneously, then the argument could be made that China was being too aggressive or preparing to seize control of Taiwan. However, these actions spread out over time allows the world to forget, while the culmination of gray zone tactics could eventually set the stage for China to officially incorporate the island nation into its territory. 
The crazy part is, this is all eerily similar to what Russia did just before invading Ukraine. Vladimir Putin used gray zone tactics in a variety of ways during his first invasion of Ukraine in 2014, and then again just before the full-scale invasion in February 2022. In 2014, when Russia sent in little green men, who were later discovered to be a band of mercenaries known as the Wagner Group, Putin claimed he had no idea who they were. This plausible deniability was a gray zone tactic, albeit one that comes very close to being a military conflict. But the use of gray zone techniques, along with Russian posturing and the West wanting to keep the Russo-Ukrainian war from escalating any further, allowed Russia to annex Crimea. It's important to note that although Russia was using gray zone operations, war eventually erupted, which is something that China has undoubtedly made note of. However, before this happened, the West responded to the aggressive gray zone operations by Russia in a measured manner. This is exactly what China expects the response to be in their gray zone tactics in the Taiwan Strait. They can continually harass and weaken Taiwan, and it's very unlikely the United States or anyone else will send military aid as they would not want to be seen as the aggressors. What China can expect is economic, political, and diplomatic pressure, which it has dealt with for decades and doesn't seem to be worried about. But now, here we are in the year 2023. Russia's in a brutal war with Ukraine, and China can only shake its head at the utter failure of its allies' invasion. When Russia switched from gray zone tactics to full-on invasion in 2022, China watched closely to see what NATO's response would be. This way, they could learn what to do and what not to do if they ever decided to invade Taiwan. We don't know, and probably will never know if China had any plans to invade the island nation in the near future, but if they did, Putin's failing war is likely acting as a deterrent for China to switch from its current gray zone strategy to a more aggressive approach. Let's look at how the world reacted to Russia's invasion of its neighbor and the lessons learned. Putin's invasion has been highly informative for the Chinese leadership. Unfortunately for them, the way the world reacted to Russia's invasion was likely not what they were hoping for. Lesson 1. China learned that size doesn't always matter. China has the largest navy in the world in terms of pure numbers. However, as China and everyone else has learned from the war in Ukraine, having a lot of equipment and soldiers does not necessarily mean you will win a war. One thing is glaringly obvious when China looks at its battle plans to invade Taiwan. They'll need to launch some type of amphibious assault onto the island if they hope to take it by force. When Russia rolled tanks and infantry into Ukraine, it was relatively easy due to the fact that the countries are right next to each other, and Ukraine doesn't really have natural defense features. For China, the Strait of Taiwan poses a huge logistical problem. It's generally agreed that an amphibious assault is much more difficult than a land-based one. In order to reach Taiwan, China's forces need to cross around 100 miles of water. That is 100 miles that Taiwan can unleash aircraft, missiles, and bombs to annihilate huge numbers of Chinese soldiers and vessels. Taiwan would fire artillery shells and anti-ship missiles to decimate the invasion force. When China looks back at how Ukraine was able to repel a massive land-based invasion, this probably gives them pause. Also, Russia lost the Moskva, the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, in the early months of the war to what many suspect was a Ukrainian anti-ship missile, so it's clear that these projectiles would pose a huge threat to China's incoming invasion fleet. There's also the fact that Taiwan is an island, and its main defenses are designed to destroy naval vessels, which means they're likely to have a large stock pile of anti-ship missiles at their disposal. So China has learned from Russia's failure that their superior numbers might not be enough to invade and hold Taiwan. If Ukrainian resistance collapsed due to the sheer magnitude of Russia's invasion force, it would have been one thing. But that's not what happened, which is bad news for a Chinese invasion if they thought the Taiwanese people would just give up because China has a much bigger military. Lesson 2. Russian soldiers showed China that training makes all the difference. When analyzing why Russian troops are faring so badly in Ukraine, China must realize that Ukrainian troops are much better trained than their Russian counterparts. This, along with better communication and tactics by those in command, has allowed Ukraine's far inferior numbers to decimate Russian forces. Upon closer inspection, China and the rest of the world find that many Ukrainian soldiers were trained through the United States National Guard State Partnership Program. Since 1993, the Ukrainian armed forces have been trained using the U.S. model of delivering mission-type orders and empowering Ukrainian soldiers to make in-the-moment decisions on the battlefield. The U.S. National Guard trainers use realistic combat exercises to help hone the skills and wartime decision-making of the Ukrainian military personnel. This has made an enormous difference in the war and allowed the Ukrainian military to be much more effective than the Russians. The bad news for China is that Taiwan joined this same program in 2022, which means every day that goes by, their military is receiving the best training in the world, which will only make an invasion of the island much more difficult in the future. Lesson 3. China has learned that just because nations are far away doesn't mean they'll stay out of the conflict. 
There's no doubt that China is the most powerful nation in East Asia. In fact, they're much more influential than Russia could ever hope to be in Eastern Europe. However, China knows from the war in Ukraine that Western nations half a planet away will still come to the aid of a country that they deem important. Ukraine is not a part of NATO, but NATO nations are sending billions of dollars in military equipment and aid. Case in point, the United States, which is on the other side of the Atlantic, has sent more military aid to Ukraine than any other country. What this means for China is that even though the US is separated from Taiwan by the Pacific Ocean, it will almost certainly send military and humanitarian aid if China invades. Although the United States will likely do more than that, due to the fact that when President Joe Biden was asked if the United States would fight along Taiwan in a conflict, he gave a resounding yes. So by watching the United States send more aid than any other country to Ukraine, China saw their hopes for an ambivalent US in a conflict with Taiwan become more of a dream than a realistic scenario. If the United States is willing to send billions of dollars, high-tech weapons, and state-of-the-art tanks to Ukraine to help them defeat Putin, there is little doubt they would offer the same type of assistance to Taiwan. The difference is that in a China-Taiwan conflict, the president has made it clear the US would take a much more active role. Lesson 4. NATO has learned what works and what doesn't when a country like Russia or China threatens to invade. When Russia began mobilizing troops and sending its military toward Ukrainian borders, China watched what the response by the West would be. It's probable that, like the West, China knew what was coming next. The United States warned that the military exercises Russia was carrying out were just cover for an invasion, and Poland had been screaming at the rest of Europe to prepare for an imminent war for years. However, the response by the West during the weeks before the war broke out was what interested China the most. As more and more Russian troops were sent to the border, the West threatened to enact economic sanctions. China took note of this and likely was relieved at the response for their own future endeavors. Russia's plan, and a possible initial plan for China, was to invade, win the war quickly, and incorporate the vast resources and manpower of the invaded territory into their own economy. Yes, the sanctions would be painful at first, but once the war was over and Russia controlled Ukraine, a reduction in sanctions could be negotiated, and there would be an eventual boost to Russia's economy from the acquisition of Ukraine's territory. China would desire a similar outcome in Taiwan. Sure, there would be some repercussions from the initial invasion, but after swiftly taking Taiwan, they'd be able to negotiate the sanctions away. However, this is not what happened in Putin's war. Russian forces failed to capture Kyiv, and one year later, the war continues to rage, with Russia on the losing side. This is incredibly bad news for China for two reasons. The first is because they didn't get to see the scenario they'd hoped for play out, and therefore couldn't be sure how long the economic sanctions would last if they won a war with Taiwan. The second was that since the threat of sanctions didn't stop the invasion, and when the sanctions were enacted they didn't cause the economic turmoil the West had hoped for, it's possible that in any future conflict, the West's response to an invasion may be very different. Make no mistake, the economic sanctions put on Russia have slowly begun to cripple its economy and they will have long-lasting and very painful repercussions for the nation. However, they did not work as quickly as the West thought they would. Now NATO is believed to be taking a new approach. Rather than deterring a foreign aggressor through sanctions, they're moving toward deterrence through denial. This is a disaster for China, as they would much rather have taken on the sanctions than the second option. NATO now realizes that the threat of sanctions is not an adequate deterrent to stop a powerful nation from invading its neighbor, especially if there is a ruthless dictator at the helm. Their new plan seems to be to deploy troops to a region before things go too far to act as an additional deterrent against invasion. Let's take Taiwan, for instance. If intel suggests that China is mobilizing an invasion force, the United States and its allies might have just threatened economic sanctions in the past. However, Due to Russia invading Ukraine, even when the West made this threat, the new plan could be to send NATO forces on a training mission or create some type of joint task force made up of Taiwanese and US soldiers. If China invaded and US troops were caught in the crossfire, it could result in the West claiming China had attacked them, allowing NATO to enter the war on Taiwan's side. This tactic could act as a more powerful deterrent than just threatening sanctions, as the last thing China wants to fight is a war they cannot win against the West. In Europe, deterrence by denial is currently being implemented by sending entire battalions of NATO troops to the borders between allied nations and Russia. This buildup of troops forces Putin to think twice before trying to expand Russian borders any further. 
The same would be true if the West built up its military numbers around Taiwan. If troops from any NATO country are stationed on the island or near it, China will need to think very carefully about its decision to invade. It would be all too easy for NATO forces to get caught in the crossfire and bring the rest of the alliance into the conflict. The viability of this tactic becomes a little murky since Taiwan is not part of NATO itself, but due to Russia's actions, it's unlikely the West would solely threaten economic sanctions against China to deter them from invading the island. Instead, China needs to now live with the reality that the West is willing to go much further to stop an invasion than it did with Ukraine. Lesson 5. Sanctions are slow, but they do work, and China is very much aware of this. When Russia invaded Ukraine, economic sanctions were enacted. G7 nations froze around $350 billion in Russian assets almost immediately. This surprised even Putin, as he didn't believe the West was willing to escalate things so quickly. However, it's now clear that even if economic sanctions don't work as a deterrent, they will still be used as punishment if China ever decides to invade Taiwan. As Russia is currently finding and China is closely observing, the sanctions will cause turmoil down the road. Russia can no longer get many of the parts and resources it needs to continue resupplying its military. Their monetary reserves are quickly running dry, and their economy is suffering more and more with each day as the war continues. The sanctions took close to a year to show results, but it's happening. China knows firsthand how crippling sanctions can be as Russia pleads with them for aid. It might make Chinese leadership wonder if invading Taiwan will be worth the economic consequences for the country if the Russian economy completely collapses. The world is a global economy, and although China plays a huge role in it, it still needs goods and resources from other nations, including the West. On top of that, one of the largest aspects of the Chinese economy is its ability to manufacture goods for foreign countries and sell them in foreign markets. Two of the largest markets for China are the United States and the European Union. If they were to enact sanctions and freeze buying Chinese goods because of an invasion of Taiwan, the Chinese economy could crumble much quicker than Russia's. By watching what's happening to the Russian economy, China knows that sanctions would mean a sharp decline in foreign investments, decreased availability of key technologies, and a decline in exports. If the sanctions were short-lived, China might be able to weather the storm. But every indication coming out of Russia is that the West is willing to sustain harsh sanctions even at a great cost to their own economies. It's just another disastrous lesson that China has learned from Putin's war in Ukraine. Lesson 6. The invasion of Ukraine and the ensuing conflict has caused NATO to keep a closer eye on authoritarian governments, especially China's. It was not clear just how far Putin was willing to go before the invasion. He did a lot of posturing and made a lot of threats, but it was nothing new for the Russian dictator. In the weeks leading up to the invasion, it became clear that Putin would go all the way. This was initially a shock for many leaders around the world, but learning from their mistakes, NATO likely won't be taking authoritarian threats as lightly anymore. This has set up a less than optimal scenario for China. The gray zone tactics it's been getting away with for decades now might be taken more seriously by the West, all because Vladimir Putin took things too far. If Putin had never invaded Ukraine, China might have been able to continue using its gray zone operations to weasel its way into having more leverage over Taiwan. However, now the West will be watching every move they make, which is the opposite of what China wants if it's planning to eventually take Taiwan. The invasion of Ukraine was also a wake-up call to the United States and the rest of NATO. Ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union, NATO has enjoyed being strong enough that it was highly unlikely anyone would threaten their interests. However, this false sense of security is part of the reason why Russia was able to mobilize forces and invade Ukraine. For too long, the United States was ambiguous about how far they were willing to go to protect certain nations. The US had the most powerful military in the world. There's no denying that it's the backbone of NATO. But if the United States needed to fight alone, it could defeat any other country due to its sheer size and capabilities of its military. Both Russia and China are unable to keep up with the modernization of their militaries in the same way the US does. This means that the US has an edge in any conflict. After the invasion of Ukraine, the US realized that other nations might have forgotten how powerful its military actually is. US leaders had assumed that it no longer needed to explicitly state which nations it was willing to support and send aid to. However, Vladimir Putin made it clear that he was willing to invade a country even if it did have close ties to the US. This has opened the eyes of the US government, and they're now taking a much more active approach of drawing red lines and making explicit statements about which part of the world they are not just willing to support, but will fight for. Unfortunately for China, the United States has made it clear that Taiwan is one of those places. If Putin hadn't invaded Ukraine, NATO might have continued to coast and allow China to exert influence over Taiwan until its invasion plans came to fruition. Now there's very little chance the US will allow Chinese gray zone tactics to continue to the same extent as before. 
The US will most certainly be keeping a close eye on China from now on to ensure it doesn't mobilize any type of invasion force, and if it does, there will almost certainly be a military response by the US and its allies. Lesson 7. If an invasion goes wrong, power and influence go with it. If Russia had been able to quickly take Ukraine, dismantle its government, and incorporate its people into its territory, it would have been very bad news for the West. NATO and its allies would have needed to contend with the fact that Russia was a powerful adversary and that its military capabilities were as strong as Putin claimed it to be. But that's not what happened, and now the world knows that Russia is nowhere near as powerful as Putin made it out to be. An invasion is a great way to turn the world against you. A failed invasion is a great way to turn the world against you and lose any respect and power you once had. Putin's war has shown Russia's weaknesses. Even neutral nations have turned their backs on Russia and no longer fear Putin the same way they had before the invasion of Ukraine. Russia has been called out for its war crimes, lost control of the narrative they were trying to create, and allowed NATO to become more unified and emboldened. All of these things resulted from the failed invasion of Ukraine. China now has to wonder if the risk of invading Taiwan is worth the reward. The Chinese government desperately wants to control Taiwan, and even though it claims the island is part of its territory, the fact that Taiwan has its own government and does not answer to the authoritarian leaders of China paints a very different picture. If China were to launch an invasion to incorporate Taiwan under its control and fail, it could cause China's power and influence in East Asia to become greatly diminished. China's worked hard to make sure it's the most dominant country in its part of the world, and to be fair, they have succeeded. Nations like Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan all have close ties to the West, but no matter who you are in East Asia, you rely on China in some form or another. If China invaded Taiwan and a drawn-out war commenced, it might cause their influence to decrease in the region, while countries like Japan, South Korea, and Australia become more influential. Seeing this very scenario unfold in Russia might give China pause when planning for the future and what they should do with Taiwan. Lesson 8. Just because a country is a major power does not mean the world can't live without them. When Russia threatened to cut off energy supplies to Europe, there was panic. Russia sold a massive amount of natural gas to northern Europe and controlled a large oil supply as well. When Western nations decided to reduce their purchasing of Russian fossil fuels and put a cap on how much they would spend, the Russian economy suffered. They continued to sell resources to other nations, such as India and China, but at a reduced price, lowering their profits. Needless to say, just because Russia controlled a huge amount of energy resources that Europe relied on didn't stop them from decreasing their dependence on Russia and finding other ways to fuel their homes, businesses, and infrastructure. This means that even though China controls a lot of resources in East Asia and provides goods globally, the world won't adjust or just do without them. China probably hoped to see the West cave in and give in to Russian demands, or at the very least, Europe would find they couldn't survive without Russian resources. But neither of those things happened. It would likely be a similar story with Chinese goods if they invaded Taiwan. Reducing reliance on China might be painful at first, and the global economy would certainly suffer, but it could be done. So why is Putin's invasion of Ukraine such a disaster for China? Because of the eight lessons we've just discussed. The failed invasion of Ukraine is a warning to China that the world is a different place than just a year ago. Everything China has learned, NATO has learned as well. Any mobilization by Chinese military to invade Taiwan would likely be met with much more resistance than Russia faced. The United States will probably be more aggressive in its response, and even though China is a powerful nation, it does not mean that they will be able to stand against the combined might of the West. If things had gone differently in Ukraine and Russia had been successful in the early days of the war, China might have looked at the invasion of Taiwan more optimistically. However, Putin's disastrous war is a bad omen for any plans China once had of taking Taiwan by force. Nuclear strikes in Kyiv, a global digital war, and an ultimate confrontation between Russia and NATO. What would happen if Ukraine won the war? The initial Russian invasion of Ukraine met with a mixture of success and failure. Attacking from four different axes, the thrust south out of Belarus toward Kyiv was meant to be a fatal decapitation strike that ended the war in days. Yet this swift war-ending plan would meet with one of the most catastrophic strategic failures of the post-World War II age. Logistics completely mishandled, Ukrainian resistance and capabilities utterly underestimated, and Russian troops and equipment revealed to be severely lacking in training, capability, and even basic maintenance. The attack on Kyiv showed the world that the once-feared Russian army was a lumbering, hapless giant doing as much harm to itself as its enemies. However, for all its failures in the north, the attack on southern Ukraine was much more successful, and Russia achieved some of its finest operational successes in its drive toward Kherson. Ukrainian forces were routed and forced to retreat time and again, and even Ukrainian air power was successfully suppressed there. 
Unlike other areas of the country where slow, unstealthy Bayraktar drones destroyed very expensive and sophisticated air defense vehicles. Yet, for all its success in the south, the Russian offensive came to a slow crawl at the start of the summer. Once it was clear that Ukraine would not fold in a matter of weeks, the United States had already made plans to supply it with combat vehicles, including the famous or infamous, depending on which side of the new Iron Curtain you stand, HIMARS system. Armed with long-range precision strike capabilities, Ukraine now could make Russia really suffer by destroying ammo depots and command posts deep behind the front lines. Inevitably, the Russians were forced to put their logistical hubs further back, out of HIMARS range, which slowed the rate of resupply, slowing the entire Russian offensive. By midsummer, the offensive was making daily gains measured in single-digit meters. By the end of the summer, the offensive was officially stalled out. Then Ukraine launched its counterattack, retaking vast swaths of territory in the north and putting serious pressure on Kherson, the only regional capital and major city Russia had managed to take. By November, Kherson was liberated, and the world was finally asking the question, could Ukraine defeat Russia, and what would happen if it did? First though, how could Ukraine defeat Russia? Russia may be a corrupt, inept, and unsophisticated military fighting with 20th century doctrine, but it's still a significant threat to a nation like Ukraine. What Russia lacks in modern equipment, training, food for its soldiers, blankets, literally everything, it makes up for in sheer numbers. Yes, Russian conscripts may be sent to the front lines with only four magazines of ammunition and having fired their weapon just one time, but they are being sent there in droves. 300,000 have already been conscripted and with Russia enacting stop-loss measures to prevent people leaving the military after their contract is up and the biannual conscription drive, the Russian forces are set to remain significant in number for a very long time to come. Quantity is a quality all its own. And while this would not matter against the forces of a modern Western military, Ukraine simply doesn't have the hardware and experience to deliver the type of shock and awe warfare that saw vastly outnumbered US forces routinely defeat much larger militaries in the last 30 years. To defeat Russia in the occupied territories, Ukraine is going to have to send a lot of conscripts home in body bags. Adding to the difficulties is the fact that Russia is now on the defensive, which gives even their inexperienced and low-morale conscripts a significant advantage. The US and its European allies will have to continue to supply Ukraine with modern weapon systems while providing financial support. The introduction of American weapons like HIMARS or HARM, the high-speed anti-radiation missile, were absolute game-changers for Ukraine. HARM missiles have been and will continue to be of critical importance as Ukraine prepared and executed its counteroffensive. While HIMARS allowed Ukraine to shape the battlefield and preparatory operations, HARM is what allowed even unsophisticated Bayraktar drones to operate in the southern territory, providing direct fire support to troops. The US quickly identified harm as a critical necessity for Ukraine early in the spring, but the problem was that the American harms were configured to be carried and fired by Western planes. The US quickly set engineers on the problem who jerry-rigged the solution, allowing American harms to talk with Ukrainian MiGs. With that hurdle cleared, Ukrainian fighters soon took to the skies to undertake wild weasel suppression of enemy air defense missions. Russia worked hard to discredit harm as an effective weapon. It spread disinformation about harm weapons locking onto microwaves in the Donbass, which if true would only make these weapons even more terrifying, not less, as the sensitivity required to detect let alone target faint microwaves from hundreds of miles away is astronomical. But Russia's media campaign to discredit the US and its weapons and reassure its own civilians was unraveled by the simple observation that before harm was in theater, Ukraine's slow drones weren't operating anywhere near the Kherson front. After harm, Ukrainian drones were back to their favorite hobby of blowing up Russian vehicles. That's good because the poor things were probably horribly bored after enjoying the absolute Disneyland that was blowing up the 40-mile-long convoy outside Kyiv. With over two dozen HIMARS systems in Ukraine, and not one of them verified as destroyed yet, Ukraine is going to need even more of not just HIMARS and harm, but other modern weapon systems. Without this critical force multiplier, even Ukraine's massive conscription effort, which began at the start of the war and is now paying dividends in thousands of trained soldiers per week, won't be enough to win a true victory. Western powers know this too, and there have been ongoing discussions about which modern systems can be sent to Ukraine. The United States is, for instance, still training Ukrainian pilots to fly the F-15 Eagle, an extremely capable aircraft for the types of missions Ukraine needs fighters for. The effort will take a very long time to complete, though, meaning that Ukrainians flying American F-15s won't be possible at least until next summer, as the training is simply too intensive. The Abrams has also been identified as a possibility for sending to Ukraine. 
Back in September, the US confirmed that Abrams tanks were on the table for Ukraine. However, to date, not a single tank has been sent. Much like training pilots to fly the F-15, training Ukrainian tank crews on the Abrams will take time. However, it's not just about training but also the fact that sending the M1 Abrams to Ukraine will require the creation of an entire logistics chain to support the tank in battlefield conditions. This also takes time, a lot of it, and a lot of money and personnel. So if the Abrams does make its debut in Ukraine, it likely wouldn't happen until late next year. Leopard 2s, Gripen fighters, and more air defense systems, Ukraine's wish list is long but absolutely necessary if it's to win over Russia. At the moment, Ukraine is likely capable of pushing for a ceasefire, and indeed it seems as if Russia is even willing to negotiate a settlement. But victory for Ukraine, as made clear by both President Volodymyr Zelensky and his people, means taking back all occupied territories, including Crimea. With Russian forces deeply entrenched in Crimea, there's no chance of this happening without massive and ongoing Western support. So, what if Ukraine does win? Ukraine's wishes to join the EU and NATO is what prompted the crisis to begin with. The last thing Vladimir Putin wanted to see on his watch is yet another neighbor coming under the influence of Western powers, so that's why he launched a war that ended up creating two new NATO members. However, even in victory it's not certain that Ukraine would be fast-tracked into membership of both organizations. For one, a defeat of Russia in Ukraine, especially one that sees Russia lose Crimea, would be of nearly unbearable national shame for the nation. Russia is not the most logical or reasonable of actors, and the threat of it using nuclear weapons is very real. Russia may simply decide to launch a nuclear attack on Ukraine if it moves directly to NATO or EU ascension, a direct provocation to the West daring to strike back at Russia with its own nukes. This is very unlikely to happen for a nation that's not even in the club yet. Of course, that's if Putin is still in power as a total defeat in Ukraine would signal the end of Putin's political career. While he has done a great job at eliminating rivals and consolidating his power, the halls of the Kremlin are full of people eager to see Putin fall so they can take over. Unfortunately, most of them are even worse than Putin and might be even more dangerous in total defeat, not less. While someone like Dmitry Medvedev, a former prime minister installed by Putin during a break in his presidential terms, could take power for themselves, he would be too weak on his own and likely end up serving as a puppet to someone the likes of Wagner Group owner and real-life grimace Yevgeny Prigozhin. Prigozhin is a deeply nationalist figure, and as merciless and ruthless as Putin, he's unlikely to take the utter humiliation of Russia sitting down. After Russia's defeat, it's also likely that the international community will order Russia to pay reparations to Ukraine. If it fails to do so, it'll face even more decoupling from the global economy. Ongoing sanctions meant to deter Russia from ever becoming a serious threat again would likely see Russia turn into a third world economy, not necessarily in size but in scope, as the nation loses all ability to compete in technological markets or acquire sophisticated electronics. In several years' time, a new Russian revolution is not out of the question as citizens grow increasingly angry over the economic fallout from the failed invasion. An inevitable result of Russia's war, even if it wins at this point, is a complete reshaping of the balance of power in the non-Western-aligned world. China would officially dethrone Russia as the most important economic, military, and political power amongst the community of non-Western-aligned nations, yet another humiliating blow to Russian national prestige, but a major propaganda victory for China, as it still chafes from the embarrassment of having to rely heavily on the Soviet Union handouts during the Cold War. The Russian bear is on the march, or so Russian propaganda would tell you. To say the war in Ukraine hasn't worked out like the Kremlin was hoping would be putting it mildly, and one key element of the Russian war machine is almost completely missing in action. Why is the Russian Air Force not being utilized in Ukraine? At first it seemed like Russia was going to rout Ukraine, after all, one was a former military superpower with the world's largest supply of nuclear weapons, and the other was a nation that had been through a lot of political upheaval and had never been tested on the battlefield. The power differential was so big that most people assumed Ukraine would be overrun within weeks and that NATO nations on its border might be next. But then, something happened after almost six months of fighting. Ukraine's military, bolstered by powerful and modern weapons from NATO, struck back and started taking back one conquered city after another. People waited nervously for Russia to strike back, and then it didn't happen. Russian forces fought bitterly and many retreated. After all, the Russian military was understaffed, under-equipped, and filled with draftees. Russia continued to pound Ukraine with missiles, 
but Ukraine has gotten well used to the procedures of sheltering from bombs during the early days of the war, and the missiles could only do so much damage. Russia lacked one key element which would have made these strikes much more devastating – precision aircraft that could deliver a devastating payload behind enemy lines. Ukrainian forces watched the skies, but nothing seemed to be coming. Why did the Russian Air Force go missing at this key moment? Russia's main problem is that its Air Force was designed for a very different war. Russia's Air Force dates back to pre-revolution days when the Soviets had their own powerful program designed for a possible World War III with the United States and its allies. Much like their nuclear program, it was invested in heavily and then barely used because Russia's military conquests didn't require the use of an air force. Most of the invasions the Soviet Union successfully pulled off were to their west or the countries of Eastern Europe or to their south in the resource-rich but lightly populated Central Asian republics. They pushed further south to Afghanistan but they only found trouble there, and most of their influence outside Eurasia in places like Cuba and Vietnam was largely political rather than military. So, the Soviet Union never faced a major air-based conflict, leaving Russia without the experience it needs to conduct itself in such a conflict. Russia's air force is old-fashioned in every possible way. Much like Russia's nuclear weapons, most of its planes are of Cold War models, and that means they're still based around Russia's Cold War doctrine. As the Soviet Union's power base was an ocean away from the United States, its air doctrine didn't place a focus on fighting for air superiority against the West. The goal of the Soviet Air Force was largely to provide support over key fronts, taking out enemy ground forces while backed up by ground-based air defenses. They're critical for scouting and other missions, but odds are that the best Russian airplane would lose a one-on-one -on -one dogfight to the best US fighter jet, and it wouldn't even be close. Because it's not just the plane, it's the pilot. Odds are that the man behind the cockpit of a US fighter jet will have lived and breathed that plane for a long time. On the other hand, a Russian soldier behind the cockpit might be, well, just a regular pilot. They lack the specialized training to gain air superiority and the specialized aircraft to maintain it and help their troops on the ground. The US has a whole line of aircraft designed not just to dominate the skies, but to take out ground-based air defenses. These SEAD aircraft, also nicknamed the Wild Weasels, are completely absent from Russia's military. And the results speak for themselves. During the early days of the war, the Russian Air Force was pounding Kyiv, and Kyiv was fighting back thanks to NATO-provided aircraft and ground-based air batteries. Countless Russian aircraft went down in flames, although when asked to provide exact numbers, Russia responded, Nyet. Not only were these very demoralizing losses, but they were very costly. Airplanes are among the most expensive parts of any military assault, and it seemed like the Ukrainians had their number. So when the assault on Kyiv faltered, Russia changed tactics and started focusing on consolidating their gains in the east, even annexing some areas under widely condemned sham referendums. These holdings were largely kept under control by ground troops and vehicles. After all, you can always draft more troops, you can't draft more planes. And then, when the Ukrainians turned the table, no one was sure what to expect. There were large Ukrainian battalions coming for cities that Russia claimed, and Putin was boasting that any attempt to take back the cities would be an attack on Russia itself. So why weren't the planes bombing the forces coming for cities like Kherson and Kharkiv? Because the Russian Air Force really isn't an air force at all. Russia has powerful and fast planes, sure, but what they lack is the high-tech intelligence gathering capabilities that the US planes have. Russian planes are essentially just airborne artillery. They're sent on bombing missions based on intelligence they're handed by their commander, and they deliver the payload with very little initiative on their own. Unlike US top flight teams, they're not able to hunt the enemy independently. And with the Ukrainian forces, that is a big problem. The Ukrainian forces have proven much more savvy and resilient than many expected, and they're known for their highly effective battlefield maneuvers. They've successfully psyched out the Russian forces more than once, most famously in the city of Kherson. This was one of the cities that Russia had annexed, and no one was sure if Ukraine would even attempt to take it back. But using the highly accurate HIMARS rocket system provided by the United States, Ukraine targeted supply bridges to the Russian efforts, cutting them off from critical supplies. Ukrainian forces then massed near Kherson, causing Russia to rally to defend it, and then attacked and liberated the city of Kharkiv instead, cutting off another key supply source for Russia. Russia found itself outnumbered in Kherson, and soon that city was lost as well. And based on initial intel from commanders, the Russian Air Force likely would have bombed the wrong target and made the situation worse. But the problems with the Russian Air Force don't end there. Many of the Russian planes that enter Ukrainian airspace don't come back. Kyiv reports that its military shot down nine Russian warplanes in a two-week period in August and September alone, and at least five of those losses have been confirmed. 
Russia remains tight-lipped and Ukraine isn't giving away operational details either, but it's believed the weapon responsible is a German self-propelled anti-aircraft gun, meaning that Ukraine isn't even risking its own planes to take the Russian ones out of the sky. But the Russian Air Force didn't remain grounded. A few weeks after those losses, they were back in the skies pounding Ukrainian cities. The Russian Air Force was mostly targeting stationary Ukrainian positions, mostly in the country's east. The targets were largely areas of Ukraine that Russian forces had recently abandoned, essentially trying to make Ukraine's recent gains uninhabitable. Would it work? The initial attack on the small liberated city of Sperna saw two strike aircraft accompanied by a drone dropping unguided bombs delivered via parachute. The Ukrainians decided it wouldn't be worth shooting them down and just retreated, and it wasn't clear if any valuable targets were hit. Other Russian Air Force hits have been successful, but maybe not as successful as the alternative. Because there's one major problem with the Russian Air Force that might put the final nail in its coffin. When these planes enter Ukrainian territory, they have to brave the NATO-provided air defenses at Ukraine's disposal. When those planes get shot down, not only are the pilots in danger, but million-dollar aircraft wind up destroyed or behind enemy lines. That can mean Ukraine winds up getting key information on Russia's planes, which would no doubt pass on to its allies in NATO. With their limited capabilities, this means that using the Air Force might be a bigger risk than it's worth for Russia, especially since they have an alternative that does the same thing. Russia's assault on Ukraine has followed a simple pattern. They invade areas, try to conquer them, and then largely get run out of town by the better organized Ukrainian military. But when Ukraine wins the battle on the ground, the war doesn't end, because Russia then unleashes a barrage of long-range missiles from Russian territory designed to pound the population into submission. It hasn't worked. As the Ukrainian fighting spirit is as strong as ever, and President Volodymyr Zelensky has used the Russian atrocities to rally the world to Ukraine's defense, but it has worked to create a climate of fear in many Ukrainian cities, including Kyiv. While the bombing has lessened since the beginning of the war, it seems to step up whenever Putin suffers a humiliating loss, and unlike Air Force bombing raids, it's hard for Ukraine to retaliate. For now. In recent months, Ukraine has gotten bolder, not just striking back at Russian forces and weapon systems in Ukraine, but across the border. And as Ukraine gets closer to the border by taking back more regions that Putin had annexed, it becomes easier to hit Russian soil and their jets are far more effective and efficient than the Russian alternative, equipped with many of the same intelligence-gathering tools that NATO jets have. They don't have the numbers advantage. It's estimated that Russia has around 300 warplanes in range of Ukraine, while Ukraine only has around 100, but Ukraine is likely to win any air battle quite decisively, thanks to their support from anti-aircraft weapons on the ground. But numbers can be deceiving. Despite some grousing about the budget from Republicans, the odds are good that NATO and the United States will continue to supply Ukraine with the weapons it needs to fight off Russia for as long as possible. Russia, on the other hand, has only a finite domestic supply to draw from, and it's growing thinner and thinner. They also don't have a reliable source for new planes. Most of their allies, like Iran, don't have a strong air force, and China has been increasingly unwilling to commit to Putin's war which means that every plane Ukraine manages to strike down is one less Russia has in store for a bigger offensive. All this means that the Russian Air Force will not be providing the difference in the war. This makes you wonder, if Putin can't use his Air Force to win the war, what will he use instead? It's been one year since Russia began its war to defeat Russia by invading Ukraine, and in this time Vladimir Putin has set himself up to become the most catastrophic Russian leader in modern history. This is the ultimate compendium of Russia's failures so far. Russia's failures began before the war started. When planning a military campaign, there are certain steps critical to the planning process. First, one must sort out the internal logistics of a military action. Supply and logistics chains stretching back to the factories that produce your warfighting kit need to be evaluated for robustness in an increased tempo environment. Food and medical supplies need to be stockpiled and pre-staged for rapid distribution. Plans for the ongoing resupply of forces, while accounting for battlefield attrition of your logistics force, need to be established. The domestic temperature needs to be taken into account. Just how supportive is your population of the war to come? Intelligence assessments of your enemy's capabilities must be conducted. Predictions about the international response to your military action must be made with plans to account for different scenarios. Instead of doing most of this, Putin just said YOLO and sent his tanks to Ukraine. Now, to be fair, there was some preparation for the invasion. Putin tasked his intelligence services with infiltrating Ukraine and taking the temperature, so to speak. In 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea, it did so with significant amounts of local support. It also completely overran a Ukrainian military that was disorganized, inefficient, and untrained as, well, Russia's military today. Because Ukrainian forces, for the most part, broke and ran. 
Russian forces never got a chance to truly shine, and by truly shine we mean show the world and Russia that its military is a bunch of clown shoes. It's easy to be the second best army in the world when nobody's putting up a fight. The details remain unconfirmed, but what is known is that the intelligence reports returning from Ukraine were favorable. The Ukrainian military would hardly put up a fight, and its people would largely welcome Russians as liberators. How in the world anybody believed that last part after Ukraine erupted into violence against its Russian-backed president eight years earlier is beyond any of us here at the infographics office. Very credible rumors have circulated around those intelligence reports with allegations that the operatives tasked with carrying out this operation had in fact pocketed the millions of rubles given to them by Putin and simply made up favorable reports. The rumors remain unverified, but are extremely believable for multiple reasons. First of all, corruption is the name of the game in the Russian military and the government. More on that later. Second, Putin kept his intentions to invade Ukraine secret from all of his most senior staff. At the time of the invasion, the vast majority of the military was completely unaware that it would be crossing into Ukraine. More on that later as well. Thus, it is completely believable that corrupt intelligence officials simply pocketed the money figuring that Putin would never be crazy enough to invade his next-door neighbor. Shortly after the invasion, Sergei Beseda was put on house arrest. By April, he was in prison, his deputy was also placed under house arrest, and rumors are several other intelligence officers had been imprisoned. Not only had Putin's intelligence services, whom were feared globally during the Cold War, misjudged Putin, but they had completely misjudged what little intelligence work they had bothered to do. Thus, it came as a surprise to all when Ukrainians greeted Russian invaders with Kalashnikovs instead of flowers. But the pre-invasion fail train doesn't just stop at this station. Because Putin had kept the invasion secret, when the Russian military was mobilized, it did so without taking into account the supply and logistics chains which would need to be pushing hundreds of kilometers into Ukraine. Instead, units were given enough supplies for a few days. Because the Russian military is basically fueled by corruption at every level, we have verified reports from the very eve of the invasion of Russian soldiers selling gasoline and diesel for alcohol and cigarettes to locals. In a professional Western military, you might have been able to keep a cross-border invasion secret without worrying about your soldiers literally selling their own equipment to the nearest taker. But this is Russia. The lack of logistics planning also meant that Russian forces basically had no plan for resupply deep inside of Ukraine. Putin, whom it's important to note has no military background, apparently thinks that food, fuel, and ammo can simply be wished into existence by soldiers on the move, because while planning his top-secret military invasion, he never bothered to have the head of his logistics command in on the planning. The Russian logistics, which are already famously terrible, were caught completely unprepared to support a fully mobilized expeditionary force deep inside enemy territory. And then, suddenly, the go order was given and nearly 200,000 Russian soldiers realized they were not on exercises. That's when things got really stupid. In 1991, the United States military led an international coalition against one of the largest military forces in the world, the Iraqi army. In a matter of weeks, the Iraqi military was defeated in what is possibly the single most one-sided war in history. Ten years later, the US did it again, and this time with a fraction of the troops and allies. Both times, it absolutely trounced any resistance put up against it through a combination of multi-domain warfare, technological superiority, and very well-trained professional troops, a significant cut above their counterparts. Vladimir Putin saw both US victories and thought, yeah, I can totally do that too. He could not. To be perfectly fair, it's not really Putin's fault he believed his forces were even remotely capable of one-tenth of what the US and NATO could do. Vladimir Putin has ensured his own political survival thanks to a breakout of freak accidents involving political rivals falling out of windows or accidentally running into bullets fired by assassins. Over the years, he's consolidated his grip on power and, like any good dictator, surrounded himself by weak yes-men whom he perpetually pits against each other. By making sure that those around him hate each other more than him, Putin ensures that none of them can gather the support needed to oust him from power. However, this level of extreme corruption has a direct impact on the running of a government. For starters, if you're appointing thoroughly corrupt yes-men to positions of power, you can bet that in order to secure their own power, they're doing that exact same thing under them. This repeats itself on and on down the line to the point that you have even individual unit commanders whose qualifications are not competency or ability but loyalty. The real problem comes when it's time to do a self-evaluation, a health checkup if you will, rather than passing along negative news about things like readiness, equipment condition, and troop training, you pass along favorable reports instead. Because after all, any negative reports could be capitalized on by others wanting your position. The last thing your boss wants is to tell his boss something they don't want to hear. 
It's like a game of telephone, only the original message being passed along is already an outrageous lie. But this culture of corruption bred by Putin is even more insidious, because like an aggressive cancer it eats the Russian military alive from the inside out. After all, if you are corrupt and stealing public funds, you can bet your Sernikia that the person under you is doing the same. On and on down the chain to the point that conscript soldiers are tearing the wiring out of combat vehicles so it can be sold for cash, under the direct orders of older conscripts who threaten them with beatings if they don't find a way to raise enough cash for them to buy vodka and cigarettes. Those older conscripts naturally are already busy selling grenades and ammunition from the armory. Thus, while Vladimir Putin reviewed readiness reports as he prepared for an invasion, he could hardly be blamed for not knowing his military was an absolute shit show, hardly prepared for basic parade drills, let alone invading another country. Having drunk his own Kool-Aid, Putin gave the go-ahead and even planned his invasion believing he was at the head of the world's second most powerful army. Within hours, it was clear he'd have to fight for the title of most powerful army inside Ukraine. The initial plan was for a lightning strike into Kyiv, with the vaunted Russian paratroopers at the very tip of the spear. They would take key airfields around Kyiv and hold them long enough for Russia to fly in with reinforcements, with an armored thrust south out of Belarus to end mass to the attack. Within three days, the capital and Zelensky's government would both fall. It was a bold, ambitious plan, a lightning operation to make even the United States envy Russia's capabilities, one that would put Putin in the history books. And it did put him in the history books, just not quite how he envisioned it. Operation Fail Hard and Fail Fast began with a preemptive attack on Ukrainian radar and air defense sites and command and control networks. This is always a good idea before any military invasion. It's an even better idea, however, when you have actual up-to-date maps. In a turn of events that will surprise absolutely none of you, Russian maps were out of date, with many of them going back to the Soviet era. This meant that many modern installations were unaccounted for, or the maps were inaccurate enough that precision strikes, well, weren't. During the Gulf War, the US famously put a bomb through a ventilation shaft of an Iraqi government building. In February of 2022, Russia was lucky if its missiles were hitting the right city. But to be fair, the initial Russian bombardment succeeded in disrupting the Ukrainian air defense network, though this was largely due to the effect of electromagnetic attack and the fact that Ukraine believed it was facing the second most powerful army in the world. Thus, Ukrainian air defenses quickly moved from their positions in a famous tactic known as don't be where you were when the bombs fall. But whereas the US spent weeks prepping Iraq for invasion the first time, and months using special forces and CIA operatives to undermine the Iraqi military and identify targets the second time, the Russian military threw a handful of missiles around Ukraine and called it good enough. This would soon be a disastrous decision. The disruption of Ukraine's air defense network allowed for the insertion of low-flying helicopters carrying hundreds of soon-to-be corpses. The Russian VDV, or paratroopers, are Russia's most elite troops so celebrated that they even have their own official holiday. No news on what 2023's festivities will look like, considering many of them are now dead. The paratroopers were dispatched to airfields outside of Kyiv, where supported by attack helicopters and a few combat jets, overwhelmed the initial defenders. The plan was going swimmingly, reinforcements were loading up onto transport jets, and the VDV had its first actual military victory against a conventional foe since World War II. However, within 48 hours, the VDV would go from proudly displaying the might of Russia's airborne forces on hostile soil to being turned into roadkill. We're not kidding either. According to Georgian Legion commander Mamuka Mamulashvili, when he ran out of ammo he got into a car and pursued the fleeing Russian paratroopers running several over. The plan to take Kyiv in three days had failed, and the war would turn into a catastrophe for Russia, but what went wrong? We all know Russia underestimated Ukraine, but the level of underestimation goes past simple our intelligence was bad slash we didn't do any intelligence work all the way to pure arrogance. Without a preparatory bombardment on the Ukrainian air defense network before the invasion, the nation's air defense units were quickly back on the job. This immediately shut down the airspace around Kyiv to the Russian air forces, preventing them from supporting the airborne forces with close air support. And they needed that air support badly because they were up shit creek with no paddle. The initial defenders at Antonov and Hostomel airports were largely conscripts and easily overrun. However, within hours, Ukrainian special forces and regular mechanized infantry responded to the assault. This was never supposed to happen. Prior to the invasion, Russia had slipped multiple units of Spechnaz into Kyiv. Their mission was twofold, eliminate the Zelensky government and sow chaos amongst the defenders of the city. 
As the most elite of elite forces in the Russian military, the Spetsnaz were more than up for the task. Or so you would think, if like most Russians you'd been on a steady diet of copium since the end of the Cold War. Details here are incredibly scarce and likely will never be fully known until long after the end of the war. What is known, however, is that these units failed catastrophically at their job. There are multiple reports of mob justice against Russian special forces, and the details are too grim to post on YouTube. Suffice to say, Ukraine's own special forces and even civilians had a lot to say about the Spetsnaz plan. Over at Hostomel Airport, not only did Russia suffer the losses of multiple helicopters to ground fire, but once they managed to land, Ukrainian artillery devastated the airborne troopers. In a regular competent military, this would never happen, or would quickly be neutralized by overhead air support. However, not only did Russia not bother with a preparatory air campaign, but aside from the helicopters, its ability to provide air support to ground forces is limited, at least with any form of precision. Few Russian pilots are even trained for a ground support role, and just as few Russian planes have the required targeting pods for it. Lack of training is hardly surprising, considering that Russian pilots have been struggling to get 60 hours of flight time a year while U.S. pilots are getting an average of 120, and this is considered dangerously low for the Air Force. With air support shut out of the sky by Ukrainian air defenses and the plan to fly in reinforcements untenable, the paratroopers were forced to retreat and launch a new assault, with the aid of the forces pushing south out of Belarus. Unfortunately, the lack of logistics planning and a series of Ukrainian ambushes severely limited the capabilities of the ground force. Ultimately, the attack would fail and Kyiv stood. Military historian Frederick Kagan of the Institute for the Study of War would refer to the failure as stunning, after citing that he knows of no parallel to a major military power invading a country at a time of its own choosing and failing so utterly. The assault on Kyiv was a complete disaster, but a lack of logistics planning in the basic terrible state of the Russian military itself would lead to one of the most embarrassing moments in modern warfare. Ukrainian defenders bravely fought off Russia's attacks on Kyiv, and Putin responded by pouring even more forces and armored vehicles into the battle. However, now the Achilles heel of the Russian military would be put on full display. And we're gonna have to be way more specific because the Russian military has not one, but at least a dozen points of failure. Remember how we mentioned that Putin launched his invasion without consulting his logistics chiefs and how Russian troops had no idea they were about to invade Ukraine? Well, left to his own devices, Private Conscriptovich sold off as much fuel and food as possible to the Belarusian citizens, and without resupply worked out, the massive armored convoy heading to Kyiv just sorta of stalled out. The images were absolutely shocking. 40 miles of tanks, armored personnel carriers, mobile air defenses, and supply trucks all ground to a complete halt. It was reminiscent of the Iraqi mass exodus from Kuwait during the Gulf War, where thousands of vehicles attempted to flee the Allied assault. Only this convoy hadn't been brought to a stop by overwhelming air power, instead the Russian convoy had been brought to a standstill by good old-fashioned Russian incompetence, just like Uncle Stalin used to make. A lack of fuel meant diesel-hungry armored vehicles were forced to pull over to the side of the road, but the fuel trucks couldn't reach them because other armored vehicles were waiting for their turn to go. Having set up no staging or resupply areas, a few traffic snarls soon added up to the full-body paralysis of the entire affair. For Ukrainian infantry armed with Western anti-tank weapons, it was like shooting fish in a very, very tiny barrel. And because vehicles like tanks can't just turn their engines on and ride off into combat when the enemy shows up, they were forced to keep their engines idling for hours, resulting in even more vehicles running out of gas. If Ukraine had a fraction of the air power of even a modestly sized NATO power such as Spain, Russia would have faced catastrophic loss of combat power on the highway to Kyiv, reminiscent of the 2,000 or so vehicles Iraq lost on the highway of death in 1991. Instead, Ukraine used Turkish-made drones to exact painful losses on the stalled-out vehicles, which in itself is an absolutely absurd turn of events. Bayraktar drones are not stealthy, and while they might be low observable, they are easily detected at range by modern air defense radars. Despite this, we have multiple videos of Bayraktars taking out Russian air defense vehicles, and the reason why takes the absolute cake for stupidity. And that's a very tough competition given the fact that the Russian military is basically fueled by stupid. Modern short and medium range air defense systems were getting blown to bits by simple Bayraktar drones because their operators never turned on their air defense radars. Despite being stalled out and vulnerable to air attack, Russian air defense operators largely failed to defend from air attacks. 
But even more perplexing, the Russian Air Force itself did not provide air cover for the massively vulnerable convoy that was quickly becoming missile bait for Ukrainian drones. Multiple reasons why this happened have been proposed, ranging from a lack of fuel forcing the vehicles to shut down to simple incompetence from an overwhelmingly conscript force. However, recently it's been revealed that the biggest reason Russian air defense operators weren't defending the convoy from simple drone attacks is because they were jammed by the Russian military. Its electromagnetic warfare campaign to shut down Ukrainian air defenses, resulting in fratricidal jamming across many parts of both fronts, which meant that while Ukrainian air defenses were having trouble engaging Russian planes, the same was true for Russian air defenses. So, Ukraine switched to using simple and cheap drones to leisurely hunt for Russian vehicles and traded inexpensive dumb bombs for multi-million dollar assets. But the disaster was far from over. Because as the convoy was forced to slowly, painfully retreat, it was forced to leave many of its vehicles behind, and the world would finally get a good close-up look at one of the leading causes for the failure of the world's second most powerful army, tires. I don't know if you know this, tires are important. If you don't believe us, just try driving your car without them. But military tires are even more important, mostly because they're responsible for the mobility of vehicles worth up to tens of millions of dollars. To make sure that tires are up for the task of keeping heavy and often very armored vehicles running, manufacturers put them through a variety of tests, including x-ray imaging to detect defects. But these high-quality tires are expensive, and if you're a corrupt logistics officer in the Russian military, that's money that could be better spent on babushkas and vodka. As the convoy retreated, dozens upon dozens of vehicles were discovered to be pushed to the side of the road. These vehicles were completely undamaged and had tanks full of fuel, but the tires had burst. A quick investigation revealed that the Russian military was using cheap Chinese tires that were not rated for military vehicles, and in the muddy terrain the tires had failed. However, other vehicles showed signs of something even more shocking. They were equipped with tires over 30 years old, dating back to the USSR. But Russia wasn't using just cheap or ancient tires, they were failing at the most basic task of military maintenance. When kept in storage, vehicles are regularly started up and turned around. This prevents one side of the vehicle from being constantly exposed to the sun, and thus prevents tire rot. Evidence shows that Russian vehicles were thrown into motor pools and then just left there to bake in the sun for months, possibly even years on end. This tire controversy would have been deeply embarrassing for any professional military, but for Russia, it was just business as usual. You know your failed power when bad tires cause you to abandon a $10 million air defense vehicle in perfect working order. That's okay though, it obviously wasn't doing the Russians much good anyway, so better let the Ukrainians put it to good use. The absolute comedy of errors that was the Russian assault on Kyiv basically ended all credibility the Russian military had as the world's second most powerful army. At the heart of its failure was a logistics system that had been bad since the days of the Soviet Union though. Most of you are probably familiar with the humble wooden pallet. Pallets allow you to efficiently stack and transport goods, but the Russian military is not just at war with Ukraine, it's at war with efficiency. Thus, while the entire modern world is using pallets and forklifts to quickly move goods around, Russia relies on the ancient technique of loading a bunch of shit in your arms and moving it from place to place. But logistics problems don't just stop there for Russia, because since the days of the Soviet Union, Russia has relied on rail transportation to move supplies from place to place. On the one hand, railroads are incredibly efficient ways to move lots of goods quickly. On the other hand, railroads are notoriously inefficient at going places where no railroads actually exist. Compared to their western counterparts, the Soviets, and now the Russians, have less than half the logistics personnel and trucks of a similar sized unit. Thus, when planning an offensive into NATO territory, the Soviets relied on capturing western locomotives as their own locomotives couldn't operate on western gauge railroads. For any military geniuses in the audience, you probably already spotted a flaw in the plan. Everyone else who's not a military genius or a Soviet military planner has probably also spotted a flaw in that plan. NATO militaries being fully aware that Russian locomotives couldn't ride on western tracks would never allow their own locomotives to fall into Soviet hands. Soviet idiocy aside, modern Russians at least enjoyed the benefit of Ukraine still using Soviet-gauged railroad. However, the Ukrainians thought about that, which is why they blew up as much of their railroad as they could. The Russians, who apparently did not realize railroads weren't immune to explosions, were thus forced to use trucks to move supplies from safe bases in Belarus to Ukraine itself. Given that the Russian military lacks enough vehicles to fully resupply units, the further from safe logistics hubs Russian forces went during their travel toward Kyiv, the longer it took to deliver an already insufficient amount of supplies. The end result was a cascading state of fail that crippled any advance toward Kyiv. 
only made worse by the fact that Ukraine quickly changed its strategy from blowing up Russian armored vehicles to just blowing up Russian trucks. Soon, the Russians were forced to press civilian vans and trucks into service, though it wouldn't be enough to save them. But the Russian Navy would soon do its best to catch up to the incredible amount of failure exhibited by the Russian Army and Air Force. At first, things in the Black Sea were going pretty good for Russia, and then they weren't. The Moskva, flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, a Slava-class guided missile cruiser and one of the few parts of the Russian Navy considered a legitimate threat to NATO forces, until suddenly it wasn't. On the 13th of April, the Moskva was sailing south of Odessa when it spotted a Bayraktar drone with its air defense radar. As the ship responsible for fleet air defense, this was of little surprise. What was surprising was the two Neptune anti-ship missiles which slammed into the port side of the Moskva. Twelve hours later, the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet was now an artificial reef. Confusion reigns over the attack on the Moskva, with Ukraine and the United States both remaining tight-lipped. What is known is that the US provided intelligence directly leading to the attack on the Moskva. What is not known is how the attack succeeded in the first place. As a fleet air defense vessel, the Moskva's primary purpose was to prevent such an attack from occurring in the first place. The ship was equipped with a triple-layer air defense system that would have given it up to four minutes of warning for the incoming missiles. Claims that a Bayraktar drone had been used to distract the Moskva are invalid, as the ship should have been easily capable of tracking multiple airborne targets. Since the sinking, a maintenance report from the Moskva had surfaced online, indicating the ship was in dire need of repair. This report is unsubstantiated, though given what we've learned about the state of repair of Russian weapon systems, it's not impossible that the Moskva was simply in such bad shape it couldn't even defend itself. Russian conscripts also made up a significant part of the Moskva crew, and it's possible that poorly trained conscripts simply didn't know how to respond to the situation. Other, wilder theories claim that NATO special forces attached limpet mines to the hull of the ship, but given how shy NATO's been about giving assistance to Ukraine, this is unlikely in the extreme. The facts of the matter hint at a catastrophic flaw in Russian naval warships. Since the sinking of the Moskva, the entire Russian Black Sea fleet has not strayed far from safe harbor, in effect ceding the Black Sea to an enemy without a navy, as two Neptune anti-ship missiles should have never been able to cause catastrophic enough damage to sink a ship the size of the Moskva. It's strongly suspected that Russian ships suffer from a serious design flaw that makes them floating coffins. It would certainly explain why the Russian Navy's been demoted to lobbing long-range missiles from the safety of friendly waters. From the Black Sea, we now go to the east of Ukraine, because if you thought Russian stupidity had reached its zenith north of Kyiv, you severely underestimated Russian stupidity. In the east of the country, Russia fared much better against Ukraine thanks to the fact that most of the east is relatively flat rolling plains. This is perfect for Russia's vast fleet of armored vehicles, which was one of its biggest advantages over Ukraine. However, Russia would very quickly do its best to level the playing field by what can now only be described as industrial-grade, weaponized, concentrated, stupid. Rivers are the only real natural obstacles in the east of Ukraine, and for a military force, rivers are historically a difficult challenge. We're not here to trash Russia for having difficulty crossing a river. Moving large amounts of armored vehicles and troops over deep water is a dicey proposition in the best of times, let alone when someone else is trying to kill you. But Russia came up with a novel way of crossing the Donetsk River. Instead of using traditional pontoons, it apparently attempted to fill the river with armored vehicles so the rest of its army could just drive over the top of them. At least that's the best explanation we have as to what occurred outside of Bilohorivka. After spotting a Russian bridging effort, Ukrainian forces allowed armored vehicles to cross before pounding it with artillery. The crossing was then repeated, right next to the original crossing, which had been sighted in by the Ukrainian artillery. To no one's surprise, this crossing, too, was also pounded to oblivion. At this point, Russian forces retreated to rethink their plan to cross the Donets. Just kidding, they tried at least two more times in adjacent locations. The attempt to cross the Donets River resulted in the estimated loss of two battalion tactical groups and remains the deadliest engagement of the war for Russian forces. Even pro-Russian military bloggers would lash out at the Russian Ministry of Defense, with some calling it outright sabotage. Even internet tough guy and pro-Russian mill blogger Yuri Podolyaka commented that the disaster was due to the quote, stupidity of the Russian command. However, the Russian aerospace forces will not tolerate any competition for the title of dumbest branch of the Russian military. Russian military doctrine states that rotary aviation needs to be able to respond to requests for fire support within 15 minutes. This necessarily means that helicopters must be stationed closer to the front line than fixed-wing aircraft. However, this very quickly breaks down into aggressive levels of stupidity, 
and nowhere was this on fuller display than in Chornobyevka. In total, Ukraine shelled the airfield at Chornobyevka an estimated 30 times, destroying and damaging dozens of Russian helicopters. After every single attack, the Russian military simply brought the helicopters back. The Russian attempt to defeat Ukrainian artillery shells with helicopters met with little success, and Ukrainian artillery won the day. It was in effect the most insane game of whack-a-mole, only the mole absolutely refused to go back down into the hole. But this was far from the Russian Aerospace Force's greatest follies of the war. As Russia gradually realized that Ukraine wasn't capitulating and, oh crap, it's actually fighting back pretty effectively, it started throwing planes at the problem and those planes were getting shot down, so Russia swapped to night operations and low-flying. This was effective in preventing both Ukrainian air defense batteries from engaging them and Ukrainian soldiers armed with man pads from spotting incoming attack jets. However, if you're going to be running night operations, then you should probably have aircraft capable of doing so and pilots trained in them. You can already guess what's coming next. Russia did not, in fact, have an air fleet capable of night operations. Only a small portion of its attack jets could carry out night attacks, and significantly lacking in precision weapons, all its night campaign ended up doing is creating very large and expensive holes in Ukrainian fields. In about a week, Russia was back to daytime operations, but this time from far behind friendly lines so as to not risk getting blown out of the sky by Ukrainian defenses. This has forced Russia to use up almost all of its entire stock of long-range attack weapons, including hypersonic weapons, which in the words of one Western analyst is, quote, insanely disproportionate value for the cost, especially when you consider most of these attacks were against civilian infrastructure and had no military value. The mystery of the missing Russian Air Force is, however, probably best solved by the simple fact that Russia is incompetent and can't de-conflict its own airspace. Numerous very high-profile incidents of friendly fire resulted in Russian air defense units shooting down their own jets. In the initial stages of the invasion, this was especially problematic, with the Russian ground forces doing more to defeat the Russian air forces than Ukraine. Since then, the situation hasn't greatly improved, forcing Russia to use its air forces very sparingly and very carefully so as to avoid having them blown up by their own assets. This is what happens when you don't train your military properly, and when the exercises you do put on are highly scripted. For context, during Desert Storm, Allied forces had approximately 4,000 aircraft operating in Iraqi airspace and suffered only a handful of blue-on-blue -blue incidents. Russia, meanwhile, is operating an estimated 350 aircraft across the airspace, twice the size of Iraq. To say Russia is utterly incompetent would be to call the ocean wet. Another one of Russia's biggest fails during its campaign in Ukraine is its inability to contend with modern weapon systems. When HIMARS arrived on the scene, it had an outsized impact on the Russian military. Despite Ukraine having barely a dozen of the weapon system, HIMARS single-handedly changed the course of the war by destroying Russian command and control nodes and supply depots close to the front lines. Historically, Russia's waged wars against vastly inferior powers, so it can hardly be blamed for being surprised by the use of precision weapons. Except Russia has long droned on and on and on about how it was more than a match for NATO, which means it should have been ready for NATO weapons in Ukrainian hands. It was not. Instead, the entire Russian military was put on its back foot by a tiny amount of NATO weapons. The precision HIMARS strikes forced Russia to retire many senior officers prematurely by burying them in graves. It also forced them to move their supply depots even further back from the front lines. Remember earlier how we talked about the terrible Russian logistics and their lack of trucks? Well, the same problem that appeared north of Kyiv once more reared its ugly head as the pace of Russian resupply was slowed to a crawl. This effectively stopped the Russian offensive in the east of the country and allowed Ukraine to begin to use its new NATO toys to shape the battlefield for a stunningly successful offensive to come. We're not going to talk too much about the offensive except to say this. Russia's first guards tank army, the very force which was meant to take on and defeat NATO's best defenses, got wrecked by a patchwork Ukrainian force equipped with Cold War era tanks. This was the nail in the coffin for any pro-Russian bots claiming that Russia's setbacks were due to the fact that it was not committing its best forces and holding them in reserve until Ukraine exhausted itself. By the culmination of the Ukrainian offensive, Russia should have been accustomed to the use of precision weapons. Apparently, though, Russia learned nothing because on New Year's Eve, one of the most explosive moments of the war, pun intended, rocked the entire nation of Russia. Shortly after midnight, HIMARS rockets rained down on a vocational school in Russian-controlled Makivka in the Donetsk region. The school had been used as a temporary barracks for over 500 fresh Russian conscripts. As if that wasn't bad enough, some genius Russian officer also decided to use the same building to house ammunition because Russia really is its own worst enemy. 
The soldiers had been warned about using their cell phones, but naturally ignored their order and had been sending text messages and phone calls home to wish Happy New Year's to families and loved ones. Ukraine triangulated the electronic activity and sent its own warm wishes to the tune of an estimated 400 dead. Though to be fair, this number would have been far lower if Russian leadership hadn't decided to stuff the basement full of high explosive ammunition. This would be a sign of things to come in the new year. As the temperature plummeted, it soon became clear Russia had not prepared for a winter campaign. Its feared winter offensive never materialized, and its troops were documented begging on social media for basic supplies. The Russian mechanized forces became thinner and thinner on the ground and eventually disappeared altogether, leading to foot assaults against Ukrainian trenches in the style of World War I, with similar results. The lack of Russian armored vehicles is best explained by disasters such as the infamous Battle of Volodar. In Chornobyvka, the Russian military attempted to defeat Ukrainian artillery shells with parked helicopters. In Volodar, it was now time to defeat Ukrainian anti-tank missiles and mines with tanks. With the town heavily fortified and surrounded by minefields, the Russians were quick to discover several lanes clear of mines. To their credit, the Russians realized this was a trap and attempted to use engineers to clear their own lanes through the minefields. However, Ukrainian artillery quickly put a stop to that. Naturally, Russia simply yelled YOLO and poured its tanks and infantry into the very obviously trapped lanes free of mines. To no one's surprise, not even the Russians, their advances into Volodar ran straight into Ukrainian ambushes. To the surprise of no one again, especially the Russians, after several crushing defeats, the Russians simply tried it again, and again, and again, and again, and one more time after that, and then a few more times after that one. We don't know how many losses Ukraine suffered, but we do know that Russia lost around 120 armored vehicles in what's become known as the biggest tank battle of the war. Except Russia was facing very few Ukrainian tanks, and mostly just running into minefields, anti-tank infantry, and pre-sighted artillery. Finally, after completely exhausting their available armor, Russia retreated from Volodar. The Russian commander in charge of the battle would be promoted for his glorious contribution to the motherland, because in Russia you don't fix stupid, you aggressively reinforce it. Russian forces are suffering their biggest defeats of the Ukraine war, and with victories in the east and Kyiv secured against Russian attack, Ukraine is once more pushing for fast-tracked membership into the NATO alliance. It doesn't stand alone either, as currently Poland, Romania, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Montenegro, and North Macedonia all back Ukraine's joining of the world's most powerful military and political alliance. But can Ukraine really join NATO, and what would happen if it does? Currently, Ukraine is still a significant way to go to join NATO. Under the Washington Treaty, any European country can join NATO as long as it expresses a desire to contribute to the security of the Euro-Atlantic area. However, it must also abide by certain military, political, and economic standards before it may join. The first of these prerequisites is the country must have a functioning democratic political system, which is based on a free market economy. This is a challenge for Ukraine as its elections have been rife with manipulation for years, as it struggles to throw off the yoke of Russian interference. Corruption is also a significant problem in the country, both due to incompetence, its status as maintaining a democracy, and the fact that a lot of the older generation still sympathizes with Russia. Before Ukraine could join NATO, it would have to tackle the problem of corruption and show the West that it's capable of holding open and fair elections, something it has made significant but not perfect progress on in the last eight years since the ouster of the former president in 2014. NATO aspirants must also show fair treatments to both racial and religious minorities. Here, Ukraine has made significant progress, though at the start of the war there were alarming reports of black students and other minorities not being allowed to board evacuation trains and buses ahead of whites fleeing the conflict. To join NATO, Ukraine would have to show that it's enacted significant legal protections for minorities and worked to mend this type of behavior. A third standard Ukraine must meet is a commitment to the peaceful resolution of conflicts. Ukraine easily qualifies here, as it did not seek out conflict with Russia. In fact, President Zelensky continued to press for a diplomatic solution even after the war started and did not initiate mass mobilization until the invasion began. Next, a NATO aspirant must be willing and capable of making a military contribution to NATO operations. In the past, this might have been in doubt given Ukraine's former Soviet-style military, but Ukraine has shown that it has learned significantly from American instructors in the eight years since Russia annexed Crimea. Now, Ukraine fields the best army inside of Ukraine and is handily defeating the Russian forces despite their overwhelming number superiority. The question of Ukraine's military value to NATO is now without question. Lastly, those who want to join NATO must be committed to a civilian-led government, where the military is subservient to civilian leadership. 
This rules out any military dictatorships, but as Ukraine builds the foundation of a strong future democracy, it's well on its way to meeting this criteria. But what if NATO were to hold a vote and Ukraine was unanimously voted into the alliance, despite its current problems? What would happen? First, there's a serious concern that Ukraine's war would by necessity become NATO's war. Article 5 of the alliance is the guarantor of European security and states that an attack on one member is an attack on all. This is what has kept Russian aggression at bay since the end of the Cold War, when Vladimir Putin hungrily eyed the breakaway Baltic states, who used to be Soviet republics. While individually the Baltic states could not face the Russian army, attacking them would mean attacking the entirety of the NATO alliance, which Russia wouldn't be able to face. There is room to question whether the ongoing war is a real concern for triggering Article 5, though. NATO has never before accepted a member in the midst of a conflict, and technically speaking, Russia is not attacking Ukraine so much as it's already attacked the nation. There might be room for the alliance here to justify that the ongoing war does not meet the requirements for an Article 5 resolution, and thus Ukraine joining wouldn't put Europe into war against Russia. But if Article 5 were to not be invoked, it runs the risk of fundamentally weakening the alliance. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization is built upon the principle that every member of the alliance will immediately respond to even the most insignificant of aggression against the other member. If this is compromised, it tests the integrity of the alliance and would be of serious concern of those NATO members who sit right on Russia's doorstep. Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia could all be swallowed up relatively fast by a Russian offensive, while mustering the forces to repel Russian troops would take some time and come at great expense. If the Baltic states question the integrity of Article 5, it might splinter the alliance in the future and achieve Putin's aims of dismantling the single obstacle to his plans of former Soviet glory. If Ukraine were to join NATO, it's likely the alliance wouldn't immediately declare war on Russia. Instead, it would provide arms, equipment, and supplies, and intelligence to Ukraine, albeit on a much larger scale. In fact, this is probably what President Zelensky is hoping for. Putting NATO into an official proxy war state against Russia would make a big difference to the amount of support he receives for the ongoing conflict. But this might be largely unnecessary as Ukraine already receives a great deal of support from the alliance. Its conscripts are already being shipped out of the country, where they can train in the West in peace and safety, receiving expert training from NATO's most seasoned troops. Before returning home to fight, they are being equipped with the latest in NATO personal gear, putting the individual Ukrainian soldier in a far better position than his Russian counterpart. Ukraine joining NATO in the midst of a conflict does achieve one thing, justifying a rapid escalation by Vladimir Putin. In fact, Ukraine joining NATO would be a massive propaganda win for Putin as it would justify his invasion. Back when the war started, Putin sold his invasion to the Russian people as necessary to take down a Nazi regime, headed by a Jew, and to keep NATO from expanding yet again onto the Russian border. A Ukrainian membership into NATO would only show that he was right. Well, only about the NATO thing, not the ridiculous Nazi thing. As he spent decades whipping the Russian people up into an anti-NATO frenzy, Putin could sell this event as a critical threat to the integrity of Russia itself, garnering the public support he desperately needs for a full-fledged mobilization of the nation. Already, NATO is the boogeyman in most Russian minds. They're to blame for everything that goes wrong in their lives. Poor economic performance? NATO is manipulating the global economy against Russia. Poor Russian military performance? NATO is secretly fighting alongside Ukrainians. Drop your toast butter side down onto the ground? NATO. But suppose that Ukraine joined NATO and the alliance agreed to invoke Article 5. What would happen then? Firstly, NATO air forces would begin an immediate and extensive air campaign against Russian forces inside Ukraine. In response to Russian threats to use tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine, American Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin had a private conversation with Russian Minister of Defense Sergei Shoigu. Though the details of the conversation remain classified, it's widely believed that Austin warned Shoigu that the United States, along with NATO allies, would respond to a Russian nuclear attack with overwhelming air power attacks against Russian positions inside Ukraine. This should be enough to send a shiver down the spine of any Minister of Defense, as NATO air power is extremely formidable. Back in Desert Storm, NATO's air campaign handily dismantled one of the best air defense networks in the world and then laid waste to Iraq's logistics, communications, and supply networks. When the ground offensive started, NATO warplanes brought some of the worst destruction to a country since the Second World War. What should worry Russia the most is that Iraq's air defenses were modeled on Soviet defenses, and Russia has not changed the doctrine very much since then. A NATO air campaign would first focus on eliminating Russia's ability to threaten the airspace inside Ukraine. Air and missile attacks would target air defense radars and installations along the Russian border. 
while the Black Sea is swept clear of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. As evidenced in Ukraine, American HARM, high-speed anti-radiation missiles, are extremely adept at destroying air defense radars. Russia's only protection would be to keep NATO air forces at bay with its own fighters, an extremely dubious proposition given that American air-to-air -air missiles have greater range than their Russian counterparts, its planes have better radars, and the spearhead of the attack would almost certainly be stealthy F-35s and F-22s anyway. This leaves Russia with only one other option, using its S-300 and S-400 air defense units, but these require their radars to be turned on, which makes them a prime target for wild weasel attacks using harm missiles. The only thing slowing down the air campaign would be that Russia has initial numerical superiority given that the fighting is taking place on its own doorstep, and it would take time for NATO planes to move to airfields near the action and for logistics networks to be set up. However, the Russian Air Force has been conspicuously absent from the fighting in northeastern Ukraine, a massive red flag that warns something might be fundamentally wrong with the state of Russia's aerospace forces. If Russia can't project air power right across its own border, there's certainly no hope it can protect itself from a concentrated NATO air campaign. Once Russia's ability to threaten Ukraine's airspace is dealt with, a massive bombing campaign would begin against any Russian forces that have not surrendered or retreated yet. Already, the United States has positioned B-52 bombers in England for just such a possibility. The difference between NATO bombing campaigns and Russian ones, though, is that NATO uses almost exclusively smart weapons, giving them lethal precision. With nothing but short-range air defenses available to them, Russian ground forces would be decimated by an overwhelming air campaign and inevitably forced to retreat. The use of NATO air power alone would likely be enough to secure victory in Ukraine with no need to commit ground forces other than the Ukrainian military already present. Russia has proven itself to be an ineffective, corrupt, and incompetent fighting force marred by corruption that has hollowed it out from within. But this might actually make Russia more dangerous. As it always does, the use of NATO forces inside Ukraine inevitably runs into one single conclusion. Russia must use nuclear weapons if it hopes to avert a catastrophic defeat. Unless Vladimir Putin is willing to admit that he was wrong and allow himself to become a pariah to be reviled in Russian history for centuries to come, his only recourse for stopping a NATO offensive would be to use nuclear weapons. He has already set the stage for their use by annexing Ukrainian territories. Now under the guise of defending sovereign Russian territory, Putin has given himself the excuse to use nuclear weapons. Where the conflict goes from there is anyone's guess. But what's sure is that NATO's commitment to the war would only increase, not decrease. If this means more conventional military force or even nuclear, biological, or chemical attacks, however, is anyone's guess. And this is why, ultimately, many agree that the question of Ukraine's NATO membership needs to be deferred until after the war is over. Ukraine already enjoys many of the benefits of the alliance, especially as it proves it can fight and win against superior Russian forces. Now is the time for NATO to defeat Russia by simply giving Ukraine the tools it needs to do so on its own. And this means heavy and modern equipment such as the Leopard tanks and F-15 Fighting Eagles, not more Cold War hand-me-downs. With the fight in Ukraine turning against it, in May Russia deployed a brand new superweapon dubbed the Terminator. This armored monster promised to make Swiss cheese out of Ukrainian defenders when it joined the fighting near Severodonetsk. But did Ukraine turn out to be the Sarah Connor to Russia's Terminator? It's a weapon born from a very painful lesson in Russia's two wars in Chechnya. Caught in dense urban combat, Russian armored troops were famously savaged by Chechen fighters, who rained down rocket-propelled grenades from above onto the thin top armor of Russian tanks. Superior knowledge of the city and access to the upper floors of buildings around the battlefield allowed Chechen hunter-killer squads to quickly decimate columns of armored vehicles before melting away, all without receiving so much as a single round from a Russian tank in return. But like most tanks, Russian tanks have a very limited ability to swing their main cannon upward. But this vulnerability is also shared by Russia's BMP infantry fighting vehicles. Deployed to support tank offensives in dense urban jungles, this means that Russian vehicles can do nothing to defend themselves from attack in the upper stories of nearby buildings. While a machine gunner in the turret of a tank may provide some protection, they're really only turning themselves into sniper bait. The United States faced a similar problem during the initial offensive against Iraq's military in the second invasion of the nation. One key difference, though, meant that while Russian tanks were turned to scrap metal at a truly terrifying rate, American tanks suffered only extremely nominal losses. That difference was doctrine. U.S. and Western countries long ago learned that armor was extremely vulnerable to enemy ambush via tank hunter-killer teams armed with anti-tank missiles and rocket-propelled grenades. 
The mighty behemoths had a huge chink in their armor, and the solution was infantry. Today, Western militaries heavily support their tanks with dismounted infantry, who are tasked with clearing buildings and responding to threats from above. Russia, however, kept its infantry inside the perceived safety of their armored vehicles, with very predictable results. Over a decade later, the war in Ukraine has proven that Russia has learned very little, but they have at least fielded a terrifying new weapon dubbed the Terminator to try to mitigate this glaring weakness. While the West learned to deploy infantry alongside tanks, Russia's answer was more tanks, because there isn't a problem in the world Russia doesn't believe it can't solve with the judicious application of lots of either artillery or tanks, ideally both. Stubborn enemy defenses, artillery and tanks. Enemy counterattack? Artillery and tanks. Clogged toilet in your dorm? Tanks and artillery. The Terminator was specifically designed to deal with threats in urban environments and features a number of design choices that, to be honest, make a lot of sense on paper. Knowing that the biggest threats to tanks in urban combat comes from above, the Terminator features dual 30mm cannons. Though these two can vary with a very specific feature, the turret can angle upward to very high degrees as much as positive 45. This allows the Terminator to blast enemy infantry launching attacks from up above. To be completely fair, 30mm cannon rounds will turn even the sturdiest wall into dust, meaning the Terminator has much greater suppression and killing power compared to dismounted infantry wielding 7.62mm assault rifles or machine guns. If a Chechen soldier tried hiding behind a window to pop out and launch an attack, the Terminator could quickly turn them into fine mist. But in Chechnya, enemy fighters also ambushed Russian tanks from below, striking from basements and tossing explosives to detonate under the hull of the tank as it rolled over them. Other fighters would simply rush to within spitting distance of a tank and toss molotovs. The burning fuel used in the cocktail could make the heat inside of an armored vehicle skyrocket to seriously dangerous levels, forcing the crew to open the hatches or abandon the vehicle entirely. Once more, Russian tanks could do little to defend themselves in such close quarters, as even their machine guns could not depress enough to engage close quarters targets. That's why the Terminator features a turret that can depress to negative 5 degrees, blasting targets right in front of it if need be. The Terminator can also be equipped with additional support weapons on either side of its double cannon turret. One configuration seen includes the addition of four anti-tank missiles, though these could be swapped out for general high-explosive missiles to allow a Terminator to level things such as bunkers or multiple floors of a building where hostiles, or since this is Russia, civilians are hiding. The US often deploys a similar weapon for dismounted infantry in the form of the Carl Gustav recoilless rifle, which can be used with a variety of ammunition types. After battling insurgents and Taliban fighters in dense urban combat, the US Army greatly increased the availability of the high explosive variation of round, allowing infantry to destroy buildings housing enemy fighters without waiting for air or artillery support. The weapon proved incredibly effective, and thus it's no surprise to see Russia adopting a similar weapon for its Terminator vehicles. The anti-tank missiles carried by the Terminator are similar in reach and power to US tow anti-tank missiles fielded on the Bradley but the Terminator carries twice as many missiles as the Bradley, and both vehicles can be armed with 30mm cannons, but the Terminator has twice as many of those as a US Bradley. A showdown between a Bradley and a Terminator would end very badly for the Americans. This additional punch allows the Terminator to directly support armor in an anti-tank role, giving the Terminator pretty impressive flexibility. Guided by lasers though, the Ataka missiles can theoretically be used against aircraft as well albeit only slow-flying ones such as heavy transport choppers. The twin 30mm cannons are formidable weapons in their own right. They can be equipped with a variety of ammunition types, including armor-piercing discarding Sabo to deal with armored vehicles, high-explosive fragmentation, high-explosive tracer, and armor-piercing tracer. The various rounds give a Terminator a range of 2,500 to 4,000 meters, but the most unique feature is that the Terminator was designed to be equipped with one type of round in one cannon and another in a second. This way, the Terminator could easily take on both enemy infantry and vehicles simultaneously without needing to exit the vehicle for a dangerous reload after its 850 bullets run out. Initially, the Terminator was also designed to feature the ability for the gunner to designate different targets for each cannon, though that proved to be an absolute mess logistically and very confusing for a gunner to manage. The capability was scrapped and the Terminator now has fixed cannons for ease. With advancements in artificial intelligence though, this capability may eventually be restored. The Abrams X demonstrator from the US showed an AI that was actually able to automatically designate 
though not fire on targets. Backing up the main cannons is a 7.62mm machine gun with 2,000 rounds as well as twin grenade launchers. The Terminator can carry a truly frightening number of grenades, up to 630mm grenades in total. Its automatic grenade launchers can spit out high explosive rounds at a rate of 420 to 480 rounds a minute depending on the type of launcher installed, with each grenade having a kill radius of 7 meters and a range of 1700 meters. To detect and engage targets, the Terminator features modern all-weather sights. With the inclusion of thermal vision, the commander and gunner both have their own separate sights, though the gunner can make use of the commander's sight if his becomes damaged or destroyed. The computerized fire control system uses a laser rangefinder, like in a modern tank, to provide accurate fire and automatic stabilization even while moving at high speeds, which is useful because the Terminator is pretty speedy with a top speed of 37 miles per hour, and it can dive as deep as 1.2 meters or 1.8 meters with the use of a snorkel. For protection, the crew enjoy the protection afforded by the armored chassis of a BMP fighting vehicle which is what the entire design is based on. This provides the crew with protection from most small arms fire and limited protection from RPGs and other light explosive weapons. Like most armored vehicles, the Terminator also features twin smoke grenade launchers, which can create dense smoke to protect from visual and thermal observation, allowing the Terminator to use the smoke screen to flee or reposition. On paper, the Terminator is a formidable machine that should excel at the urban combat it was designed for. So, why have they failed to turn the tide of war for Russia? When news broke that the Terminator was being deployed in May 2022, Russian military bloggers hailed the defeat of the Ukrainian armed forces. Nothing could stand against this revolutionary weapon of war, the likeness of which did not even exist in any Western military. But it turns out that plenty of things could stand against the Terminator, including the same infantry it was supposed to crush under its armored treads. The biggest problem with the Terminator becomes immediately obvious upon simple inspection. While the hull of the vehicle is armored to protect the crew, very little thought was given to protection of the vehicle's actual weapon systems. Unlike a Bradley fighting vehicle, the turret of the Terminator is very lightly armored, with the only real protection being given to the missiles, which feature armor to protect from splinters and shrapnel. This leaves the Terminator's weapons extremely vulnerable to concentrated small arms fire, let alone return fire from a similar caliber weapon in the 30mm range or explosives. The next problem with the Terminator is that Russia doesn't quite know how to use them yet. There really is no equal amongst Western militaries, but that's because the West uses dismounted infantry to protect its armor in urban combat. Currently, Russian doctrine states that while fighting in urban combat, each tank is protected by two Terminators, while in open terrain, each Terminator is protected by two tanks. This sounds like good doctrine, but there is one huge, glaring problem – situational awareness. The Terminator might feature modern and very capable sights, but at the end of the day, it has the exact same situational awareness as any other armored vehicle. Dismounted infantry, meanwhile, can see and hear targets easier, and thus can respond to them much faster. The trade-off in protection versus awareness is one that the West has agreed is well worth it, and the combat record of nations like the US prove it works when your infantry is well trained. Sticking that same infantry inside an armored vehicle immediately lowers their ability to perceive enemy targets, often until it's too late. While the Terminator may offer impressive flexible firepower for urban battles, at the end of the day it's simply too unresponsive to effectively deal with enemy infantry. That's probably why the Russian army hasn't bought the vehicle in large numbers, and it's believed only a single active unit of Terminators exists today, or rather, used to exist, as Western intelligence believes that most of this unit deployed to fight in and around Severodonetsk was either destroyed or suffered catastrophic damage. Despite triumphant calls from Russian military bloggers when the Terminator was announced to be joining the fight in eastern Ukraine, it seems as if Ukraine Sarah Connor this faulty Terminator and given its very poor performance, we're very confident it'll in fact not be back anytime soon. At a meeting of the G7, US President Joe Biden announced that he would greenlight any effort by allies to send F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. This was a significant step forward in Ukraine's bid to get its hand on Western military aircraft, and one Russia is so afraid of, it immediately launched a new fear offensive on Western media. The move is reminiscent of Germany laying the groundwork down for the transfer of Leopard battle tanks to Ukraine, although significantly more transparent, given that Germany seemed incredibly reluctant to allow anyone to send the tanks to Ukraine. However, it's important, because much like Germany and the Leopard tank, the US controls the export license for the F-16. Arms sales typically come with conditions that a receiving party will not attempt to export purchased weapons to a third party without the permission of the supplier. 
This is to prevent proliferation of very advanced weapon systems into conflicts that their manufacturers don't want them to play a part in. In the US's case, it's blocked previous attempts to transfer advanced weapons to various sides in conflicts, fearing it would either make the US look bad or be destabilizing. The green light, though, means that now anybody who owns an F-16 has official U.S. approval to ship them to Ukraine without asking for permission. But at least so far, the U.S. won't be supplying any of its own, and with good reason. With war in the Pacific against China brewing, the U.S. is unlikely to want to risk depleting its stockpile of modern fighter aircraft, especially when said war will almost entirely be a sea and air battle for U.S. forces and is predicted to be a very high attrition conflict. We've seen similar excuses from European powers as they transfer paltry numbers of tanks to Ukraine, only they aren't facing the realistic threat of a war in their neighborhood. Everybody from Germany to Portugal has claimed that they can only send small numbers of tanks because of their own defense needs. As we've pointed out previously, unless the Russians develop teleportation technology, there's no chance a T-72 is going to wind up in Puerto del Sol in Madrid. The ground war Europe thinks it needs its tanks for is already being waged in Ukraine, and Russia's material stockpiles are so low that the best weapon it has to invade the rest of Europe with is harsh words. So who's going to be handing over F-16s to Ukraine, and why the sudden reversal when just months ago President Biden said he wouldn't even consider it? Perhaps unsurprisingly, the Baltic states have long been supportive of giving Ukraine access to advanced Western jets. Given that they're on the front line of any escalation with Russia, it's hardly surprising that they have a keen interest in seeing as many Russian forces defeated on the battlefield as possible. Even less surprisingly, Poland has been eagerly advocating for the transfer of F-16s and has 48 of its own that might be up for grabs, although this is unlikely until the nation receives a replacement such as the F-35. Unlike Spain, Germany, or France, Poland has a real reason to fear a war with Russia, given that it borders both the Russian militarized enclave of Kaliningrad and a Russian puppet state, Belarus. Even then, given the vigorous support Poland has provided for Ukraine to date, we wouldn't be surprised if the entire Polish Air Force suddenly defected and joined the Ukrainian Air Force. France has also been supportive of the effort to transfer jets to Ukraine, though it has no F-16s of its own. Instead, France operates the Rafale fighter and the Dassault Mirages. It could likely afford to donate a few airframes to Ukraine, but this would be counterproductive. The donation of the Challenger 2 battle tank to Ukraine was largely a symbolic act meant to break the German deadlock and constant moving of the goalposts about the Leopard tank. The few tanks it did send may not even see combat duty simply because of the difficulty in fulfilling the logistical needs of how two different foreign fleets of tanks on top of its own but tanks aren't nearly as difficult to maintain as fighter aircraft, which need on average about two hours of maintenance for every hour of flight. Thus, France has offered instead to help train Ukrainian pilots on F-16s, either by donating some of its pilots experienced with the plane or helping cover the costs of training. Britain likewise has offered to help with the logistics and cost of training rather than donate any actual aircraft itself. Britain doesn't operate the F-16 and had previously stated that it would take too long to train pilots on the Eurofighters that it does operate. Arguably, if the effort had started last summer, when it became clear Ukraine would not fold to Russian forces, fears of the Eurofighter arriving too late would be unfounded. German Defense Minister Boris Pistorius stated that Germany supports the effort but doesn't have the training capacity or equipment to aid Ukraine with its bid to get F-16s or any other platform. This is sadly true, with the German Air Force being in a state of criminal disrepair and unable to meet NATO air operations commitments. Greece has a significant F-16 fleet of 150 planes, with 83 currently being upgraded to the latest Block 72 standard. These would be perfect for Ukraine, except for one small problem, Turkey. For years, under Erdogan's leadership, Turkey has been a thorn in NATO's side. And the NATO ally has threatened open hostilities with its neighbor and fellow NATO member Greece. This is not only putting the entire alliance in a weird spot, but it means Greece is not going to be willing to give up its F-16s unless someone like the US can make security guarantees in case of Turkish aggression. With a new presidential election in Turkey though, there is hope that the relationship can be reset. Belgium, Denmark, and Norway are all willing to send their own F-16s to Ukraine, which puts up a possible 125 split between the three of them. However, all three countries are unlikely to provide all of their jets, so a more conservative estimate of about 20 airframes is likely. However, as F-35s arrive in Europe, it'll open up more F-16s for transfer. The Netherlands have 24 F-16s, all slated to be replaced by F-35s by mid-2024. While we all hope the war won't last that long, 
the odds are against a victory anytime soon. In a bit of good news though, the Netherlands did cancel a sale of two dozen F-16s to Draken International and that can only mean one thing, Ukraine is getting Dutch F-16s. And that's why the US has stated it wishes to create an effort for the long-term supply of Ukraine's Air Force, signaling that this will not be a one-time donation but rather a long-term effort to bring Ukraine's air force up to Western standards. The US isn't just looking at keeping Ukraine's embattled air force in the fight for longer, it's actively planning for the shape of the Ukrainian military in a post-war world. With confirmation by NATO that Ukraine will join the alliance, the Ukrainian military will need to be rapidly westernized and brought into conformity with NATO's militaries. Its position right on the Russian border makes this a critical objective, ensuring Ukraine is able to field a strong and credible enough post-war deterrent that will mean Russia simply doesn't lick its wounds and reinvade a year later. If Ukraine were to remain weak in the post-war peace and be allowed to enter NATO, then it would open up the opportunity for Russia to launch the fait accompli attack against Ukraine. This was much feared in the lead-up to the Ukrainian war, although NATO planners feared it would happen in the Baltics, with Russia surging forces across the border of a Baltic nation to take a few villages and then simply dig in. In essence, Russia would be daring NATO to risk full-scale war over a few meaningless kilometers of the most vulnerable members, and if NATO did not respond, it would threaten breaking the alliance in two or at least significantly undermining it. This is why it's important for the US that Ukraine be supplied with increasing amounts of Western equipment and its military brought up to NATO standards, not just in training, but in kit as well. A strong post-war Ukraine is the best way to guarantee peace with Russia. Estimates on the number of F-16s Ukraine could be getting in the next few months vary, with a dozen to two dozen or even as many as 50. However, there are some significant hurdles to overcome as equipping Ukraine with new fighter jets isn't as simple as just handing the keys over to the shiny new jets. First, pilots must be trained. Every fighter plane is different, but with some of the most experienced combat pilots in the world right now, Ukraine is well suited to put its air force through an F-16 crash course. Right now, the US is already evaluating a small group of Ukrainian aviators just to see how fast they might be able to bring them up to speed on the F-16. Rumors are, training on a small scale has already been ongoing for months. As with most things in this war, the US is keeping pretty tight-lipped to deny Russia any vital intelligence. Assuming an accelerated course, though, it'll take a few months for Ukrainian pilots to get the hang of their F-16s, meaning they might not see combat until this fall. Then there's the problem with the types of F-16s Ukraine might get. Not every F-16 is built the same. One of the world's most prolific fighter jets, the F-16 has received a series of block upgrades over the years to keep it competitive in a modern combat environment. However, not every nation has kept up with these block upgrades, and that could be problematic for Ukraine's pilots. Software incompatibility issues will also make it difficult for F-16s of different blocks to work together, and could pose a challenge to equipping F-16s with some of the more advanced and newer US weapons. Currently, a task force is looking into compatibility issues and what is the most efficient and best way to handle the issue, whether that's a crash modernization program or making sure that entire squadrons are equipped with the same Block F-16 to avoid conflict. On the ground, logistics need to be sorted as well. Ukraine has to be supplied with a number of replacement parts and its mechanics also need to be put through training to keep the F-16s in fighting shape. As we mentioned earlier, combat jets are incredibly complicated machines, though the F-16 is specifically designed to require little maintenance and work from a very austere environment. Originally, the F-16 was designed to be a cheap, easily mass-produced frontline fighter that could fly from damaged air bases in a worst-case Cold War scenario and then fight against the Soviet Union. It's not the best fighter in the world, but it is a very good one, and it's rugged to boot, making it possibly the best choice for Ukraine right now. But if the West wants to arm Ukraine quickly, they shouldn't be turning to European powers to donate their F-16s, because the largest F-16 fleets in the world aren't in Europe, they're in the Middle East. After the United States, Israel, Turkey, and Egypt respectively operate the second, third, and fourth largest F-16 fleets in the world. Israel has an estimated 175 F-16s and an additional 50 for training, and is no doubt currently feeling significant pressure to start thinking about donating some of them. Given its regional headaches, though, this is incredibly unlikely unless the US is ready to make some significant security guarantees. This will inevitably put it into conflict with Iran. Not anything new, but adding another potential headache that the US can currently ill afford. In the 2010s, Israel had a deal to sell Croatia 12 of its F-16s for $500 million. However, the US blocked the deal as Israel had done significant equipment upgrades to the combat jets and the US feared that those sensitive components would fall into the wrong hands, despite Croatia being a NATO member. 
Given that any donated F-16s have a very high chance of being shot down and their wreckage captured by Russia, the US would likely demand that the equipment upgrades are stripped off the jets before they're transferred to Ukraine, though ultimately Israel's reluctance to provide significant military equipment means it's unlikely to donate its F-16s. In 2022, Israel refused to provide Ukraine with outdated MIM-23 Hawk air defense missiles built by the US. Sadly, Israel finds itself in a delicate situation with Russia. Russia allows it to carry out airstrikes against asymmetric threats in Syria, and in exchange, Israel isn't comfortable upsetting that relationship by providing arms to Ukraine. Turkey, meanwhile, has 270 F-16s and is in the middle of modernizing old Block 30 models to the latest standard. In October 2021, it placed an order for 40 new modern F-16s along with modernization kits for an additional 79 airframes. However, the F-16 is the backbone of the Turkish air defense, and there is still significant bad blood between Turkey and the US over America's decision to kick Turkey out of the F-35 program. Granted, the move was brought on by Turkey purchasing Russian S-400 air defense systems after the US warned that Russia could use the system to gather data on the F-35. To deny Russia the opportunity to sniff out any F-35 secrets, the US kicked Ankara out of the program altogether. Now Turkey is attempting to build its own fifth-generation aircraft, the TFX Khan, and is unlikely to give up any of its F-16s until its new fighter is operational. Egypt has a significant fleet with 220 F-16s. However, Egypt maintains strong ties to Russia, which will likely prevent it from providing any aircraft. The country already refused to donate or sell any of the MiGs it bought in the 2010s, and it remains angry at the US over its refusal to sell at the F-15. Yet there were signs that this could change even before the Ukraine war started, so perhaps the US could negotiate Egyptian F-16s in exchange for brand new F-15s. After these nations, modest fleets remain in the Middle East, but nobody's very incentivized to part ways with any of their airframes. Jordan's fleet of 40-plus airframes are all older models and make up a large part of its air force. With Iran having everyone on edge, it's unlikely to want to give up any of its aircraft, and even if it did, it likely wouldn't be worth it. The United Arab Emirates has a fleet of 80 Block 60 F-16s, which, when they were bought in the 1990s, were actually more modern than those flown by the US Air Force. However, the UAE is attempting to negotiate a political high Wire Act as it courts Russia and China while trying to maintain its historic relations with the US. Given that neither China nor Russia could defend the nation from Iranian hostility, the US does have a bargaining chip it could use, albeit at the cost of greatly angering the UAE, which might just be worth it. After withdrawing from a deal to buy 50 F-35s in 2021, however, the UAE is unlikely to part with any of its jets. In the end, Ukraine is unlikely to receive more than a modest force of F-16s, all likely provided by the West. However, given the Russian Aerospace Force's horrible record in Ukraine, these F-16s will prove a significant threat to the continued Russian air operations, especially if equipped with long-range air-to-air missiles. But there's an even more important reason to supply Ukraine with F-16s, and one that could change the course of the war if not addressed. Ukraine's air defenses are currently a patchwork of its native Soviet-era systems and a slowly growing supply of modern Western batteries. However, the backbone of its air defense remains the Soviet S-300s and their like, and the world is quite literally running out of available inventory of missiles for these legacy systems. Both Ukraine's allies and Russia have been scouring the world for nations willing to give up their inventories, and those stockpiles are beginning to run dry. Russia can build new missiles, while the West has investigated the possibility of restarting old Soviet factories in former Eastern Bloc nations. America is also brainstorming possible ways of making its own air defense missiles compatible with Ukraine's Soviet launchers. There's some precedent for this as US engineers figured out how to hack Ukraine's MiGs so they could operate the US-made high-speed anti-radiation missile, or the HARM. However, the hack didn't allow the MiGs' mothership to employ the missile in its full effectiveness. F-16s for Ukraine are thus becoming imperative, especially as Ukraine recently announced that it likely only had a few months of air defense missiles left. Failing to plug this growing gap would be tragic given that Ukraine today is intercepting an average of 95% of crews and standoff attacks launched by Russia. But F-16s are also necessary because Russia has recently begun deploying glide bombs. These long-range standoff weapons are exactly what they sound like, bombs with deployable wings. The US has been using them for decades, and Russia has started to field them in significant quantities. Precision is still poor, as to be expected with Russia's relatively tech-poor combat platforms, but these bombs are a significant threat to Ukrainian civilians, and the worst part is that most air defenses simply can't protect from them.
This is why Ukraine needs fighter jets, as the only way to protect from glide bomb attack is to keep their launch platforms under threat at range. This is where the F-16s would shine, only though if equipped with long-range air-to-air weapons such as the AIM-120. Russia's ground-based air defenses are still significant in number, and F-16s won't be able to operate close to the front lines for long. Inevitably, Ukraine will get its F-16s. How many, from where, and their ultimate impact on the war, though, remain unknown. Every battle fought, every road and building bombed, every bullet fired, every intercepted missile, every bit of ground a tank trudges over. All of this is extremely costly, and for every person killed in action, there is a huge price to be paid, not just for their family but also for their country. And we'll show you many times in this video, working out the monetary cost of war is far from simple. It's very hard to know exactly how many rockets were fired, how much hardware was destroyed, and what it cost a nation when you lose infrastructure and young men that should have been working in your economy. But today, we'll try to put a price tag on the war, not just for the past and present, but for the costs in the years to come. The ripple effects of this war will be felt for decades, especially in the poorest segments of both Russia and Ukraine. We're going to start with the cost of war for Russia and finish with some quite shocking data regarding what this war has cost and will cost Ukraine. In nine months of fighting, it's thought Russia's used 10,000 to 50,000 shells per day, and if the average cost of a Soviet-caliber artillery shell is about a thousand bucks, then we get $5.5 billion on artillery shells. This is not an exact science, but it can at least give us an idea of the cost of the war. It was estimated that Russia fired about 4,000 missiles during that time period, with each one costing in the region of $3 million. That's $12 billion in missiles. On top of that, Russia's lost about 278 combat aircraft, with those coming in at $18 million apiece on average. The country's also lost 261 helicopters, another costly expenditure if we say the average cost of each one was $10.4 million. That means Russia's aviation losses likely amounted to $8 billion over those nine months. It was estimated that during that time period, Russia lost 2,897 tanks, not to mention how much it cost to keep fixing land equipment. We can only guess how expensive the repairs were for parts and manpower, but it's been said Russia's land vehicle losses add up to about $20 billion. The average cost for one Russian soldier every day he's alive on the battlefield is about $200, according to reports. But just how many soldiers Russia has mobilized and is preparing to mobilize is unclear. Reports in January said Russia has another 500,000 conscripts ready on top of the 300,000 already mobilized. To make things simple, let's just look at the cost of keeping 300,000 Russian soldiers fighting for nine months at $200 a day. That would be $16.44 billion. But as you know, this war is 15 months old already and more soldiers will be mobilized, so just paying their wages will cost the region of $30 billion. Again, not an exact science, it's a ballpark figure. Put another way, if a guy costs 200 bucks a day and has fought for 15 months, that's 450 days times $200, which is $90,000. No one fights every day for that long, but this is just an example. As for the ones who die, reports say their families receive 7.4 million rubles, about $110,000 each. Other reports say it's less than that, but let's stick with this number to make things simple. The problem is, we don't know how many Russian soldiers have died. The numbers reported so far might not be accurate. Some reports say about 40,000 Russian soldiers have been killed in action, but it might be much higher. Other reports state lower figures. But the 40,000 number would mean Russia's paid out $4.4 billion in compensation, not to mention how much it costs to treat wounded soldiers. If we include all the casualties, that's well over 100,000 men, we might be looking at around $10 billion for deaths and casualties. We can only estimate, but people who've tried to add up all the military costs have said Russia's war is costing the government and taxpayers $10 billion a month on average. So 15 months might have cost $150 billion. Still, that number doesn't take into account what it means to lose working men from your economy, what it means in terms of mental health in Russia, trust in the government, etc. Many people thought at the start of the war that sanctions would cripple Russia. Word on the street was the Russian economy would contract by about 15% which would have been devastating for Russia. It didn't happen, though. Russia's exports remained fairly healthy, and now the experts say Russia's economy only contracted by about 2-3%. to The IMF said 2% and added that there would be slight growth in the Russian economy in 2023. As you'll see later on in the show, Ukraine hasn't been so lucky. It's been hit with an economic wrecking ball. Still, it was reported that the Russian billionaire class lost a whopping $93 billion in 2022. As for the normal folks in Russia who hurt the most, at the end of the day, they're reportedly saving their money by not buying unnecessary items. 
Reports say they visited malls less in 2022. One economist said at some point this will cause long-term stagnation of the Russian economy. She said the living standards of Russians would eventually erode. Russia's total goods imports were down 20% from 2021, and technology imports decreased by about 30%. In 2022, Russia's car production was down by about 67% and other industries saw some decreases. For example, the Russian arms industry exports have slumped while Western arms industries have thrived. We'll come back to this topic at the end. Some analysts say Russia's economy has been propped up so far, but they say there will be trouble down the line for the global pariah. Still, the Russian GDP is around $2 trillion, and the IMF forecast for the next few years keeps it at just over $2 trillion. It often depends on who you ask. For 2023, OECD reports Russia's GDP to decline by 2.5%, but the World Bank says 0.2%, while the IMF expects growth of 0.7%. It has, however, had to spend a lot on fighting. Its overall military spending plan for 2022 was $346 billion, which is a fortune when you consider that for 2020 defense spending was at $61 billion. Russia has also had to find a lot more money, and unlike Ukraine, it's paying for this war from its own pockets. We should say, everywhere you look, you can see different numbers regarding the cost of Russia's war. The Special Operations Forces report recently said, Russia's war wasn't costing the country $10 billion a month, but a massive $900 million a day. However, it did admit that adding up costs can be treated with a certain amount of flexibility. This would give us a military expenditure of $27 billion a month and a $405 billion price tag for the 15 months that have passed. $900 million a day might be a ballpark figure, but from what we can see, it's probably very close to reality. Russia isn't just going to hold up its hands anytime soon and say it's too broke to carry on. However, the country has been considerably weakened. Its military especially has been immensely weakened, which is good news for the USA and any country that considers Russia a threat. As US Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin explained in 2022, we want to see Russia weakened to the degree that it can't do the kinds of things it has done in invading Ukraine. That much has happened, but at a great cost to Ukraine too. As many analysts have observed, Putin's war crime has cost his own country immeasurably. That's why even critics of US NATO policy say Putin was insane for doing what he did. But Russia still has a lot in reserve, which is why it's regarded as one of the most powerful militaries in the world. If you look at the website Global Firepower, a site that analyzes military strength, Russia comes second after the USA, with China not far behind. Russia still has about 830,000 active personnel, with another 500,000 as reserves and paramilitaries. The question is, how long can it keep watching its personnel and stocks deplete? The day we started making the show, news reports said Russia had just lost 48 artillery systems, as well as two fighter jets and two helicopters, in the space of two days. One of the fighter jets was a Sukhoi Su-34, priced at around 40 to $50 million. The other was a Su-35 which, if we go by how much China paid for some of them a while back, cost anywhere from $40 million to $65 million. So, Russia outguns Ukraine easily in terms of military hardware, but it also is sure losing a lot of it. These recent losses alone add up to a very expensive week for Russia. We mentioned tanks earlier. Again, it depends on what resource you look at as to how many tanks Russia has lost, but the number is usually estimated to be around 2,000. Another report stated anywhere from 1,845 to 3,511. Tanks come in all shapes and sizes, some with upgrades, some old, some new, so it's hard to give an exact cost per each tank. Still, the T-72B3 costs around 250,000, and Russia has lost a fair few of those. It said Russia's lost seven T-90Ms, each costing around 1.7 million. But as we're about to show you, while Ukraine is receiving weapons from other nations, the losses caused by the war on Ukraine are much more than about losing men and machines. It's Ukrainian land that's been and is being pulverized, not Russian land. Ukraine at least has some help. When you consider the aid Ukraine is receiving, it kind of tells you how much Russia must be spending. If we look at numbers from January 2022 to January 23, we can see that US military aid is the highest at $46.56 billion. The United Kingdom is way back in second at $5.13 billion. Poland comes in third at $2.5 billion. Next countries are Germany at $2.47 billion, Canada at $1.35 billion, the Netherlands at $0.9 billion, Italy at $0.69 billion, France at $0.69 billion, Norway at $0.62 billion, and Denmark at $0.59 billion. 
But in a long list of nations giving military aid to Ukraine, some don't have very large GDPs. In terms of how much has been spent of a country's GDP, the US and UK rank 8th and 9th place. The first place country is Latvia, followed by Estonia and then Poland and Lithuania. Some Eastern European countries, of course, have a colorful history with Russia and its imperialistic ambitions. Making a donation to Ukraine is a no-brainer. Many companies have given aid to Ukraine too, such as Elon Musk's SpaceX, which has provided Ukraine with Starlink satellite equipment for internet use. Perhaps one of the strangest pieces of lethal aid, but also non-lethal, is the 500 packets of cigarettes provided by Philip Morris, the company behind the brand Marlboro. This isn't important in the greater scheme of things, we just want to give you an idea of the smaller costs of the war, so here are some more. The South Korean manufacturer of military gear has donated bulletproof vests, Amazon pledged $50 million in tech for logistics and cybersecurity, an American outdoors company gave Ukraine a million rounds of small caliber ammunition, some countries have donated helmets and knee guards, first aid kits, tourniquets, badges, sleeping bags, tents, generators, field rations, gas masks, and warm clothes. The list goes on and on, and includes lots and lots of fuel. Then there's the money that's been donated by citizens of various nations. The citizens of the Czech Republic somehow came up with $171 million for Ukraine. Poland and Lithuania citizens managed to raise many more millions, the citizens of Taiwan raised $33 million, and the citizens of South Korea $3 million. The list of countries expands significantly if we include all the humanitarian aid. Austria might not be donating any weapons to Ukraine, but it was nice enough to supply the country with 500,000 vaccine doses. Azerbaijan didn't send any weapons, but it evacuated vulnerable people from Ukraine and sent 29 tons of humanitarian aid to refugees. Croatia also gave money to refugees, and it helped out Ukrainian students. France supplied Ukraine with 21 new ambulances and 11 fire engines. Germany donated a mobile field hospital with 65 refrigerators and 1,200 hospital beds. It also gave 10 million euros in disaster relief. India donated $10 million in medical supplies and pills. Again, if Ukraine has these things, we can expect Russia also needs them. Hungary donated 500 liters of wine. Not just any wine, but wine to be used for communion. Ireland donated 500 tons of seed potatoes. Japan donated 83,000 solar-powered lanterns. Part of Slovenia's donations included 200 pairs of rubber boots and 250,000 latex gloves. The UK's package included $2.5 million to be spent on the training of judges and forensic experts. Why? Because of potential war crimes. The USA donated $1 billion worth of food, water, medicine, and other supplies. But maybe the most surprising aid in this whole terrible affair came from Vatican City. It donated a couple of cardinals that will give the Ukrainian populace material and spiritual support. Amen to that. The expression, everything but the kitchen sink, is entirely valid here. Even Lego, KFC, McDonald's, Google, Microsoft, Meta Platforms, aka Facebook, soccer teams, and game makers have gotten in on the act of donating. So, let's think about this. In one day in the war, besides using and losing weapons, you have the cost of helping refugees, you have a cardinal working possibly a 12-hour shift, you have computer technology working around the clock. At that same time, wounded soldiers are being treated in donated ambulances as donated fire trucks put out fires and doctors throw away countless pairs of donated latex gloves. Importantly, you have destroyed buildings and bombed roads that will all need reconstructing. With that in mind, figuring out the exact daily cost of war is like trying to assemble a 10 million piece jigsaw puzzle of the unobservable universe. But we will try our best to put this puzzle together for you. In February 2023, the Kiel Institute for the World Economy in Germany said aid from all nations added up to about $150 billion. Sounds like a ton of money, but consider the USA spends about $50 billion each year on another war, the war on drugs. The UK also spends about $7 billion a year on that same war, so if we count all the country's wars on drugs, the $150 billion for the war on Russia doesn't sound so crazy. It is a lot, but arguably affordable. From February 2022 to February 23, the USA was the biggest spender on Ukraine aid, with the figure for military, humanitarian, and financial aid being almost $72 billion. EU institutions spent $35.5 billion, the UK $9.8 billion, Germany $7.3 billion, Japan $6.2 billion, the Netherlands $3.9 billion, Canada $3.7 billion, and Poland at $3.5 billion. Interestingly, most countries' biggest expense was military, but Japan spent diddly squat on military aid and a ton of financial aid. This is why. 
The Kyiv School of Economics said that in a 10-month period of the war in Ukraine, 149,300 residential buildings were damaged or destroyed, including 131,400 private houses, 17,500 apartment buildings, and 280 dormitories. It said this added up to about $54 billion in costs. That works out to $5.4 billion each month on average. Sure, no months are the same, but it's hard to be specific. As we make the video, we are in May, so let's add in the extra months. If we do, we get $81 billion. So if you do the math, it comes to $180 million a day for Ukraine regarding the loss of houses, apartments, etc. We also have to consider what Russia has been aiming at the entire war – infrastructure. Ukraine's Ministry of Development of Communities, Territories, and Infrastructure Development said that at the start of December 2022, Russia had destroyed or damaged 150 bridges or overpasses on state importance roads. The cost for that was put at $35.6 billion, but again, this was only until the beginning of December. There was a lot of damage done during the winter, but let's just take the average. Over 15 months, that'd be $53.4 billion, and that would work out to about $118 million daily on bridges and overpasses. So, for bridges and buildings together, we get $298 million per day. Ukraine says as of December last year, 3,000 educational institutions were damaged or destroyed, including 1,400 secondary education schools, 865 preschools, and 505 institutes of higher education. The cost was $8.6 billion over 10 months. That works out to $12.9 billion over 15 months and $28.67 million per day. Let's round that one off and just say now we have a total of $327 million per day so far. The Kiev School of Economics said the list of things damaged or destroyed also included 907 cultural facilities, 168 sports facilities, 157 tourism facilities, and 95 religious facilities. Over 10 months, that added up to $2.2 billion. Over 15 months, that's $3.3 billion and $7 million a day. There are many more things we could list, but we'll start to speed things up now. So, there were many other costs over those 10 months, according to those hard-working researchers at the Kiev School of Economics. Some of the costs are as follows. Agriculture – $6.6 billion Transport – $2.9 billion Trade – $2.4 billion Utilities – $2.3 billion Culture, Sport and Tourism – $2.2 billion Healthcare – $1.7 billion Energy – $6.6 billion Electronics – $700 million Social and Financial – $300 million Ecology – a massive $14 billion they said over a 10-month period, Ukraine had lost $137.8 billion in damages. This would make the cost over 15 months $206.7 billion, and for each and every day, $459.33 million. If we add that to Russia's estimated total of $405 billion, we get a total cost of about $612 billion for both countries, or $1.36 billion a day. But we didn't even count Ukraine's cost of fielding soldiers. Their basic pay is 20,000 hryvnias a month, or $550. But reports said frontline combatants would get 100,000 hryvnias bonus, $2,700 a month. Ukraine now has at its disposal about 1 million soldiers. However, nowhere near that are currently on the front lines. It's hard to work out the wages, but we do know Ukraine spent nine times more on its military in 2022 than in 2021. The total for 2022 was about $31 billion. Some websites reported that compensation paid to a dead soldier's family is 15 million hryvnias, which is over $400,000. If 50,000 Ukrainian soldiers die, that would be $20 billion in compensation. 50,000, unfortunately, is probably much less than will actually die. But it's also important to remember that 47% of Ukrainian companies stopped operating in 2022. Businesses closed down everywhere. The country pretty much lost its steel industry. It's thought Ukraine's GDP was down 30% on the year. This works out as Ukraine losing about $70 billion because of the war in terms of its GDP. It's estimated that 8 million refugees are now outside of Ukraine. A further 5 million are internally displaced. The World Health Organization reported that around 10 million people are at risk of having mental disorders such as PTSD, stress, anxiety, and depression, with the number of people abusing substances rising. The Ukrainian government said over 60% of its soldiers now suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, which will have both a negative economic and societal effect on the future of the nation. The WHO already puts Ukraine at the highest category globally for years of life lost due to alcohol abuse 
And after this war, booze problems might get even worse. There's a lot of evidence saying trauma can lead to addiction and or alcoholism, as can a lack of purpose. With a wrecked economy, many families might feel this lack of purpose. This has to be counted on in the cost of the war. How much does this cost daily? We're not even going to put a price tag on that. We don't know how to. It's the same with human life. How can we put a price tag on that? We don't just mean the cost of a funeral, but the cost of an able-bodied person now not working to contribute to Ukraine's GDP. What about the emotional cost to their family, which will ripple into economic costs? The US Defense Intelligence Agency said at the end of April 2023 that Russia had suffered 189,500 to 223,000 total casualties, including 35,500 to 43,000 men killed in action and a further 154,000 to 180,000 wounded. That same report said Ukraine had suffered 124,500 to 131,000 casualties, including 15,500 to 17,500 men killed in action, and 109,000 to 113,500 wounded in action. But these estimates, according to a lot of analysts, are way off. The numbers could be much worse. So the human cost will have far-reaching ramifications in the future, more so in Ukraine. Ukrainians not even fighting in the war are feeling the pinch right now. In 2023, human rights groups reported a full-scale attack on the labor rights of all working people in Ukraine. This is wartime, so labor rights have been put to the side. This was made official when the government introduced a new law in March 2022 on the organization of labor relations during martial law. Media reports said that some of these new labor laws will last beyond the conflict. Harsh times indeed. Ukrainians have already been hit with 27% price hikes, and people are worried about super hyperinflation down the line. People talk about not having food or being able to heat their houses. An 80-year-old woman liberated in Kherson told the press in 2022, it is very depressing and we're nervous. We're living on old stocks, but now the light is turned off, the refrigerator doesn't work, and we have to throw the food away. How many excess deaths will this cause? It's estimated that in 2022, there were 150,000 excess deaths in Ukraine because of the war. This is damaging to the economy now and will further impact it in the future. Ukraine will be paying for this war for many years to come, decades even. The country will also be in debt. The Lend-Lease Agreement with the US doesn't mean Ukraine is receiving free money, the debt has to be paid back, but it can be over decades. The US won't force it. More likely, it'll be a situation where, I rubbed your back, now you rub mine. Still, the agreement states any loan or lease of defense articles to the government of Ukraine under paragraph 1 shall be subject to all applicable laws concerning the return of and reimbursement and repayment for defense articles loaned or leased to foreign governments. The European Union handed Ukraine 18 billion euros in loans, and this too could cause trouble down the line. Printing money is not the answer. That often leads to catastrophe. Others have said Russia started the war, so the estimated $411 billion Ukraine will need to rebuild should be paid by Russia by confiscating its frozen $300 billion in central bank assets. That might sound fair on paper, but there are legal matters to think about, and if other countries start thinking their assets can just be taken away, it could cause turmoil on the global market. Countries might even lose faith in the dollar, and the US doesn't need any more nations losing faith in its reserve currency. Taking Russia's cash might lead to the US running into trouble, and anyway, harsh reparations need to be treated with care lest we see the rise of a tyrant in Russia far worse than Putin. Still, such a move does have some support. We should also add that some analysts say the reconstruction of Ukraine will cost more like $750 billion. A lot of lucrative contracts will be made inside and outside of Ukraine. It will boost the economy, but poorer classes will no doubt suffer during this time of reconstruction. UNICEF says rising inflation has sent 4 million children into poverty in Russia, Ukraine, and other countries nearby. The impact of more poverty is global, but inside of Ukraine it'll be felt profoundly. While Ukraine has taken steps to clean up all the corruption there, the country still lies in a lowly 116th place on the Global Corruption Index. Hopefully Ukraine can avoid hyperinflation and, hopefully, it can rebuild without too many corrupt officials sharing the spoils of reconstruction. Just considering these things, though, tells us what a tough time Ukraine faces. It'll need a lot of help, and the reconstruction will need to be monitored, lest the country's many corrupt business leaders take advantage. The daily cost of war, then, is quite astounding. Ukraine hasn't just lost good men on the battlefield and innocent civilians in the streets, it's lost a third of its economy which will surely lead to instability down the line. 
including a negative effect on birth rates, mental health problems, crime, and corruption. Russia too will suffer, but it seems not as much. Then again, let's see what happens with possible reparations in the future. Reparations will help rebuild Ukraine. Also, will Ukraine receive help from those who have profited from the war? Ukraine might think it deserves that. We can't do a show on the cost of war without mentioning the profits of war. The world's 10 largest hedge funds made about $2 billion in betting on food commodities in 2022, but that was peanuts compared to Big Oil, BP, Chevron, ExxonMobil, Shell, and Total Energies, which made something like $134 billion in excess profits because of the war, and that was just in 2022. Norway's oil and gas sales will hit $131 billion in 2023, which is five times more than their revenue in 2021. Norway's financial support to Ukraine is $1.63 billion, a mere blip of its oil industry windfall. Far away from the battlefield and destroyed houses, it seems war is a fire to warm your outstretched hands. And the question is, which we're sure some of you are thinking, should some of these massive war profits go to helping Ukraine rebuild after the fighting is done? Ukraine's energy minister in 2023 said just that, big oil should help with the reconstruction costs. He said he and his team worked out that such companies have collectively had a war windfall of about $200 billion, which as you now know, would pay for a lot of reconstruction. He said, I think it would be fair to share this money with Ukraine, I mean to help us restore and rebuild the energy sector. But energy isn't the only sector dancing with the golden goose of death. Should other sectors be partially responsible for paying for Ukraine's reconstruction? For the arms makers and their many shareholders, it's been a terrific 15 months. For Lockheed, Raytheon, General Dynamics, and Northrop Grumman, the situation in Ukraine has been a windfall. They and their shareholders reportedly saw skyrocketing profits of many extra billions in 2022. The Intercept wrote in May 2023 that U.S. arms sales added up to $138.2 billion in 2021 and a staggering $206.6 billion in 2022. But this included many nations, of course. The article stated, despite the White House's rhetoric about supporting global democracy, the U.S. sold weapons in 2022 to 57% of the world's authoritarian regimes. Direct military sales by U.S. companies alone increased 48.6% to $153.7 billion in 2022 from $103 billion in 2021, while sales conducted through the U.S. government increased 49.1% to $51.9 billion from $34.8 billion. But the UK, Swiss, and German arms industries also had a bumper year. CNBC said it would be a bonanza year ahead for all of the leading global arms industry, but not for Russian arms companies. Their collective exports have dropped to levels not seen since the fall of the Soviet Union. Destruction is obviously supremely lucrative, but the reconstruction will be another lottery win for giant corporations and companies outside of Ukraine. It's just a cold fact of the war, unfortunately. There's no getting around it. Reconstruction is an estimated trillion-dollar opportunity for everyone who will be involved, so of course not everyone loses in this war. The hope is that post-reconstruction, Ukraine's people will finally enjoy a much better standard of living, and during reconstruction, Ukraine will get all the help it needs. With the war in Ukraine heating up, it looks as if Europe will finally be giving Ukraine the tanks it wants. But does this mean the Leopard 2 could end up going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Russia's latest and greatest, the T-14 Armada? And who would win if they did? One of the points being brought up in various circles due to the war in Ukraine is the relevancy of tanks on a modern battlefield. Once these fearsome machines ruled all the battlefield, but as the Ukrainian armed forces have proven thanks to Western anti-tank weapons, even the best tanks in the world are extremely vulnerable to simple infantry. Does that mean the tank is obsolete? Not quite. All it means is that tanks require more infantry support than ever before, and when it comes to destroying threats, nothing can stand up to the power of a tank. In short, in a fight, you don't really need a tank until you need a tank, because nothing else is going to get the job done like a tank. Germany seems likely to allow for the export of Leopard 2s to Ukraine in response to the nation's request for heavy combat systems. With unverified reports of a small number of T-14 tanks crossing the border into Ukraine, this means it's possible the Leopard will finally meet Russia's best in battle. 
If this happens, we'll finally see if the claims made about both tanks are true or just pure propaganda. The Leopard 2 entered development in the 1970s in response to improvements in Soviet armor design. Given that West Germany would be ground zero, figuratively and quite literally for any war between NATO and the Soviet bloc, the Germans were very invested in developing the best battle tank they possibly could, and they did not miss the mark, with the Leopard 2 an upgrade over the Leopard 1 immediately becoming one of the best tanks in the world and a complete overmatch against Soviet opponents. Originally, West Germany cooperated with the United States in developing the MBT-70. The US does a lot of things right when it comes to military hardware, but it's never truly been at the top of the class when it comes to tanks. Plus, both nations had completely different requirements for a main battle tank, and when coupled with communications problems from the two design bureaus, the project was doomed to failure. West Germany pulled out of the program as costs piled up and the US would pursue it alone, until eventually scrapping it and using the lessons it learned for the M1 Abrams. Instead, the German government looked at ways of upgrading the Leopard 1, with Porsche taking the lead in the effort. A study named Gilded Leopard concluded that multiple advanced technologies could be incorporated into the Leopard 1 design, with the new tank featuring an autoloader which would allow the use of heavier rounds, a coaxial autocannon, and an independent commander's periscope for situational awareness. Further improvements included a TV surveillance camera that could be extended on a mast, as well as improvements to the engine, armor, and transmission. One of the biggest changes the Germans implemented was the switch from a 105mm gun to a 120mm gun. This was in response to the developments in Soviet armor, and it prompted the Americans to do a similar switch with their XM1, the prototype of the Abrams. In 1976, the West Germans sent a Leopard 2 prototype to the US for inspection by American engineers. In comparison with the XM1, it was described discovered that the two vehicles were comparable in firepower and mobility, but the XM1 had superior armor protection. However, this was only in relation to explosive charges. Against a kinetic energy penetrator, the Leopard 2 was nearly twice as well protected. The Leopard's engine was also more reliable, and used less fuel and had a smaller heat signature, but it produced more noise. The engine also allowed the Leopard 2 to be quickly started up and shut down, as opposed to the XM1, which had a lengthy startup process and thus would be forced to idle during short pauses in combat. The Leopard 2 went into production shortly after the American tests, albeit with improved armor. Today, the latest Leopard 2 enjoys decades of upgrades, with additional armor on the front of the turret, the hull itself, and the side skirts. Figures are classified, but it's estimated that the Leopard 2 has the equivalent protection to 1840 to 2920 millimeters of armor versus kinetic energy projectiles and 2780 to 4370 millimeters of armor versus chemical explosive rounds. The Leopard 2A6 improves this protection, with protection equivalent to 5890 to 7800 millimeters of armor versus kinetic penetration and 9,000 to 11,500 versus chemical explosive rounds. Improvement to the belly armor also affords it additional protection from enemy missiles and IEDs, lessons learned from the conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan. Spall liners inside the hull protect the crew from the deadly effects of spalling, which happens when a projectile hits armor and does not penetrate it, but instead causes it to fracture on the inside, sending razor-sharp shards of metal bouncing around the interior of the tank. This can kill the crew while leaving the tank largely undamaged. The use of slat armor and active protection measures also increase survivability against rocket-propelled grenades and anti-tank missiles. The interior of the Leopard 2 can be sealed, with the vehicle giving its crew 12 hours of life support. This allows the tank to operate on a nuclear battlefield. An automatic firefighting system triggers when the interior temperature rises above 180 degrees, but it could also be triggered via the driver. Tanks are nothing without a gun, and here the Leopard 2 shines. It features the Rheinmetall 120mm smoothbore gun with 27 rounds of ammunition. The tank also stores 15 additional rounds on the left side of the turret bustle and can be accessed via a secure door. A blow-off panel allows the ammunition to safely cook off without incinerating the crew, a failure overlooked in most Russian tanks. The Leopard 2 fires a variety of rounds, including the German DM-33 discarding Sabo anti-tank round, which can penetrate 960 mm of steel armor at a range of 2,000 meters. The new L-55 cannon being fitted on upgraded Leopard 2s has a longer barrel, and Germany has fielded an improved round which takes advantage of the bigger barrel with improved penetration. The new barrel can also potentially fire the Lahat anti-tank guided missile directly through the main gun, a feature found on some Russian tanks as well. The Leopard 2 builds on an excellent tank and improves it over time with various upgrade packages, but the T-14 is built from scratch to house new technologies. Could this be the game-winning advantage? 
The T-14 was born from the cancellation of the T-95 in 2010. Deciding that a brand new tank was needed to meet and exceed NATO threats, the T-14 was a revolutionary leap in tank design. Truly, this is a tank for the digital age. The T-14 immediately differs from the Leopard 2 by placing its crew of three inside an armored capsule in the hull itself. While in the Leopard, the commander sits in the turret, in the T-14 the crew all sit together side by side, leaving the turret completely unmanned and controlled remotely. This is already a significant improvement over the Leopard 2 as it reduces the vulnerability of the commander. The tank's armor is made of a brand new steel developed by Russian scientists and given the codename 44S SVSH. The steel allegedly has extremely high durability and is able to withstand extreme temperatures without deformation. It also has the added advantage of being 15% lighter than the steel used in previous tank models. The hull is also covered with a new composite armor that includes a classified ceramic layer, but the most revolutionary feature is on the inclusion of explosive reactive armor into the base design itself, rather than being added on later in the form of bricks. The Malakit Dual Explosive Reactive Armor protects the front, sides, and top from RPGs and anti-tank missiles. Modern tanks need an active protection measure, though, and the T-14 features the Afghanit Active Protection System. APS comes in two forms, hard and soft kill versions. Hard kill systems try to destroy or deform incoming munitions with their own, while soft kill systems try to interfere with the guidance or electronics of an incoming munition, such as with laser dazzlers. The Afghanit system incorporates both, a world first and uses millimeter wave radar to target both incoming kinetic energy penetrators and tandem charge weapons such as the American Javelin. While this system allegedly protects the tank on all sides, it's not been able to intercept top attack munitions like the Javelin. Independent analysis believes the system works with four sensor panels mounted on each of the tank's sides with a possible fifth on the turret. These hide an active electronically scanned array radar which tracks incoming projectiles. The system is able to destroy projectiles such as artillery shells or unguided rockets while using its soft kill capabilities to interfere with the guidance system of anti-tank guided missiles. The system is believed to be effective against any modern third and fourth generation anti-tank system, while the Russians claim that it can even protect from depleted uranium kinetic penetrators such as those used by American tanks. This is a claim met with much skepticism, mostly because it was sent by a Russian official, but also because the active penetration system's fragmentation charge would be easily pushed out of the way by an ultra-dense projectile traveling many times faster than the speed of sound. At best, it could push it slightly off course, which just means it would ruin the tank's day in a slightly different area than where it was initially aimed. The Russian MOD, which we've found out totally never lies, claims the system has successfully defeated uranium projectiles traveling at 2 kilometers a second. This has not been independently verified. The tank's manufacturer has also claimed the T-14 is invisible to radar and infrared detection due to the use of radar-absorbing paint and the placement of heat-generating components deep within the hull itself. The shape of the turret also helps it reduce the radar and thermal heat signature, in essence making the Armada a stealthy vehicle. Both Russians and American experts have called BS on these claims, mostly because a Russian official said it and because Russia has not fielded a single truly stealth platform to date. If Russia had developed a wonder radar defeating paint, then its pilots wouldn't be terrified of flying their planes on the front lines in Ukraine. The tank is equipped with a 125mm smoothbore cannon, allowing it to fire the Vacuum 1 discarded Sabo fin stabilized round. Details remain classified, but this 900mm long projectile is believed to use depleted uranium and can penetrate 1,000mm of armor at 2,000 meters. Following Russian tradition, the cannon can also fire the 9M119M1 Invar M anti tank guided missile with a range of up to 5 kilometers. It can even use the new 3 UBK 21 Sprinter ATGM with a range increase of up to 12 kilometers. So, which tank would win in a one on one fight? We've given the T-14 a lot of crap in the past and with good reason. The tank broke down during rehearsals for the 2015 Moscow Victory Day Parade and has yet to enter serial production. The Russians have a rich history of allowing their mouths to write checks their defense budget can't cash, or just outright lying about capabilities. However, the T-14 is considered by many foreign experts as the real deal. Russia has historically known it would need to win a war it fought against NATO on the ground, as it's completely outmatched both in the air and at the sea. The T-14 is a revolutionary tank, built for future wars, and the inclusion of an automated turret and an armored crew capsule is an obvious advantage over the Leopard 2. Both tanks are exceptionally well protected against chemical explosive rounds. The real question is how they perform against modern kinetic threats. The T-14 is at an advantage here, having been designed from the ground up with an armored crew capsule. 
Remote control technology allows the tank to operate without the commander being exposed and vulnerable in the turret, further increasing survivability. The Leopard 2's age is also a factor here, as the tank was not designed with the modern threat environment in mind while the T-14 was. From the side, the Leopard is likely to have less survivability than the T-14. However, only the German government and some foreign buyers are privy to the capabilities of new armor upgrade packages, so it's impossible to tell just how well the Leopard would fare against the very intimidating Vacuum 1 and Vacuum 2 rounds. Ryan Mattal claims its armor can defeat up to 1 meter long kinetic energy projectiles, but then again, this remains completely untested in combat. The refusal by the German government to use depleted uranium kinetic penetrators is also a major issue here when facing modern tank armor. While current tungsten penetrators are more than capable of doing the job, it does hint that the Leopard 2's maximum engagement distance against the T-14 is going to be well under what is advertised. Given that the bulk of these two tank systems remain highly classified, it's almost impossible to have a realistic discussion on which tank would beat which. However, we do know that generally the West enjoys better electronics than the Russians, which means the Leopard 2 would likely see the T-14 first, tall tales from the manufacturer of being invisible to thermal imaging aside. The Leopard 2 probably has a better fire control system allowing for more accurate shooting on the move. Ultimately, it does seem as if the Leopard 2 is not quite as optimized to defeat kinetic energy threats as the T-14, which gives the T-14 an advantage. However, we can be pretty confident in the claims of the Leopard 2's capabilities given that the tank has seen huge success in the export market, meaning that the rest of Europe is pretty vigorously testing these claims. Regarding the T-14, we only have the Russians' word on it, and as we've mentioned previously, Russian officials lie as often and as easily as they breathe. So, who would win in a fight between the Leopard 2 and the T-14 Armada? Well, right now the Leopard 2 would absolutely crush the T-14, mostly because there's over 2,000 of it in army stocks across Europe, while there's an estimated 14 or so T-14 Armadas in existence. If Russian claims about the tank are true, however, the Leopard might find itself in a slightly uphill battle against the T-14 in a one-on-one -on -one engagement. You don't need me to tell you that misinformation in the news is at an all-time high, especially when it comes to topics with huge global implications like the conflict in Ukraine. One of the hardest parts about researching topics, like today's video on weapons the US is sending to Ukraine, is being able to find sources untainted by bias or by their own financial motivations, which is why I've started using Ground News. Ground News is the world's first news comparison platform, and I mean that you can literally compare news, like with this article about the US shipping weapons stored in Israel to Ukraine, where you can see that the headlines are subtly different depending on the outlet. With right-leaning sources using terms like quietly shipping or secret stockpile, while left-leaning ones make no mention of it being quiet or a secret. You also get a breakdown of what type of news sources are covering a story, making it easier to spot media biases, like how that same story about stockpiles of weapons in Israel has a 57% right-leaning reporting coverage versus just 19% from left-leaning sources. Led by a former NASA engineer, Ground News is a small team of independent media outsiders concerned about the future of news, and they're on a mission to make sure the world world is well informed where it's easy for readers to think freely about the issues of our times. So if you're looking for a better way to stay informed about current events around the world, check out Ground News by going to ground.news infographics. Since Russia invaded Ukraine back in February, the US has sent a literal mountain of lethal aid to the Ukrainian military. While support has largely gone to the Ukrainian army, the country's air force and navy have also gotten a huge helping hand, totaling almost $20 billion as of November 2022. Let's take a look at some of the weapon systems the US has sent to Ukraine so far. The war has frequently proven that being part of a tank crew is the most dangerous job on the battlefield. And for a good reason, the US has sent tons of anti-tank weaponry to Ukraine, with thousands of armored vehicles flooding the Ukrainian countryside and little armor to face the Russians, the Ukrainian military needed a big helping hand to deal with them. One of the most famous anti-tank weapons is the Javelin. The Javelin anti-armor missile system has been a mainstay of US forces since the mid-1990s. Part of the reason it's so effective is due to its ability to be a fire-and-forget weapon while also attacking its target from the top down. Because it is fire-and-forget, the operator can quickly run away once the missile leaves the tube to avoid enemy counterfire. This is because the missile will continue tracking the target once it's locked onto it. The top-down attack feature allows the operator to attack the most vulnerable part of a tank, its top armor. Most tanks have their heaviest armor up front, followed by the sides, rear, and lastly the underbelly and top of the tank. Because the top is much weaker, a strong attack there will likely cause a catastrophic kill. A catastrophic kill is when the entire tank blows up and is completely destroyed rather than just being damaged, meaning enemy forces would be able to repair it later on. 
These attack platforms have proven themselves to be very effective, so the US military has sent over 8,500 of them to Ukraine. Now it's important to note that it's unclear if 8500 means CLUs or disposable missile tubes. This is important because the brains of the Javelin is the Command Launch Unit or CLU. This attaches to a disposable missile tube that when combined makes the weapon system up. Regardless, Ukraine has gotten a ton of these. The US has not only been sending Javelins but also 38,000 other anti-armor systems. While it's unclear what these could be, more likely, these are AT-4 rockets, used as the replacement to the Vietnam-era law for decades. The AT-4 is a mainstay of man-portable anti-armor firepower. Its simple use-it-and-lose-it design makes it a simple but effective weapon system for engaging light-armored vehicles, buildings, bunkers, and anything else a soldier needs to blow up from a distance. While AT-4s are not a good alternative to javelins for taking out tanks, they are a great force multiplier for the hundreds of thousands of citizen soldiers Ukraine has recruited into its National Guard. These troops were being thrown into combat, often without a lot of training, at the beginning of the war. Putting this simple but effective weapon system in their hands makes them a force multiplier and boosts their confidence on the battlefield. Another great confidence booster has been the huge amount of artillery and artillery shells the US has sent over. After Ukraine repulsed the initial invasion and the Russians pivoted to eastern Ukraine, the war became a war of artillery. Numerous observers have noted that the Russian army blasts their artillery day and night without end. On the other hand, Ukrainian artillery has been literally outgunned by both number of guns and the amount of ammunition each one could fire. With Ukrainian troops suffering almost constant bombardment, the US decided to give them some tools to help even the playing field. As part of its comprehensive aid package, the US has sent 142 155mm guns and 36 105mm guns along with over a million shells to feed them. The US sent more heavy artillery systems because the Ukrainians needed longer range artillery. Since older Soviet artillery systems did not have the range of modern Russian equipment, the Russians could move outside the effective range of those systems and blast away at them. With heavy American artillery, Russian guns can no longer shoot away with impunity, since now they risk counterfire from a donated M777 howitzer. Another artillery system that's been in the news lately has been the 38 high-mobility artillery rocket systems donated to Ukraine. These systems, known as HIMARS for short, are revolutionary weapons. Link 16 is one of the most common data links that the US military uses to send and receive encrypted data over a secure pathway. It's unbreakable and allows a free flow of communication without fear of being knocked out or intercepted. While mostly a Navy system, other branches have started using it like the Marine Corps. This is important because the HIMARS was the first Link-16 capable mobile rocket system the US ever built. This matters because Ukrainian defenders on the land, sea, or air who are up Link can send data to the firing units. Instead of a cumbersome patchwork of different networks and communication paths between other units or branches, Link-16 allows multiple units over a wide area to build a near-instantaneous fire control solution. With that data, the HIMAR system can attack Russian troops anytime, anywhere, in real time within its range. With the huge number of troops involved, the US also sent a ton of ammunition to the Ukrainian army. Since February, the US has sent over 104 million rounds of small arms ammunition. As we've talked about before, the Ukrainians use a wide range of weapons dating back to World War II to more modern weapons we're used to seeing on a 21st century battlefield. We should be clear that most World War II weapons go to National Guard units, the bulk of their military is armed with modern equipment. The breakdown of the ammunition types is unclear. Most likely, it's 7.62 by 39 and 5.45 by 39, which are the calibers for AK-47s and AK-74s respectively. These two rifles make up the bulk of the current small arms inventory of Ukraine, so these are the most likely calibers. Other Soviet ammunition types used for their machine guns have likely come from Eastern European stocks. But the US did have large inventories of arms and ammo for the Afghan army, which is where our next weapon systems come from. Among the mix of ordnance, the US sent 20 Mi-17 Hind attack helicopters to the Ukrainian Air Force. The last time we checked, this was still a Russian-made attack helicopter. It ended up in the US inventory because the US purchased a bunch of these for the Afghan military. These were being refurbished in the United States, but after the fall of Afghanistan to the Taliban government, these helicopters were no longer needed, so the US sent them back to Ukraine. This is the perfect solution for this seemingly useless surplus of helicopters, as many Ukrainian helicopter pilots trained on similar Soviet legacy platforms. This is the main reason why the US has not flooded Ukraine with F-35s and other aircraft, because it would take years to train Ukrainian pilots to fly them. 
Another interesting weapon the US has sent includes 45 T-72B main battle tanks. While this has been a mainstay on the Ukrainian and Russian side, the US has never fielded this legacy Soviet gear. And while you might think the US brought some home from its two invasions of Iraq, you'd be mistaken. As part of a deal with Eastern European countries to empty their Soviet stocks and receive Western equipment, the Czech Republic donated its reserve tanks to Ukraine. However, these tanks had not been retrofitted with modern gun sights, night vision, or fire control computers. These upgrades and many more had to be done in the Netherlands before shipping them to Ukraine. In total, the Czechs donated 90 tanks to be refurbished and the US funded half the cost, which gives the figure of 45 T-72s. Ukrainian air defenses have also gotten a laundry list of early Christmas presents. Probably the most potent air defense system the US has sent has been eight National Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile Systems. NASMs are arguably the world's most potent ballistic missile defense system. Due to their high cost, the US only has a select few of these guarding the skies over Washington, D.C., and there's a reason why they cost so much. It doesn't matter how high, low, or fast a missile is, the NASMs can shoot it down. US Air Force testing proved it was the best anti-air defense system the service had ever operated. Gifting these to Ukraine has been a blessing since, during their first day in action, the NASMs fired 10 missiles and brought down 10 Russian ballistic missiles. Another equally deadly but less sexy anti-air system is the good old-fashioned Stinger missile. This weapon system has resulted in Russian service members seeing their helicopters and aircraft knocked out of the sky at an alarming rate. In fact, Russia has lost so many aircraft that the fear of losing many more has rendered the Russian Air Force combat ineffective in Ukraine. This is because the US has sent over 1,600 Stinger missiles. Because of this, any bush, building, or tree could turn one of Russia's prized fighter planes into scrap metal. The US has not forgotten about the Ukrainian Navy. Arguably, the most shocking part about this war is the fact that Ukraine is beating the world's third largest navy without a navy. After the Russians illegally annexed Crimea, they seized the bulk of the Ukrainian Navy. Once the invasion started, the remaining ships in the Mykolaiv region were scuttled by their crews to prevent their capture by the rapidly advancing Russian army. Now, totally without a navy, Ukraine has still managed to punch back through the use of long-range ballistic missiles. In March, the Ukrainians damaged or sunk three Russian amphibious ships in port. In April, they sunk the Russian flagship Moskva with Neptune anti-ship missiles. While the US provided neither of these weapons, the US has provided two Harpoon anti-ship missile batteries that could be used. The US also sent over 58 coastal patrol boats. These are likely the now-retired Mark VI patrol craft serving the waterways of Iraq and the Arabian Gulf. These potent attack craft can move fast and punch well above their weight. But what is more interesting than that are the unmanned surface vessels. In the DoD report, there's a small section that lists an undefined number of unmanned coastal defense vessels. Currently, the US Navy does not employ any unmanned surface craft in its fleet. However, the Navy has been experimenting with them for years. Perhaps wanting to test out what they could really do, the US donated what they have developed so far to Ukraine. If they have, these craft might have already been used in combat. Back in October, unmanned surface vessels attacked the Russian fleet inside its home port of Sevastopol. The new Russian flagship and a minesweeper were damaged by the suicide boats. Ukraine never admitted where they'd gotten these attack craft from, but they were likely of US origin. All the items mentioned in this video are just a tiny part of the vast amounts of weapons and equipment sent by the US to Ukraine. We've not even touched on the huge number of different UAVs, other anti-air defenses, and radar systems. We also have yet to discuss the enormous numbers of mundane but equally important equipment like mobile hospitals, generators, body armor, and light armored vehicles. So watch out for another video explaining part 2 of US aid to Ukraine. A major mobilization is right around the corner, and Russia has stepped up its bombing campaign of Ukraine in the recent weeks. Putin seems to be confident in his odds of winning the war this year, but the reality might be completely different. Because Western intelligence on the Russian army seems to not put the odds in Putin's favor. On the surface, Russia seems to have the advantage in any military showdown. They have a total of 3 million personnel, both active and reserve, more than twice Ukraine's numbers. While Ukraine's annual military budget is around $10 billion, Russia spends an average of $65 billion per year on its military. And of course, Russia also has nuclear weapons at its disposal, while Ukraine gave up its arsenal in the years after the fall of the Soviet Union. Seems like a classic David versus Goliath story, which makes it all the more impressive that Ukraine has kept up the fight this long. But appearances can be deceiving. Russia's made some key mistakes at the very start of the war. Ukraine is technically a non-aligned nation, although it's drifting closer and closer to the European Union and NATO. 
When Russia initially invaded, it made many bold statements about overrunning its neighbor, including threats toward NATO for being on its border. That largely ended any debate about this being an internal Russian issue, like Putin claimed, and rallied much of the rest of the world to Ukraine's defense. This means Russia isn't just going up against Ukraine anymore. While there technically aren't any foreign armies aiding Ukraine, for good reason, since Putin has made it clear he would consider this an act of war and retaliate against NATO, the West has supplied a large amount of equipment and training to Ukraine. Most of the gear came from NATO-aligned countries, with the lion's share coming from the United States. And the flow of supplies is still going, despite some grumbles about how much it costs. This isn't surprising, as the total foreign aid the US supplied, including military and humanitarian support, has come to over $150 billion in the first year of the war alone. And most of that is being put to good use. Around a third of that aid, $48 billion, has come in the form of direct military assistance. This is both weapons and shipments, and money used to buy weapon systems from third parties. More than half of this military funding comes from the United States, a vastly disproportionate amount. But while this seems surprising, there's good reason for it. Putin has very little leverage over the United States. While Putin's threats of attacking European nations is as unlikely as him winning the war, he does have one big card to play – energy supplies. With winter underway and much of Europe being supplied by Russian gas and oil, some governments have been hesitant to back Ukraine in fear of going cold during the winter. The United States, however, has no such concerns. The US has one big advantage in any geopolitical conflict. It's always a long way away from the front lines. It only has two bordering nations, both allies, without militaries that could threaten it. None of its neighbors of the Caribbean or South America are considered a threat as well. At least not since the Soviet Union's plan to place nuclear missiles in Cuba was stopped in its tracks. It's also largely energy independent and either produces most of its own oil or gets it from allies including Canada and Saudi Arabia. The only way to target the US is with a more direct military operation and Putin can ask Japan how that worked out. And the same goes for Ukraine's second biggest supplier. The United Kingdom provided almost $4 billion in military assistance to Ukraine over the last year, including some of its most advanced anti-aircraft missiles. Being an island, the United Kingdom has more options for energy supplies and is far less dependent on Russia than mainland European nations. The European Union, which Britain left a few years back, has provided over $3 billion in total military aid, which illustrates the delicate line they're trying to walk. Same goes for countries including Germany, Poland, and the Czech Republic, all of which have memories of being under Soviet boot. But what is that actually bought? To put it simply, a lot. The most important factor is that Kyiv is simply able to restock its military as needed. The country has largely been in a constant state of war for a year, and they've had to use most of their military stockpile to keep Russia at bay. The military aid given to Ukraine has included ammunition, guns, body armor, and field supplies, all of which are keeping their army in fighting condition. But that's just the start. The Ukrainian army had limited capabilities before the war began, but now they're equipped with some of the most advanced military technology in the world and are ready to take the fight to Putin. And one particular piece of equipment has been a game changer. Maybe the most advanced multiple rocket launcher in US history, the HIMARS is a truck-mounted system that is very maneuverable and has a top-tier radar system that allows it to shoot almost anything Russia has to offer. It can carry either six small rockets or one heavy-duty missile. Produced by Lockheed Martin, it's played a key role in turning the tide of the war and helping neutralize Russia's air barrages and commander positions. While Ukraine only has a few right now, the delivery of more HIMARS systems along with Patriot missiles is one of Ukraine's top priorities for future US aid. This is even the odds, but why isn't Russia requesting aid from its allies too? This is where Russia's big weakness in the war comes in. They've become an international pariah, and few countries have any interest in supplying them with weapons or even basic supplies. Their only direct supporters in the war are fellow outlaw nations including North Korea, Iran, Venezuela, Syria, and Putin's proxy state Belarus, none of which have massive militaries, so even basic supplies are scarce. North Korea has offered some supplies, but Iran is quickly becoming Russia's top military supplier, including a healthy stream of drones, but they can only do so much for Russia's military efforts. But what about Russia's fellow great power? China is in an unusual place when it comes to the war in Ukraine. They initially made bold statements in support of Russia, back when it looked like the war would be concluded within a week. Although support is waning, China has a vested interest in seeing Russia succeed. This would be the most significant invasion and conquest in the post-Cold War era, and would, if the international community accepted this reality, make China much more confident in its ability to conquer and subjugate the island nation of Taiwan with little to no opposition. 
but reality got in the way. While she and Putin seemed to be in sync in the early days of the war, the mighty Russian bear quickly turned into a scraggly cub on the battlefield. China did not want to hitch itself to a losing fight, so suddenly the Chinese leadership started being much more cagey about the war. Military aid to Russia slowed down, and now Russia has no chance of getting its hands on China's most advanced military technology. So while Russia might have the more impressive military budget, it's largely where it stops for them. While Ukraine is quickly finding that it can rely on a near-bottomless supply of aid from the many countries pulling for it. So, what's the next move? Right now, Western military aid has created a stalemate, with Ukraine unable to fully expel Russia from their territory without escalating the war. Ukraine has had enormous success in targeting Russian military leaders and sunk several of their top ships, but Russia's military strategy has largely been to focus in on specific cities and conquer them by sheer overwhelming force, as seen in the city of Mariupol which was essentially destroyed early in the war. Even with the numbers advantage, Putin has seen many of its early conquests like Kherson liberated by the Ukrainian army. But trouble may be brewing. Several members from the now-divided House of Congress have questioned continued aid to Ukraine. Reasons vary from it's too much money to we could get pulled into the war to rambling conspiracy theories. While President Joe Biden and the Senate leadership both strongly favor continuing to aid Ukraine or even raising the amount of aid it's sending over, there could be a battle to get continued funding and Putin might be changing his own tactics in response. It's clear that Russia can't keep up with the influx of Western military support that's being sent to Ukraine, especially as the Russian army is quickly being worn down. Reports are Russia is low on ammunition, body armor, and, of course, soldiers, as many of them are being wiped out in combat. Putin has already had to resort to a draft once, and rumors are a second mobilization is coming. But insanity is doing the same thing multiple times and expecting a different result, so Putin has also found another potential opening. Propaganda If you listen to Putin in the early days of the war, his rationales talk a lot about denazifying Ukraine and restoring Russia's historic territory. This was pretty quickly called out as absurd, the biggest reason being that Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, is one of only two current Jewish heads of state in the world and the only one outside of Jewish-majority Israel. Not exactly the guy you'd hire for a stealth Nazi regime. So instead, Putin has started portraying himself as the underdog. He claims that he's fighting an expansion of NATO and the West on Russia's borders, hoping to rally countries opposed to the US to his defense. But unless he can get China to reverse course, odds are this won't make much of a difference. Of course, there's also the culture war option. Listening to Putin's speeches now, he kind of sounds a little like a talk radio host. He often talks about the decadence and immorality of the West and accuses America and Ukraine of representing godless radicals who want to undermine Russia's culture. It seems like a silly reason to start a war, but the odds are this is meant for foreign consumption. If he can make himself the face of the global right wing and portray Zelensky as the opposition, American Republicans and right wing leadership in countries like Italy might start leaning towards shutting down aid to Ukraine. But will any of this work? Right now, the war is at a standstill, partially because of winter setting in, but while Putin has changed his tactics, it'll be very hard for him to overcome the Western support being sent to Ukraine. Zelensky has most of the world rallying behind him, ready to support the Ukrainian army with extensive aid and some of the best military technology in the world. And Putin has Iranian drones and a whole lot of confused draftees. Hundreds of thousands dead, millions of artillery shells fired, billions of dollars lost. These numbers barely scratch the surface of the toll the war in Ukraine has taken over the last year. On February 24, 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine. Almost 12 months later, the war is still raging. Putin and the rest of the world initially thought that Ukraine would fall within the first few weeks of attacks. But it seems as if everyone underestimated the resolve and strength of the Ukrainian people. As we approach the one-year anniversary of the war, some staggering statistics present themselves for analysis, some of which will be hard to swallow. In any war, there will be loss of life. However, the nature of Russian warfare during the conflict has left a large number of soldiers, civilians, and children dead. The numbers coming out of Ukraine are constantly changing as there are relatively few timeouts in the war. And even when ceasefires have been called in the past, Russia has willingly ignored them and continued to butcher innocent people. At the beginning of the war, several ceasefires were agreed upon to allow the evacuation of Ukrainian citizens out of cities and towns on the front lines. However, even after Russia agreed to allow for a safe corridor out of these areas, they never stopped firing. Innocent lives were taken, and civilians who just wanted to escape the carnage became stuck in a nightmare of all-out war. 
Reports coming out of Ukraine vary wildly, but estimates put civilian casualties somewhere between 20 and 40,000 people. No fewer than 7,000 casualties have been confirmed dead as a direct result of fighting in Ukraine. A number of factors caused these deaths. Many were killed by Russian artillery strikes, kamikaze drones, and missiles. However, Russian soldiers and mercenaries hired by Putin, such as those of the Wagner Group, have also been responsible for the deaths of Ukrainian civilians as they carry out acts of terror. One grisly example of this was during the Bucha massacre, which occurred sometime between the initial invasion and April 2022. When Ukrainian forces started to retake territory around Kyiv, they found that Russian forces had left behind a scene of carnage in the town of Bucha. It was here that 458 civilian bodies were found. 419 people were killed by weapons, the remaining died of natural causes, likely due to the occupation. The most tragic aspect of the Bucha massacre was that nine children were slain by retreating Russian soldiers and the mercenaries that accompanied them. There's no forgiving what happened at Bucha. Unfortunately, there have been several accounts of Russian forces intentionally torturing and killing Ukrainian civilians to instill fear in the general population. This has been done in the hopes that it'll lessen their resolve and make the fighting easier. The tactic has failed, and the Ukrainian population has remained strong and resilient as they defend their country from Russia. Since the war is being fought on Ukrainian soil, almost all civilian deaths recorded are Ukrainian. However, some startling statistics emerge when we examine what's happening in Russia. Not everyone in Russia agrees with Putin, and when you're voicing your opposition against an authoritarian leader's decisions, bad things can happen. A handful of Russian civilians have been injured or died during sabotage missions by Ukrainian forces, but that's nothing compared to the number who have perished at the hands of Vladimir Putin and his cronies. Reports indicate that thousands of people have been killed during violent suppression of war protests. At the beginning of the conflict, Russian citizens took to the streets to voice their disapproval of the invasion of Ukraine. As the war progressed, other demonstrations broke out against the forced conscription of Russians and the war crimes carried out in Ukraine. Once again, Putin sent his riot police, and when soldiers with automatic weapons face unarmed protesters, it never ends well. Thousands of Russians were killed, thousands more arrested. Those who were taken into custody were either sent to the front lines or thrown in a Russian prison to rot. So, Russian soldiers are killing civilians in Ukraine. Russian soldiers are killing civilians in Russia, and Vladimir Putin is killing anyone who speaks out against him, no matter how rich or powerful they are. Wealthy oligarchs have been dying under mysterious circumstances ever since Putin rose to power, but these assassinations have ramped up after several wealthy businessmen condemned Putin's actions in Ukraine. This means that the total civilian casualties in Ukraine and Russia have likely risen into the tens of thousands as the first year of the war comes to an end. And this number doesn't even include the 40,000 Russians that drank themselves to death during the year. Alcoholism is a huge problem in the nation, and the war has only exacerbated the problem. As fears of being conscripted rise, poverty gets worse due to sanctions, and life becomes more miserable overall. Russian citizens are turning to the bottle. A large chunk of civilians who died from alcohol poisoning over the past year can probably be linked to the stresses caused by war. Then, of course, there are the military casualties. Again, the number of soldiers dying in the war literally changes each day as Russians and Ukrainians are blown up by artillery, missiles, and deadly skirmishes. However, estimates put the total Russian casualties at around 130,000. At the beginning of the war, when intense fighting was a daily occurrence, the number of soldiers who perished daily was much higher. Since the winter months have begun in Ukraine, the fighting has slowed as both sides prepare for the coming offensives in spring. However, even while taking up defensive positions until the next phase of the war, long-range strikes have continued causing the deaths of both soldiers and civilians. Most estimates suggest that around 100,000 Ukraine soldiers have either been killed or wounded during the conflict. The number is most likely less than the number of Russian casualties, but the loss of life on each side is astounding. As you watch this video, there's a good chance that the number of casualties has just increased on at least one of the sides of the war. Perhaps the most insane statistic coming out of the war in Ukraine is the number of artillery shells that have been fired over the past year. It's estimated that Ukraine was firing between 4,000 and 7,000 artillery shells a day during the initial months of the invasion. This number has been dialed back due to the reduction in fighting during the winter and the dwindling supply of artillery shells, but even conservative estimates put the number of shells fired thus far by Ukraine at well over 1 million. Now let's look at the number of artillery rounds fired. At the beginning of the war, Russia had the second largest military in the world, at least on paper. But as we've seen, having a large military doesn't necessarily mean you have a strong military. What it does mean is that you have a lot of weapons, and in Russia's case, a massive amount of artillery and ammunition. 
Estimates vary on how many shells Russia fired during the first months of intense fighting in Ukraine, but around 20,000 a day seems to be somewhat of an average. Some reports suggest it might have been as high as 60,000 shells per day, while some others suggest closer to 10,000. Either way, Russia has been firing many more shells than Ukraine has. If we take the average estimate, it means that Russia's fired somewhere around 5 million artillery rounds over the last year, and the actual number might be much higher. This is an incredible statistic and it should come as no surprise that both Russia and Ukraine are running low on artillery shells. However, unlike guided missiles and drones, artillery ammunition is relatively easy to make, which means more and more are produced every day. But artillery shells are not the only thing running low. Each side has lost a number of vehicles as well. However, Russia seems to be winning the race of who can lose more military equipment during the war. So, how much equipment has actually been lost? As the first year of the war comes to a close, estimates put Russia way ahead in the amount of equipment destroyed or captured over the past 12 months. Conservatively, we're looking at around 9,000 individual pieces of equipment lost by Russia, compared to around 3,000 for Ukraine. The specific type of equipment varies wildly from armored vehicles to naval ships. What will become apparent is that Ukrainian forces are incredibly efficient at destroying Russian equipment. Even when Ukraine loses military assets, they end up destroying many more high-profile targets in the trade against Russia. No matter what Putin says, his forces are not winning many battles. They are not defeating Ukrainian forces, and they are most certainly not in any position to win the war as we approach the one-year anniversary of the invasion. At the beginning of the war, Russia was reported to have around 3,300 tanks ready for battle. The number of tanks in reserve was estimated to be around 12,000. Ukraine, on the other hand, had fewer than 2,000 tanks altogether. This is one of the reasons why the world assumed Ukraine didn't stand a chance when Russian forces rolled in. However, one of the biggest defeats that Ukraine has dealt Russia over the last year is the destruction or capture of hundreds of tanks. It's estimated that Russia has lost over 1,600 tanks during the conflict thus far. This has led them to dust off decades-old Soviet-era tanks, which are even easier to destroy. Ukrainian forces have been using javelins and other anti-tank weapons provided by the West to decimate Russian tank numbers. However, Russian incompetence has also led to hundreds of tanks being abandoned due to mechanical problems, running out of fuel, or just getting stuck. When this happens, Ukrainian forces are all too happy to take the Russian tanks off the enemy's hands and repurpose them for their own use. Ukraine is estimated to have lost around 800 tanks. This stark contrast in tank losses shows just how badly the first year of the war in Ukraine is going for Russia. Recently, the United States has pledged to send around 31 M1 Abrams to Ukraine, one of the most sophisticated tanks in the world, which will only result in more Russian losses. The one aspect of the war where Russia seems to have sustained fewer losses than Ukraine is in air and sea craft. This is one of the reasons why Ukraine has been pleading with the West to send more surface-to-air missiles and other anti-air defense systems. As it stands, Ukraine has lost somewhere around 210 aircraft, while Russia has lost approximately 200. This isn't a huge difference, but the Russian Air Force is much larger than the Ukrainian Air Force, meaning that the losses are likely felt much more by Ukraine. However, if we count the number of drones that Ukraine has shot down, the number of aircraft lost by Russia is closer to 600, so it's difficult to tell exactly who's coming out ahead in this aspect of the war. Unfortunately, even though Ukraine has had success with destroying Russia's aerial vessels, both missiles and drones have decimated the country's infrastructure during the winter months of the war. Also, it's estimated that Russia has purchased somewhere around 1,700 Sahed-136 Kamikaze drones from Iran, so the number of drone losses just from flying them into targets is going to be high for Russia. That being said, Ukraine has purchased 700 Switchblade Kamikaze drones from the United States, which means the number of drones they have lost or will lose in the future will be high as well. On the seas, Ukraine has done a lot of damage to Russia's Black Sea Fleet. They've even managed to sink the Russian flagship Moskva, a guided missile cruiser operating off the coast of Snake Island. Ukraine has destroyed at least five Raptor-class patrol boats, a number of landing ships, and corvettes as well. In total, Ukrainian forces have managed to damage or sink at least 12 ships in the Black Sea Fleet. Conversely, Russia has destroyed around 30 Ukrainian boats. However, it's important to note that many of these vessels were regular ships converted for wartime purposes, along with several unmanned surface vessels. So although Russia has destroyed more Ukrainian vessels overall, the types of vessels are very different. What this means is that overall, Ukraine has caused a lot more disruption to the Russian Navy than vice versa. This brings us to another huge number. War is expensive, and both sides have spent pretty massive amounts of money to purchase weapons, munitions, and in Russia's case, pay mercenaries. So how much money has been lost in terms of vehicles, ammo, and men in the war? Some estimates put the money lost due to destroyed equipment at around $18 billion for Russia alone. 
This is an astounding number, but the equipment lost is from all walks of life. Russia is using everything from Cold War technology to modern weapons. However, $18 billion in equipment losses in just 12 months really puts things into perspective on how expensive this war has become. Ukraine has lost a lot of equipment on its own, but they are definitely receiving more outside aid than Russia. The United States has sent more money to Ukraine over the last year than any other nation. The Biden administration alone has sent just under $25 billion. But even before the war began, the US was sending aid to Ukraine so it could protect itself from the exact situation that's happening today. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough and obviously came a little too late. Around 48% of aid sent to Ukraine has been for military purposes, such as purchasing equipment and weapons. Almost $10 billion has gone to training and weapon logistics, while another $15 billion has been sent as economic support. $10 billion has also been sent for humanitarian aid, which is not nearly enough to support the countless people who have lost everything as a result of war. And speaking of money, Russia's economy is reaching a tipping point as the first year of the war comes to an end. Russia was able to sustain itself during the beginning of the war, even as crushing sanctions caused supply and cash flow issues. Its ability to continue selling oil and other fossil fuels to countries like China, India, and much of Europe meant it could still fund its war effort. As we pass the one-year anniversary of the war, it appears cash reserves are running low. It's unclear how much longer Russia will be able to continue funding its wartime operations, although there's a lot of economic data to look at. Russia's GDP had dropped by about 4% over the past year, and it seems as if this decline will continue and become much worse in the months to come. But even though Ukraine's economy is also in turmoil, they have a lot more support than Russia does. When we look at the number of nations that support each side of the war a year in, things have shifted slightly. When the invasion started, NATO nations were hesitant to be too vocal about backing Ukraine. Sure, they condemned the invasion and eventually placed economic sanctions on Russia, but when it wasn't clear if Ukraine would be able to stop the invasion, many countries were afraid of Russia. They thought that if Putin could claim Ukraine, there's a chance he wouldn't stop his expansion there. Certain countries around the world and in Europe remained silent as the massacre of Ukrainian people commenced in the early weeks of the war. However, once the tide shifted and it was clear Ukraine would not only stop the invasion but would have a good shot at winning the war, more nations came out of the woodwork to support Ukraine. After one year of fighting, 40 countries have openly supported Ukraine. Members of the EU, G7, and NATO all support Ukraine, and many have sent aid in one form or another. Australia, South Korea, Taiwan, and India have also made it clear they are behind Ukraine. Russia has much less support. There are only eight countries that openly support Russia and its invasion of Ukraine. They're Belarus, North Korea, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Syria, Myanmar, and Eritrea. Although these supporters are becoming less and less vocal as it looks like Russia might actually lose this war. It's important to note that even countries who vocally speak out against Russia in this war are still fueling their war machine through trade. The world is a global economy, and Russia provides a lot of different nations with resources such as fossil fuels. Just because its president launched a war and his troops are committing war crimes doesn't mean every nation will cut its ties with Russia. As terrible as that is, certain nations still need Russia and its resources to provide energy and food to their own citizens. But what about all the people trying to get away from the war? One year after Russia's invasion, one of the most shocking statistics is just how many refugees this war has created. Obviously, there are a lot more Ukrainian refugees fleeing the war than Russian refugees, but the sad truth is both countries are experiencing a mass exodus of people. Ukrainians are leaving their country because they have no choice. War has left millions without power, running water, or food. The chances of dying from a rogue missile or kamikaze drone are high. And at the beginning of the war, there was a very real possibility that if you were a Ukrainian citizen in Russian-occupied towns, you could be shipped back to Russia to work in labor camps, forced to aid the enemy, or brutally tortured and killed. Therefore, it's no surprise that many Ukrainians fled their country and sought asylum in neighboring nations. Over 17.9 million Ukrainian refugees have crossed nearby borders to escape the war. Poland now contains the most Ukrainian refugees out of any other country in the region, with close to 9.2 million Ukrainians crossing its border alone. Hungary, Slovenia, and Romania are also housing large populations of refugees as well. No single country is equipped to take in millions of people during a time of war, so many refugees are being sent to other European countries to wait for the end of the conflict. Unfortunately, we have no idea how long it'll be. It's been a year, and there seems to be no end in sight. Ukraine is closer to pushing Russia out of their territory now than at any other point during the war, but the fight for southern Ukraine and the Crimean Peninsula is sure to be a bloody and drawn-out one. 
But Ukraine is not the only country that people are fleeing because of the conflict. Russian citizens are crossing borders to get away from Vladimir Putin and his deadly war as well. It's estimated around 700,000 Russians have fled their country for various reasons since the war started. Some people want to get out because they disagree with the war and the way Putin is running the nation. Others left for countries that could provide jobs and opportunities as Russia's entire economy and industry has been converted into a wartime enterprise. Young men left their homes for foreign countries to escape being conscripted into the military. At this point, being a conscript is about the same as a death sentence. They're being sent to the front lines with minimal training and no combat experience. These men are handed guns and told to die for their country. However, many don't feel very patriotic anymore and would rather take their chances as refugees. Many Russians are fleeing to Kazakhstan, Serbia, Turkey and the United Arab Emirates, Georgia and Finland. They aren't always welcomed with open arms, but if they are sent back to Russia, it's more than likely they will either be sent to the front lines or thrown in jail for a very, very long time. Numbers don't lie, and the statistics coming out of Ukraine and Russia highly suggest that Ukraine is winning the war. This is not the story that the Russian people are being told, and since Putin controls the media and all information disseminated in the country, Russians don't have access to the data that the free world does. One year after Russia invaded Ukraine, things have not gone well for the aggressor. Russia has lost more men, equipment, and money than Ukraine, while it has less aid, support, and friends than Ukraine. The war is likely to continue for at least several more months after the one-year anniversary of the invasion. If Ukraine launches a successful offensive into the Kherson Oblast and takes Crimea, the war will be all but lost for Putin. In the coming months, we'll need to keep an eye on the number of soldiers each side loses. The number of vehicles and aircraft lost will also help measure which side has an advantage when the spring offensives are launched. The tragic part is that as the war continues, the number of civilian casualties and refugees will only continue to increase. We can only hope that we won't need to make another another one of these videos on the two-year anniversary of the war. Want to learn how to make videos like us? Find out after the video how we use insights from vidIQ as our secret YouTube weapon and get a 98% discount. You heard that right, 98% off. But you've got to stick around to the end of the video to find out how you can try vidIQ for yourself for just $1 for 30 days and start making your own hit YouTube videos in no time. One year into the war in Ukraine and Russia is facing the greatest challenges it's faced over 40 years. But new developments might just doom its efforts to win in Ukraine. When it comes to Russia's problems in Ukraine, the list is exhaustive. But lately, one problem has been hampering its efforts to launch the dreaded spring offensive most Western analysts had feared would come. The Russian Ministry of Defense has done a good job of pumping out a steady stream of propaganda fuel meant to paint a widely inaccurate picture of the situation in Ukraine. According to Russian MOD videos put out on a nearly daily basis, Russian troops are on the move across the east, steadily pushing back overwhelmed Ukrainian forces as they break under the weight of Russian tanks and helicopters. When not showing heavily edited videos of their troops engaged in glorious combat, the Russian MOD shares videos of one of their fancy statues decapitating America's Lady Liberty in a one-on-one -on -one duel. Russia's taken internet tough guy to a completely different level. But videos coming from the troops themselves paint a wildly different picture of the situation on the ground for the Russian army. Since last fall, a steady stream of videos made by troops requesting aid from various government officials have hit the internet. The format's always the same. A group of Russian soldiers stands together, typically hiding their faces for fear of reprisal, and then they record a video airing their grievances. Обращение в военную прокуратуру Российской Федерации и Министерство обороны Российской Федерации. Мы мобилизованы из Тюменской области, были призваны осенью и зачислены в батальон 1641 Росомаха, где проходили обучение в течение 3-5 месяцев по своим должностям. По приезду на Украину 4-я рота была раскидана по частям ДНР и смена наших вузов без нашего согласия. These grievances are pretty much the same, like in the previous video where the mobilized soldiers receive specialized training only to be thrown straight into the front lines upon arriving in Ukraine. It's a complaint that is increasingly common as the 300,000 conscripts mobilized by Russia in response to Ukraine's stunningly successful counteroffensive have been joining the war in force. Initially, a group of these mobics were simply thrown directly to the front with little to no training. We've got this shit for training. F knows what kind of house we're at. Three armor piercing cartridges. F we're in Svatov, you guys. 
Luhansk. What region? Luhansk region. We are mobilized. We don't have to be here at all. 11 days from when we were deployed. We left Moscow 11 days ago. How many times did you shoot already? Once. Three bullet cartridges. This wasn't an accident, though. It was the same type of sadistic tactical thinking that's prevailed in Russia since the earliest days of the Soviet Union. With the front line across the north of the country collapsing, Russia needed to throw bodies at the problem until the line stabilized, and it accomplished this, sacrificing as many as an estimated 25,000 mobilized conscripts who'd received at best a week of training. In Russia, life is cheap, and sacrificing men for time is simple strategic doctrine for Russian commanders. As the wars progressed, a steady stream of videos from Russians complaining about their situation has hit the internet. The intent is typically a cry for help. Men mobilized with little training, either complaining about a lack of leadership, equipment, or about being trained in one specialty only to be used as cannon fodder. Some Russian soldiers have even been transferred under the command of separatist units and inevitably being used as disposable cannon fodder to soften up Ukrainian positions. Обращаются к вам мобилизованные Иркутской области полка 1439, отправленные в ДНР с города Новосибирска 31 декабря 22 года. Просим посодействовать и разобраться с беззаконным и преступными приказами нашего командования. Они заключаются в том, что нас передали в подчинение первой славянской бригаде ДНР, где из нас солдат. The soldiers typically complain of lacking equipment or proper support, and then in the previous video of literally being called disposable by their new commanders. The videos are almost always directed at President Vladimir Putin himself or some other authority from their home region. What's especially pathetic is the belief by these troops that Vladimir Putin gives a single damn about any of them and would respond to these videos with anything but immediate punishment. In fact, we have multiple reports of Russian soldiers being imprisoned for refusing to follow orders that would send them to their deaths or recording similar videos calling for help. No matter how hard Russia tries to hide the truth from its population, though, news of how bad things are going inevitably reach back home. Soldiers are increasingly having their phones confiscated upon entering Ukraine, but many of them simply hide them or write highly critical letters back home. Others steal Ukrainian phones to dial home with. The wounded also bring stories back to the home front of just how bad conditions are in Ukraine. This inevitably has even led Russian citizens to making the same style of videos publicly asking for help. More often than not, the videos are addressed to local politicians, such as in this one recorded by the wives of men mobilized and sent to fight against armored vehicles and even tanks with little heavy equipment to support them. We, the mobilized city of Bysk, our husbands, commanded by the 55th Brigade, the Republic of Tiva, the city of Kizil. Ротный Маклаков, мобилизованный из города Биска, командир Кочнев. Просим отозвать наших мужей с линии соприкосновений село Житловка. Unsurprisingly, some of these videos are addressed by concerned wives directly to the commander-in-chief himself. Like in this video, where the women say that they've been ignored by their local authorities. They even complain of having been blocked on the popular Telegram app by both local politicians and the Russian Ministry of Defense. The women complain of a lack of training for their mobilized men and of the extremely unsanitary conditions on the Ukrainian front. Men with chronic diseases are not receiving adequate care, and the women feel that they have no recourse but to appeal to Putin himself. In another video, wives of men attached to DPR separatist forces complain of their men purposefully being used as cannon fodder, while the DPR forces themselves don't commit any of their men to such dangerous assaults. Мы надеемся на вашу помощь. Наши мужья и сыновья были прикомандированы к одной из частей армии в Донецкой Народной Республике, после чего жены стали получать тревожные звонки от своих мужей, в каждом из которых… The callous disregard for the lives of Russian soldiers is staggering. A Western unit being placed under the command of a foreign force and then used as cannon fodder would be enough to start a riot back home. Good thing democracy is fake in Russia or else Putin would be in hot water come this next election cycle. The steady stream of videos from both men at the front and their wives and mothers back home are all eating away at Russian civilian morale. Just like their military, a civilian population's morale is critical to a successful campaign. As a demoralized population will become increasingly harder to control, let alone mobilize and order into combat. But complaints from the front aren't the only bad news Russia is dealing with, as the military itself is narrowly avoiding all-out war against… itself? For months now, the Wagner mercenary group 
now officially labeled a terrorist organization by the United States for their many human rights abuses, has been leading the charge across the East. What few successes Russia has had against determined Ukrainian defenders have largely been thanks to Wagner, but now it looks as if Wagner and the Russian military are on the splits, and it's causing more damage than the Kanye-Kim K split. Wagner leader and shoe-in for Lurch in a Russian remake of Adam's Family, Yevgeny Prigozhin, has famously been beefing like a butcher with the entire Russian military establishment, claiming that it was his force that stemmed the Ukrainian onslaught last autumn. Prigozhin, who has a face for radio, has been clearly making a serious power play in the Kremlin. Most analysts believe he wishes to be appointed Minister of Defense, replacing resident bad boy, and we mean bad as in he's terrible at his job, Sergei Shoigu. Thus, Prigozhin has been using his access to Putin and his successes on the battlefield to try to diminish and belittle Shoigu and the Russian military on the whole. But it seems Prigozhin bit off more borscht than he could chew, and now Shoigu seems to have all but neutered Wagner inside of Ukraine. The drama started to unfold with the taking of Solidar, a minor town that Russia hailed as a military victory of the millennium. And to be fair, for the Russians, taking a small salt mining town successfully really was the victory of the millennium. Wagner claimed responsibility for the victory, even posting a photo of themselves inside one of the salt mines. However, the Russian MOD announced that it had been the Russian military, not Wagner, who had accomplished this great feat of which military historians will speak about for days to come. Prigozhin's dreams of being compared to the likes of Alexander the Great for taking a salt mine would crumble like, well, salt, as the MOD took all the credit. Evidence strongly suggests that it had indeed been Wagner, using human wave attacks of recruited prisoners, who had in fact been largely responsible for taking the town. However, it's likely that the MOD badly needed a propaganda victory to prove to the population back home that its military was not, in fact, complete clown shoes. It's even more likely, however, that Shoigu was finally launching a counterattack against Prigozhin's political machinations. To the surprise of everyone, but probably not one more than Prigozhin himself, Putin seemed to back up Shoigu, and Wagner's contributions to the victory were quickly erased from Russian media. In fact, most mentions of Wagner began to disappear from Russian media, and it wasn't long after that that reports of Wagner being shunned on the battlefield began to surface. According to Wagner officials, the Russian army has refused to share supplies with Wagner or even support their assaults with artillery. It seems like Shoigu has set out to destroy his political rival, but that hasn't stopped Rogozhin and his well-funded Wagner PMC from continuing to claim victories, especially around Bakhmut. Recently, Wagner announced it had captured several villages outside of Bakhmut itself, which came as a great surprise to the Ukrainian soldiers currently sitting in those villages, defending them. Prigozhin, which has long enjoyed Putin's close support, has seemingly been put out in the cold. But did Prigozhin miscalculate the relationship between Shoigu and Putin? Or were his constant complaints about the Russian military even too much for Putin to take? Having an insider criticize the military in a way that no propagandist on Russian TV would dare to was likely too much for Putin to continue to allow. But it's also possible that Putin doesn't truly favor Shoigu or Prigozhin over the other. For a dictator, the only thing more important than ensuring the loyalty of the men under you is ensuring that they hate each other even more. That's the only way to prevent a palace coup. And given the increasing cost to Russia from Putin's disastrous invasion, a coup is very likely high on his list of worries at the moment. Complaining soldiers, citizens taking to the internet to publicly air their grievances, and now the Russian military beefing with the most successful part of the Russian invasion. With all the problems facing Putin, the West just added a 60-ton complication. At the start of the war, Ukraine immediately requested heavy equipment such as tanks. The West was slow to respond, then gradually rounded up as many Soviet-era tanks as they could wrangle from NATO's Eastern European counterparts. It was clear that those would soon run out, though. And despite many extremely generous donations by the Russians themselves, Ukraine would need a continual and steady supply of tanks. This left only one option, modern Western vehicles. But many in the West immediately browned themselves at the thought of making Vladi Dadi angry by giving Ukraine the tools it needed to defend itself and stop the slaughter of civilians. Slowly, gradually, and despite an incessant stream of threats about escalation, the West at last decided to supply Ukraine with main battle tanks. Now, an estimated 100 Leopard 2s and American Abrams are on their way to Ukraine and, after training, will be on the battlefield by the start of the summer. The US Abrams will take longer to deliver and train on, but the Leopard 1s and Leopard 2s are already in the hands of Ukrainian tank crews training in Poland. While the tanks being sent lack many of the most sophisticated and classified features of those in use by Western armies, they are still a considerable threat to Russia. 
The US said it'll be stripping the secretive depleted uranium armor used in its tanks and replacing it likely with titanium composite. However, even with the downgraded armor, Western tanks are in effect punching down versus Russia's dwindling stockpile of armored vehicles. Recent reports state that Russia has started fielding T-62s in large numbers, and while Russia will continue to enjoy the numbers advantage, Ukraine will soon enjoy the quality advantage. And quality means a lot here because a Leopard 2 against a T-62 is like pitting a bare-knuckle boxing champion against a senile geriatric with hip issues. Russia is thus trying to do its best to destroy these Western tanks before they even get to Ukraine by targeting you. Putin knows that he can't defeat large numbers of Western tanks on the battlefield, so instead, he's turned to feeding the West a steady diet of propaganda and fear-mongering. He knows the West fears he will escalate to the use of nuclear weapons, and thus has worked hard to make sure the word escalation has been on the lips of every Western news anchor. At this point, if you turn the lights off and say the word escalation three times into a mirror, a bloody apparition of Vladimir Putin will appear and threaten to nuke you. Putin's only chance to defeat Western weapons is to make sure they are never sent at all. Which is bad news, as it appears that the West is slowly unbrowning their collective panties and starting to send Ukraine the weapons it needs to end the war. With the first delivery of 100 tanks, nations like the US have strongly hinted at ongoing support, which Ukraine will need as battlefield losses mount. Western tanks might be far more capable than what Russia is currently fielding, but inevitably these tanks will be damaged or destroyed, which is why it's critical that the West continue to deliver replacements for the duration of the war. The tank that makes the most sense to send is the Leopard 2, but sadly most European countries are reluctant to deplete their own stockpiles in case of a war, which we're forced to ask the question, uh, what war exactly? Putin's forces are already heavily embroiled in Ukraine, and if his military is unable to conquer even the east of Ukraine, we doubt the Russian T-72s are going to be rolling past the Eiffel Tower and into Madrid anytime soon, so maybe the Western NATO states need to start asking themselves what war exactly do they think they need tanks for when Ukraine is literally holding the line on the war they fear. Ironically, the NATO members most at risk of Russian aggression have been the ones to be the most generous with their support. The Baltic states and Poland have been pulling a great deal of their own equipment from active surface to send to Ukraine with Poland threatening to send its leopards to Ukraine even without Germany's approval. Poland's been so proactive that when at the start of the war Europe said it would make Putin sad if they supplied Ukraine with jets, Poland went ahead and sent MiG fighters under the guise of spare parts. Slowly but surely, the West is losing its fear of hurting Putin's feelings, and the announcement of tanks for Ukraine was followed by another shipment of HIMARS from the US. Included in new shipments are long-range munitions capable of striking deep behind enemy lines exactly the type of weapons Ukraine has been asking for since the war began. An aid package announced at the start of February included the US's ground-launched Small Diameter Bomb, or GLSDB. This weapon has a range of up to 93 miles and consists of a 250-pound bomb attached to a rocket booster. Boosted high up into the sky, the bomb detaches from the spent rocket and deploys wings that it uses to glide to its target, resulting in a greatly extended range. This will nearly double Ukraine's current HIMARS range, and can be fired from existing HIMARS units or MLRS systems. The bomb itself was the result of the US having entirely too many 250-pound bombs just lying around. At some point, someone, probably from Georgia or Alabama, got the idea to strap all these spare bombs to a rocket and then give them wings, and the results speak for themselves. The bombs are precision-guided with jam-resistant GPS technology and come in the high-explosive fragmentation or bunker-busting varieties. These weapons will allow Ukraine to push Russian logistics even further away from the front lines, slowing down the ability to launch offensives even more. By making resupply difficult, Ukraine can overwhelm Russian units on the front despite their superior numbers. But just as importantly, it'll force Russian air defenses to attempt to shoot down these bombs, expending valuable air defense missiles. With tanks on their way, Ukraine has taken to breaking down the remaining barriers to giving Ukraine the fighter jets it's been asking for. While Ukraine would never get top-of-the-line Western jets like the F-35, even F-16s would be a significant threat to the Russian Air Force, and as one of the most successful aircraft ever built, there's thousands of F-16s that could potentially be sent to Ukraine. But Ukraine has asked for only 200 of them, and even that's a bold figure given how reluctant the West has been to give anything but small arms. Opposition to sending the F-16 to Ukraine is currently strong, but many countries have signaled a willingness to send jets. As of February 22nd, the US was firmly rejecting the idea of sending any F-16s. 
But just like the tanks seemed an impossibility at one point, odds are that as the war drags on, Western jets will make an appearance in the skies over Ukraine. With Western jets, Ukraine could challenge Russia's air forces and prevent at least some of the attacks launched against its civilian population. Trying to operate them on the front would be foolhardy, but armed with standoff weapons of their own, F-16s or similar platforms could significantly increase the reach of Ukrainian weapons. It would also prevent Russia from operating close to the front itself, where it's enjoyed greater use of air support than Ukraine. Putin's problems are numerous and seem to be growing by the day. Sadly, though, the longer the West hesitates to send weapons to Ukraine, the more Ukrainian soldiers and civilians die at the hands of the Russian invaders. Now, are you wondering how we come up with the ideas for videos? It's all thanks to vidIQ. vidIQ is a super powerful YouTube tool that basically acts like a cheat code for picking video topics. With vidIQ, you can see exactly how many people are searching for a topic each month, how much competition there is for that topic from other creators, and what videos from those creators are trending. Put all that information together and you can find the perfect video, like we did hopefully with this one. So go check it out for yourself and get vidIQ for just $1 for 30 days. That's 98% off the regular price, but only at vidIQ.com slash the info show. Battle for Kyiv was supposed to take a few days, a week at the most. Spearheading the assault was Russia's vaunted paratroopers, forces so revered in Russia that they have their own holiday. Yet within 48 hours it was clear the air assault on Kyiv had failed, with terrible losses amongst Russia's elite troops. And for weeks after, the Russian column attempting to enter the Ukrainian capital suffered devastating counterattacks after counterattack as it struggled to meet basic resupply needs. Eventually, Russia declared defeat and retreated, using troops aimed at the heart of the Ukrainian nation to instead reinforce the fight in the east. But what if the assault on Kyiv had succeeded? What if the war in the east fails for Ukraine? What will happen if Russia formally annexes the breakaway Soviet Republic and brings it once more back into the fold? The current Russian offensive seems to have dramatically redefined goals. At the start of the war, it was clear that Russia was attempting a decapitation strike on the Ukrainian capital, hoping to subdue the nation in days and install a puppet leader. When the assault on Kyiv failed, the Russian goals were redefined and a settlement of sorts appears to have been reached. Instead of taking the entire nation and turning into a Russian proxy like Belarus, Russia appears to be satisfied with first taking the Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Then Russian efforts have been focused on seizing a land corridor to Crimea and securing the Dnipro River. This this will allow Russian-occupied Crimea to no longer be at the mercy of Ukraine, which in the past had cut off the peninsula from vital freshwater supplies by building a dam. The move caused Crimea's agricultural industry to shrink dramatically and greatly limited the economic opportunities available to Russian investors there. It's currently questionable if Russia can maintain its hold on these regions, though. As of the making of this video, Ukraine is launching a brutal counterattack across the southeastern part of the nation and is within striking distance of Kherson. Taking Kherson would give Ukrainian forces an easy crossing point across the Dnipro River and also allow them to base aircraft and long-range artillery, such as the American HIMARS, to attack against targets inside Crimea. Kherson would also allow the Ukrainian military to threaten Russian ships inside the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov with long-range anti-ship missiles, tech which is still being provided to Ukraine by the West. This counterattack would not have been possible without the aid of U.S. long-range attack platforms such as HIMARS and the TACOM, which allow Ukrainian forces to finally threaten Russian forces with deep strikes. For two months, Ukraine used its Western weapons to destroy supply and movement routes, such as blowing up the bridges outside of Kherson on the eastern side of the city, and to strike at ammunition depots and command posts. The effect was telling, with the Russian military being forced to move its supply centers further away from the front, greatly increasing the time required for resupply of combat troops and slowing any combat operations they might attempt to undertake. The loss of many senior command staff to deep strikes has also had a severe effect on both morale and the Russian military's ability to fight, limiting the scope of its combined arms operations. If Russia was to take the whole of Ukraine, it would first need to cut off the flow of Western weapons into the nation. Yet Russia has little to no political capital left to influence Western powers to cease supplying Ukraine, and its attempts to bully Europe into submission by cutting down on gas supplies has done little to stop the flow of advanced weapons into the Ukrainians. In fact, the supply of Western weapons has only increased in both numbers and scope, with the American Congress approving the training of Ukrainian pilots to fly the F-15 Eagle. In six months' time, it's extremely likely that the Ukrainian Air Force will be operating American F-15s armed with advanced medium-range anti-air and anti-radiation missiles, putting Russian control of the skies in serious jeopardy. Meanwhile, Russia's own stockpiles of modern weapons are running out, and with sanctions of high-tech materials such as semiconductors, the Russian defense industry is unable to replace advanced modern weapon systems. To take Ukraine, 
Russia would somehow have to completely reverse the political and strategic picture, a frankly impossible event. As there is no realistic scenario where Russia succeeds in taking the whole of Ukraine, we still have to suspend disbelief and imagine what would happen if this somehow happened. The very first thing that would happen if Russia took the whole of Ukraine is it would make Moldova incredibly nervous. Transnistra is a breakaway region along Moldova's border with Ukraine that has strong ties to Russia and the old Soviet Union. In fact, Russia maintains a very small contingent of troops there to act as peacekeeping forces after a brief conflict between Moldova and the breakaway region. During the early weeks of the war in Ukraine, it became apparent to many observers that Russia was attempting to push deep through the south of Ukraine to Odessa, even bombarding Odessa in preparation for an assault. But this push wasn't just to take the strategically important port city, but also to facilitate the creation of a Russian-controlled corridor extending all the way to Transnistra, giving the Russians access to Moldova. If Ukraine were to fall to Russia, Moldova would inevitably be next. Moldova is technically a neutral state, fearing Russian reprisal if it were to make a bid to join NATO. As such, it's not protected by the organization's defense commitment and would be easy pickings for the Russian military. Taking Moldova would allow Russian forces to create an even larger buffer in the south between itself and NATO in case of war. And from military bases in the country, it could threaten most of the Black Sea with long-range attack munitions, a very important capability for Russia as in any conflict with NATO, the weak Russian Black Sea Fleet would be destroyed rather quickly. With so much territory to buffer NATO with in the south, it would allow Russia to concentrate more forces along its border with the Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, putting more pressure on those breakaway republics and seriously threatening them in case of war. Of course, now that Sweden and Finland are in the process of joining NATO, being able to reinforce its northern borders is of even greater importance for Russia. Just remember that if you've ever had a bad day, at least you're not the Russian leader who dedicated his life to destroying NATO and ended up making making it even stronger. Control over Ukraine would help Russia counter NATO's ability to project air and naval power into the Black Sea. It would in effect leave Russia with full control over the entire northern coastline, and most of its eastern coast as well thanks to the military occupation of regions of Georgia. From bases along the coast, Russia could use its land forces to make up for its relative naval weakness and shut the Black Sea off to NATO fleets under threat of great loss of both life and ships. However, of even greater importance would be Russia's rights to the vast oil and natural gas reserves hiding under the Black Sea, large amounts of which are currently under Ukraine's claimed economic exclusion zone. The taking of Crimea by Russia in 2014 gave it access to a good chunk of those reserves, but taking all of Ukraine's southern coast would place a significant amount of those reserves in Russian hands. Having access to these vast new reserves would make Russia an even greater energy superpower than it currently is, and with energy fueling the majority of the Russian economy, it can be argued that seizing these reserves is not only a goal, but perhaps a matter of national economic survival. What is certain, though, is that the acquisition of approximately half of the Black Sea's energy reserves would give Russia significantly more leverage over the West, while denying it the economic bounty lurking under the waves. The Black Sea isn't the only strategically important water feature that Russia is seeking to control from an invasion of Ukraine. The Sea of Azov has historically been of extreme importance to regional powers because of its economic interests. Control over the Sea of Azov has resulted in conflicts that have raged over a millennia, and the state that has managed to control both sides of the Kirk Straits has reaped great economic rewards from doing so as the sea is a vital trade artery. As the world has discovered in recent months, Ukraine is vitally important for two other reasons. It's one of the largest suppliers of sunflower oil and grain in the world. In fact, it's the biggest supplier of sunflower oil on the planet, and the nation provides a whopping 40% of the World Food Program's wheat supply. Thanks to the war, both of these badly needed foodstuffs have been threatened, leaving populations in developing nations under threat of famine and starvation. The situation had become so serious that eventually Russia was forced to allow the shipping of Ukrainian grain via Turkish proxies bringing much-needed food relief to places such as Africa. If Russia were to control Ukraine, it would be in control of a significant amount of not just the world's energy supply, but also its food supply. This would put Russia in a position of considerable leverage over Western nations it currently sees as rivals by putting pressure on two different critical areas, food and energy. Already, Russia has attempted to deny exports of Ukrainian wheat so as to influence global opinion against the West, having some success in turning public opinion in developing nations against the Western powers and attempting to leverage this pressure to ease sanctions on itself and halt supplies of weapons to Ukraine. To many suffering from food security issues, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a European matter that shouldn't affect them, and the West is seen as making a bad situation worse by leveraging heavy sanctions against Russia and providing weapons to Ukraine, both of which are extending the war and preventing food from being shipped through the Black Sea. Russia's control over the whole of Ukraine would inevitably see the West turn away from its reliance on Russia for not just energy but food as well. While this would be a very good strategic move, 
helping to erode Russia's own strategic advantages, it would inevitably result in higher food prices as demand for food from elsewhere skyrockets. It would also inevitably lead to the expansion of farmland across the West or in other nations, prompting great amounts of ecological destruction. Perhaps the greatest effect of a Russian annexation of Ukraine, however, would be dramatic reshaping of the strategic picture in Europe itself. Russia would have returned a significant amount of former Soviet territory into the fold, and would be able to deploy forces to threaten NATO across the southern European plain. This would give NATO a much broader front to fight Russia on in case of a war, and erode NATO's ability to launch deep penetration assaults that seek to end a war with Russia quickly. From bases in Ukraine, Russian forces could threaten a significant number of NATO airfields and military bases with long-range attack munitions as well. The greatest victory, however, would be psychological, as Russia throws off three decades of slow decay and proves to the world that it's once more a formidable global power. This would have immediate ramifications for neighboring states such as the Baltic countries, which Russia has made no secret it wishes were back under its fold. Faced with a dramatically evolved strategic picture, NATO might need to rethink guaranteeing the security of states it's already poorly capable of defending in case of war, granting Russia yet another major geopolitical victory. Russia's stockpiles of drones and missiles are running dangerously low. One recent estimate puts Russia's cruise missile stockpile as low as 120 out of the 2,000 it began the war with. But Iran is now coming to the rescue, supplying Russia with all the drones and missiles it needs to hit every civilian target in Ukraine. But what exactly does Iran get out of helping Russia? Iran and Russia are both countries with few real friends. While there are several countries who tolerate or feign close relations with Russia, none of them were willing to offer more than token support for Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Similarly, Iran is also a country with few friends. It might have some legitimate political beef with the United States after decades of it propping up a dictatorship in the country, but Iran is sort of like the most hated kid in school because it's pissed off every single one of its neighbors. Israel tops the list of Iranian enemies, but while the rest of the Middle East has gradually gotten off the death to Israel bandwagon that was so popular up until the 80s, Iran refuses to let old fads die. To this day, Iran remains the only major power in the region who seriously wishes to see Israel destroyed. But Iran's antagonism has worn thin on the nerves of its other neighbors too. Saudi Arabia and Iran have famously been relationship status frowny face with each other for decades, and it doesn't help that Saudi Arabia's favorite hobby is to antagonize Iran and then hide under America's skirts. Jordan and numerous other countries are also pretty tired of Iran and have threatened to pursue their own nuclear program should Iran get the bomb. The first and most obvious thing that Iran gets out of helping Russia take even longer to lose the war in Ukraine is making a friend. Russia and Iran, along with North Korea, are sort of like your high school edgelords, pretending they don't want anything to do with the cool kids while secretly all three would faint if America the prom king asked them to the big dance. Surprisingly though, that doesn't mean they're besties, despite it being very obvious that to survive they should stick together. For starters, Iran had a very rocky relationship with the Soviet Union. On the one hand, both of them had their same favorite band, Death to America, with their self-titled smash hit Death to America, but on the other hand, Iran was a religious fundamentalist autocratic tyranny, while the Soviet Union was an atheistic nationalist autocratic tyranny. Like star-crossed lovers, their similarities ran as deep as their dissimilarities. This made things difficult for the religious fundamentalist Iranians, who thought it was a sin to do business with atheists. There were more practical concerns for the Iranians, though. The Soviet Union was an arms exporting powerhouse during the Cold War, as long as a single citizen had even the faintest anti-American thought. The Soviet Union would be practically drowning your country in military hardware. Iran gladly bought up all the exports the Soviet Union would give it. There was one huge sticking point between the two would-be BFFs. Like that guy all your friends warned you about, the Soviet Union was flirting with Iran's neighbor and the very country Iran was fighting a decade-long and extremely violent war against. By selling weapons to both Iran and Iraq, the Iranians were having trouble feeling much love for the Soviets. Iran, don't hate the player, hate the game. But that's all in the past now, and both Russia and Iran find themselves in even worse positions than they were during the Cold War. Today, by supplying Russia with weapons, Iran is hoping to strengthen a bond between the two nations. The weapon shipments are also likely a different bit of diplomacy, a bit of a thank you from Iran to Russia. When the Syrian civil war started, things didn't look good for Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and they were looking even worse for Iran. The rebels had the backing of the United States of America and a lot of its allies and partners, while Bashar al-Assad had, well, Iran. Assad's days were numbered, and his regime was on the verge of collapse, and this was bad for Iran. A pro-Western government would mean yet another American friend in its neighborhood. Then Iran experienced a miracle, 
Russia decided to join the fight when Assad's regime was within weeks of collapse. Russian air power scored crippling victories against US-backed rebels, and for fear of launching a major war, the US couldn't protect its allies on the ground by blowing Russian planes out of the sky. See, back then, we were all still drinking Russian Kool-Aid and thought the nation was a modern, capable military power, instead of the disaster full of clown shoes it actually is. Russian intervention kept Assad in power, which kept Western influence from growing in the region. Iran basically owed Russia one, and throwing its weight behind it during the Ukraine war was one way of saying thank you and repaying that debt. Iranian assistance, though, might be going past saying thank you and going straight to, okay, now you owe us. It's no secret that Russia screwed the pooch invading Ukraine and now its military is struggling with basic logistics. Iranian assistance at this point is basically invaluable to Russia, and in return Iran might soon be asking for Russia to repay that favor. To date, Russia has allowed Israel to operate with impunity inside of Syria, leading to airstrikes against Iranian proxies and sometimes even Iranian targets in the country. This is why Israel has refused to publicly voice overt support for Ukraine. Iran will likely pressure Russia into no longer giving Israel unfettered access to Syria, which will take the heat off Iranian proxies and operatives working in the nation. But Iran might be trying to send other messages with its drones and missiles in Ukraine. For one, the Ukraine war has given Iran the perfect opportunity to showcase its honest-to-God very unimpressive drone technology. Its missiles are definitely better, but its drones are like the Hobbit trilogy, a poor adaptation of the source material and an even worse attempt to copy the success of its predecessor. The cool thing about the drones, though, is that even if you're ordering them off Wish.com, they can still be pretty deadly weapons, especially if you use them against undefended civilian targets. And that's really the entire point of giving Russia a bunch of its drones and missiles. Iran is sending a very loud message to America and its allies. Try and start a war with us when we refuse to shut down our nuclear weapons program, and you're going to suffer for it. Iran wants America to know that war against it won't be easy, and showcasing its incredibly moderate effectiveness of its weapons is one way of doing that. If Ukraine can be defeated, though, Iran gets yet another prize. Right now, the US is like the prom king, and its allies and partners are like… the prom committee? Listen, we don't know how proms really work. We're all nerds. Nobody ever invited us to one. Our point, though, is that the US and its allies are all sitting pretty tall on the world stage, and such status affords the West a great amount of what's known as soft power. That's the ability to influence nations into doing what you want them to do, without actually having to coerce or threaten them. Perhaps you impress them with your refined culture, and they naturally want to do what you want to do. Or perhaps you have 11 carrier strike groups with more firepower than most of the world's air forces combined. Either way, the point is that the West has status, which affords it great influence. If Ukraine can be defeated, though, then by proxy its NATO allies will also be defeated. This will be a huge propaganda victory for both Russia and Iran, who can then claim that despite the West's best effort, they were unable to save Ukraine. This could have some serious global ramifications, because if America and its European allies can't save a country right on Europe's doorstep, President Xi Jinping is suddenly going to start looking less like a tyrant and more like an adorable if misunderstood pooh bear to all of the people in Taiwan. An obvious benefit to Iran supporting Russia, though, is that it gets to show the world what its weapons can do. There's nothing better for a struggling arms industry than a good war, and Iran is taking full advantage of this to show the world that its weapons actually work. Suffering under some pretty harsh sanctions, Iran needs to turn a buck whenever it can, and showing off the effectiveness of sophisticated systems such as drones and ballistic missiles is a good way to generate interest, especially since Iranian weapons are going to be significantly cheaper than Western weapons, and most people buying Iranian weapons are only doing so because they can't get Western weapons. Iran itself is also getting the benefit of actually seeing these weapons in action. While they aren't facing the type of threat that the United States presents, Iranian weapons in Ukraine are still being in effect tested under battlefield conditions. The US has repeatedly spoken about the lessons being learned in the Ukraine conflict, and Iran is no exception. Up until their debut in Ukraine, Iran hadn't had much of an occasion to use many of these weapon systems in anything approximating a modern battlefield. Now it has reams of combat data. That data would no doubt be more useful if Russia wasn't almost exclusively using these drones to target largely undefended civilian areas. Then there's the most basic of reasons for Iran's support of Russia. Money. Iran is a cash-strapped nation. It has a big ball of dreams of crushing America but is still operating on a 7-Eleven paycheck. Any extra money that Iran can make is good news. But what if money isn't the only thing Iran is getting? President Volodymyr Zelensky suspects that Iran is also getting another kind of repayment that is basically invaluable, assistance with its nuclear weapons program from Russian scientists. If true, and this is pure speculation, 
then Russia could leapfrog Iran's nuclear program ahead by years, dramatically shortening the amount of time to completion of a working nuclear weapons program. This is very important, also known as breakout. This is the amount of time it would take for Iran to go from detection of attempts to build a nuclear weapon to actually constructing one. The Iranian nuclear deal greatly extended the length of this period, but then Donald Trump decided he didn't want to do what all the other cool kids were doing and he ripped the deal up. Now Iran's breakout time is dramatically lowered as detection has become much more difficult. Iran's goal is thus to reduce the breakout time from detection to acquisition of a nuclear weapon to a length of time shorter than it would take for the US military to prepare to launch an invasion of the country. It took the US six months to stage troops and equipment to prepare to invade Iraq. Thus, with Russian assistance, Iran could beat this clock and keep the West from ever interfering with its nuclear program and the authoritarian regime's sovereignty ever again by threatening nukes on invading forces. Now, go tell your mother you love her, and when you come back, watch how the US would respond to a Russian nuclear attack in Ukraine war, or click this other video instead.